This is the 2023 Hoosier Racing Tire SCCA Super Tour. We have 19 races down, nine of the best racetracks in the U.S. in the books. Now the finale at the iconic Road America. Today, the 20th and final round live from Wisconsin's Kettle Moraine Forest and the National Park of Speed. The 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints is upon us. Brian Belansky here, Greg Ginsburg in and at Elkhart Lake at Road America. Some big stuff today, Greg. This is the last one of the year. That's it, Brian. We've got nine, nine Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints Championship races today. And uh, the, the, the uh, well, the, the, the action is going to be, I, I think, something to behold here today. And uh, we're gonna have our first group now rolling off, heading onto the track for their pace lap. It is our touring car group. By the way, this is gonna be the first of four races today before lunch. These are all scheduled today, every race for 13 laps. And uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when the, when the track is four miles long, <laughs> 13 is a, is a long, long distance. Please, somebody else do the math. I can't do it in my head. But uh, we've got the cars rolling off uh, now and heading on to the track for our first race of the day, the Glosser Bikes, the Clean Tools Challenge, uh, where our first place winner is going to win $200 in cash, uh, receive a certificate from Hoosier Racing Tires for two tires, also receive uh, that beautiful Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints checkered flag and, uh, a checkered, uh, and also a June Sprints hat. Our second place finisher going to receive $100 in cash, one a certificate for one tire from Hoosier Racing Tires, a Sprints hat as well, and our third place finisher is going to receive a $50 cash award, uh, going to receive a $100 product certificate from Breakometer, as well as a June Sprints hat. Let's run down the starting order here. We're going to have our T2 and T3 cars behind the first pace car, our Touring 4 group behind the second. Let's start off with our front group. I'm uh, going to give you the uh, the top 16 drivers here out of 29 who qualified in T2 and T3. Starting 16th, driving the number 22, Touring 3 BMW 330, it's Derek Wagner. While Derek Chan will start 15th, he's driving the number 86, Nissan 350Z. Then we've got John Lagutis. He is starting 14th, driving the number 7, Touring 3 Ford Mustang. And Steve Simchek will start 13th. He's in the Touring 3, number 117, Nissan 370Z. Tom O'Toole will start 12th. He's in the number 35, Touring 2, BMW M2 Club Sport. While Robbie Englund, Eglund pardon me, will start 11th in the 06, Touring 2, Chevy Corvette. Scott Sewell will start 10th, driving the number 114, Touring 2 Porsche Cayman, with Brian Spiewak starting 9th, driving the 05, Touring 2 BMW M3. Then we've got Alexander Williams, and by the way, all the following cars are in Touring 2. Uh, we have Alexander Williams starting 8th, he's in the 57, Porsche 911, with Matt O'Toole drive, starting 7th, driving the number 3, Porsche 911. Then we've got Aaron Kaplan, he starts 6th, he's driving the number 18, Touring 2, BMW M2 Club Sport with Alan Kossoff starting fifth. He's driving the number 23 BMW, or probably not BMW, Porsche 911. Then Brett Scoggin, he's going to start fourth, and hopefully we'll see Brett out today uh, after that incident uh, to wrap up yesterday's race. Brett is driving the number 51, white number 51 BMW M2 Club Sport with Maddie Ost starting, Madison Ost starting third. She's driving the number nine BMW M2 and your front row, father and son. The first, the Sun, driving the number 145 Porsche 911 from Winnetka, Illinois. It's Joe Bowden and your pole sitter, driving the number 46 Porsche 911 from Winnetka, Illinois. It's Mark Bowden. Now let's move over to our Touring 4 field. Behind the second pace car, I'll give you the top 16. Starting 16th, driving the number 45 Chevrolet Camaro. It's Brad Dahmer. Starting, four, uh, starting 15th, driving the number 4 BMW Z4, Roger Knudsen. Michael Dalton will start 14th. He's in the 88 Pontiac Solstice with Robert Spence starting 13th. He's in the number uh, 59 Mazda MX-5. Driving another Mazda, this time a Mazda RX-8. And starting 12th, driving the number 36 car, it's James Eben starting 11th. Driving the number 56 Mazda MX-5, Ryan Chikansky. Starting 10th, driving the number 39, Mazda MX-5, it's Richard Mooney 
with Mike LaMena starting ninth in the number 89 Mazda Miata. Then we've got Ralph Porter. He's driving the number 32 BMW Z4. And then it is uh, just a gaggle of Mazdas here, Brian. Uh, we have William Snyder driving the number 27 Mazda MX-5. He starts seventh. Richard Dickey will start sixth. He's driving a Mazda RX-8 and all of the following drivers in Mazda MX-5. We've got Chris Windsor driving the number 21 car. He's out of Thurmont, Maryland. He starts fifth with Sergio Slobin starting fourth in the 118. Then we've got Ryan Heishman. He starts third in the 146 car and your front row in touring four driving the number 98 Mazda MX-5 out of Bloomington, Illinois. Your winner yesterday in touring four, Kevin Fryer and your pole sitter today driving the number 69 Mazda MX-5 from Darnstown, Maryland. It's Jeremy Butts. All right, we're getting ready for, uh, I, I did the math, it's going to be 52 miles of 52. racing action here. Uh, here comes our first pack up through the Bill Mitchell Bend. Uh, you'll see them coming around the corner here onto the Road America Strait up the hill and towards a hopeful green flag here this morning. It's a split start, so we'll, we'll get the green flag. They do look nicely packed up two by two in the front. Well, actually, all the rows look nicely packed up two by two. The Corvette pace car on pit lane. And here we come to the green flag. All right, starters got the arm is looking over the field. And Brian, green flag in the air. And over to you for the start. There we go. Here comes our first group of the day heading across the start line. Green flag flying. Now they'll come down to turn one. Fanning out as we've seen all weekend long, two wide, three wide through the pack. Our leader is going to make it single file for the first two rows. Uh, first four cars through, no issues at all as they head out through turn one. Cooler temperatures this morning might make it slightly slick, uh, but it looks good so far. Here comes the entire pack through three. Yeah, Nicely and, strung out, Greg. Yeah, and I was going to say, great move on the start there by Brett Scoggin, the uh, the white number 51 BMW. Now, I mentioned that he had uh, gotten together yesterday uh, with one of our touring four cars on the very last lap. Good to see him out. We'll see if our uh, Brian Harrison, our T4 driver, makes it as well as the second group now makes the run down to turn one. All right, here comes the second group. Same situation, trying to figure out where they're going to go and how they're going to get there. More side by side with this group, all the way back through row number three, side by side. Uh, they'll figure if they can sort this out coming into turn three. And no, nope, still pretty much side by side. Uh, no, uh, no beating and banging at the moment. So that's good news as they come through turn three and head down towards turn five. I understand there is a spinner there from the first pack. There they are, drivers right. Yeah, and I believe, and I believe that was John Lagudis in his Ford Mustang uh, that is there, and he is coming down the hill counter race just as our uh, T4 drivers are starting to uh, come down the uh, come down the Marine sweep, and they're going to meet him in just a moment. Yeah, that strikes me as a car that's not running, or else he would not be going the other yes. hill in the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> he, he might be going up the hill rather than down the hill, yeah. yeah. And so in T4, Brian, uh, it looks like our winner from yesterday in Touring 4, Kevin Fryer, uh, made a great move on the start, uh, went around the outside of Jeremy Butts to, uh, to take the lead very early on. Uh, and then we see uh, the 146 car, the one that uh, got together with Brett Scoggin yesterday on the last lap, Ryan Heisman in that bright blue number 146 Miata. Uh, he is slotted in the third, but already a bit of a gap there in the front of that for that second pack. All right, Fast and Furious up Bill Mitchell Bend as they get ready to complete the first lap of racing here. And uh, your first pack pretty much strung out now, nose to tail as they settle in for uh, another 12 laps of race. We got one car slowing and heading into pit lane. Uh, that is uh, not good news for that car. And sprint racing, folks, if you're not familiar with how we do things, a trip to pit lane is pretty much the end of your race. Yeah, exactly. And I believe that is one of our uh, uh, one of our fall line motorsports machines. I'll try and get the number as they come down the pit lane here uh, in just a moment. But uh, Brian, it looks as though Bowden and Scroggin uh, starting to really stretch things out here early on, and it's the uh, the 145 machine. Uh, that has uh, retired, or at least come up the pit lane, and that was Joe Bowden. That was your outside pole sitter today, uh, son of our current leader, Mark Bowden, and it looks like, as you mentioned here, when you talk about sprint racing, his day probably done. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's a oh oh there we go. We got another car into uh, miss the uh, the kitty litter though, so that's good. So that car will uh, will be able to get going. We had a couple one car yesterday at the end of the day uh, get stuck in that sand trap, and that was the end of their day. So. Um, Thankfully, they were able to get that going. Yeah, and, and that was the 20 machine of, of Robert Dommler uh, in his uh, Ford Mustang out of Zionville, Indiana, that uh, uh, ended up in the gravel drop. And uh, it sounds as though he has now uh, continued, and uh, they've dropped that local caution over at turn one. And here is our shot, Hurry Downs. And uh, this is our first pack um, coming through here. So... Everyone kind of settling in at the moment with both Scroggins and Oust. Uh, and I believe that was our podium yesterday, wasn't it, Greg? That is. Yesterday in T1, Mark Bowden took the win. Joe Bowden finishing second. Oh, that's uh, right. And uh, Madison Aust, Betty Aust in her uh, BMW, uh, the number nine machine, finished in third with Aaron Kaplan finishing just off the podium against Scroggins, was actually running in third position uh, coming right. through turn six, and uh, unfortunately, uh, again, a bit of contact there with an out-of-class car, and uh, he had to uh, uh, to limp the car home, finished in ninth position. Looking down to our T3 class right now, Derek Chan is your race leader at the moment, followed by Derek Wagner and, uh, and John LeJudis. And I'm going to scroll down here to T4 as well. T4, we've got Kevin Pryor, Jeremy Butt, Jeremy Butts, and Sergio Slobin. Uh, and there was some great racing in T4 uh, yesterday. And uh, we were able to catch up to that at the end of the race. Uh, but those guys put on a fantastic show. We were looking at the front of the pack for the first half of the race. And someone chimed in and said, hey, check out T4. Thank you for that. <laughs> And Brian, I think we're gonna. I'm gonna have to check here because I think I had said that, uh, and listening to the call that came in uh, from turn five on that first lap, that I thought it was John Lagudis in his uh, in his Mustang that had uh, spun the car. Uh, well, perhaps not. Uh, I'll uh, I'll check here in just a moment, but we have not seen uh, the 117 machine cross the line yet uh, in Touring Three. Uh, as a matter of fact, that is uh, I think the only T3 car that has not yet completed lap number two as our uh, T4 car is now starting to come by. So uh, I'll try and get that, uh, I'll try and verify, but it might be Steve's uh, my check that uh, that had that off of turn five. We'll, uh, we'll see in just a moment. So Greg, yesterday's races were 25 minutes. Today's race is 13 laps, Sig significantly longer, doesn't yes. sound like it. How does that play into what these guys are doing today? Well, I think you're seeing it at least initially here, uh, especially in T2, where uh, Bowden and and uh, Scroggin they're they're sitting nose to tail. Uh, Scroggin isn't uh, poking to the inside; he's not showing the nose uh, to Bowden. And uh, I think the plan and what you'll usually see here, especially on a long track where there is the heavy use of the draft, is where at least the leaders will try to use that draft to separate themselves out from the rest of the field. In Touring 4, you'll likely see that as well. But, you know, we've already seen uh, in T4 yesterday, even over the course of the shorter race, where there wasn't a lot of battling until the last three or four laps of the race that when you have very similar cars and perhaps ones that punch a, an outsized hole in the, uh, in the air, uh, the draft doesn't necessarily get you free of the uh, of the entire field. So we'll, we'll see how things play out. But I think most of our drivers are going to be, at least for the first, you know, the first half of this race, probably pretty content to work with the drivers ahead of them. And, and it, it's to their detriment if they don't, because, you know, as we've seen here, you know, you have these very long straightaways. You've got, for the most part, a, a large number of right-hand corners, and some of them are extremely critical, whether they are because they lead on to a long straight or because, for example, coming out of turn five where they head up a hill, which, you know, especially for the T4 cars, which are really momentum cars, if if you go through one of those corners side by side, you're only going to lose, uh, you know, lose the scent of the drivers in front. Right. We have a new leader overall and in T2. Brett Scroggin has taken over the point. In his BMW M2 CS, Mark Bowden dropped down to second. Uh, Madison Oust is two and a half seconds back, 2.3 seconds back uh, in her BMW M2. 
Uh, so we've got a couple of uh, Porsches and BMWs, actually all Porsches and BMWs populating the top 10 here. Uh, the first uh, non-German car, it's a Nissan. That's the Derek Chan car uh, in a completely different class uh, down in uh, 11th place. So uh, uh, looks like this should be the uh, touring German, Germany <laughs> class. All right, and, and Brian, I believe it was actually the uh, the 117 machine of Steve uh, Smycek who uh, who had gone around at turn five on that opening lap. Uh, he is still on track. He is still circulating, but uh, he is a lap down from the remainder of the T3 field at this point. So uh, I think what we saw is he basically waited for the entire T4 field uh, to drive by him. Uh, here, as uh, you mentioned, Scrogan just going to uh, top of the leaderboard here, just turned the fastest lap of the race on lap number three, and uh, I think most importantly, almost a full second faster than Mark Bowden. Producer Brendan suggests we should call it Turin Bogdan. I like that. <laughs> I like that. I like that as well. All oh right. my gosh. <laughs> All right, we've got 10 laps to go here as uh, we work our way through the early portions of this race. Uh, fast lap right now, Brett Scroggin at 227.475. Uh, that is a pretty doggone good lap. Um, the uh, speed trap, uh, he's hitting uh, the speed trap. The fastest speed so far for him is a 141 mile per hour um, shot at the speed trap. We've got the, uh, Matty Oss, though, uh, has uh, clipped the speed trap at 143.1. And somehow that's not the fastest speed trap of the day. I'm going to keep scrolling down to that. Where is that? Oh, I guess maybe it is. Yeah, and Brian, they are just now coming across. Maddie Oz just crossed the start finish line. She's got Aaron Kaplan in the uh, the number 18 BMW, and then uh, Aaron Kaplan uh, in the 23 Porsche directly behind there is she, as they're coming into uh, turn number one. And uh, actually, I think they're uh, rolling down the hill here. So here they come, coming yep. down through turn three. Yeah, that's a good battle there for the last spot on the podium. And you can see Maddie Oss there trying to catch a little draft off that red car in front of her. Smart move there, especially going down that long lumbering straightaway down, turn, down to turn five. Any little bit of help you can get there is smart. And the smartest thing that she can try to do is get that red car between her and the cars behind her. Where did the red car go to the red, oh, well, the red the car? The red car is just, that's, uh, that by. is the, the, I believe the Pontiac Solstice uh, looking earlier. at the roof, yeah, by Ralph Porter. And uh, yeah. yeah, I don't think he can, he can carry the speed that those uh, that those touring two cars do down the uh, down the straightaway there. All three of them made it by. Yeah, I also think he probably did the right thing and, and made it easy for them as well because he, he could have made it a little more difficult than that. So I think Patty also was hoping that, they, that he would. That he wouldn't, yeah. And, and, and you can see there actually where he's doing the exact same thing uh, yeah. for the next group, Alex Williams, Matter Tool, uh, uh, as well. Uh, and uh, let those drivers buy and get underneath. Yeah, no question there. So, Brett Scroggin, so got, after getting around uh, Mark Bowden, he's opened up almost a two-second lead. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty good news for him. Uh, Mark Bowden has been uh, a really fast car all year long, in many cases not having too much of competition out there. Uh, but that is not the case today. And Brian, I've been watching now the uh, the Touring 4 race, yep. and much as we saw yesterday, uh, a great battle between Kevin Fryer and Sergio Slobin. Of course, yesterday we also had Ryan Heishman and Chris Windsor, those four cars all fighting it out uh, for the win. And uh, it's the, uh, the they're just now coming down the, uh, into turn five. We just saw them go through the frame. The big difference yesterday, Jeremy Butts, driver of the number 69 machine out of Darnstown, he was running fifth, and there they go. Slobin retaking the lead now in T4 uh, from yesterday's winner, Kevin Fryer. The, uh, the light blue and the burgundy car is going underneath the Corvette bridge, but uh, right behind them, uh, Jeremy Butts, he's got Ryan Heishman and Chris Windsor. Uh, and it looks like Chris Windsor, who's in that white number 21 machine with the red roof, he got past both Butts and Heishman under braking going into turn five. Great move by the 21. Yeah, we've got it. This is a great opportunity to get a snapshot of an entire class here, all with the same essential video frame. Uh, we don't always get that here. So uh, really great opportunity. These two four uh, guys have put on just a fantastic show all weekend. All here. weekend, certainly. So, um, and, and they're not disappointing once again. Here they come. 
uh, as they enter the kink gear. There's your first two cars. A little bit of a, uh, an opening there of a gap between first and second with Pryor and Zlobin. Uh, but we saw that a couple times yesterday, too, and they were able to get back together uh, without too much trouble. All right, Brian, it looks like uh, 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 looks like our other Pontiac, or probably not the other Pontiac Solstice, but it looks like uh, Michael Dalton driving with the number 88 machine. He's brought the car down the pit lane. His race is now done. As we watch this battle for the lead in T4, wow. And, you, and it, you know, you see there coming out of Canada, Brian going up through Bill Mitchell, Kevin Fryer now coming right onto the back of Sergio Slobin and you know when you have these long straightaways as long as you can carry the speed out of 14 you know he's only about a half a car length back as they start to run up the Road America straight with with these NC Miatas that they're racing uh, there is more than ample draft and they are now side by side past the start finish line yeah they are we just saw them fly through the through the uh, frame there we'll catch them up going into turn one here and it does look like that Bowden is, oh, no, I'm sorry, we're looking at the wrong uh, rundown. Uh, Fryer just got by one more time, and uh, he is going to take the lead again as they head down towards turn three. Yeah, great. And again, use it, using the draft. Now, they have, you know, I said, oh, yeah, you know, what you want to probably do for at least the first half of the race is, you know, stay in line for the battle for position. But when you have these long straightaways and you can get the pass done before you get to the braking zone and get into the corner, you know, it's a type of racing we see all the time in Formula V, you know, well, where you're able to keep the momentum and you don't have to throw, even if you're getting passed, you don't have to throw away any momentum. Uh, you know, it works out fine and you don't, you know, lose that gap. Uh, that you've built up to the cars behind. Yeah, and the other thing that you've got going for these the, the leaders here is that they have a big enough gap back to third place where uh, they can do some dicing back and forth and not really have to worry about those three cars uh, catching them uh, as long as they're, they're doing a little more of the drafting, at least in the straightaways. So uh, working out well uh, for them at the moment as long as they can keep it between the white lines, they can keep playing and having a good time and not have to worry too much about giving up anything worse than second place here. Here they come one more time down through hurry downs, no issues there. And then that second group uh, coming through as well with Windsor, Heisman, and Butts. Uh, and uh, they're actually having a good time too. And, and one of the reasons they're not catching uh, the lead pack, Greg, is because they're going back and forth and dicing themselves. Exactly, and, and, and I wonder how much uh, prior experience racing with one another leads into that. So these three racers have been uh, racing together in Spec Miata in the Mid-Atlantic Road Racing Series yeah. on the East Coast for somewhere close to 10 years now. Uh, and they also race in T4. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if they're just picking up some battles <laughs> that, they've, that they actually started earlier this year outside of the majors and outside of the Super Tour Series uh, here. But, uh, you know, it looks as though uh, they, they just, as they've fallen off the pace of our two leaders in the class, that they, uh, you know, the, the, at least for the last two laps or so, um, they haven't really been jockeying for position. You can see now almost uh, a car length and a half separating uh, third, fourth, and fifth. Taking a look at our chat real quick, Greg, a lot of people commenting on our camera angles this morning about how beautiful we've made the racetrack look and how you don't see that on, on the Pro TV broadcasts. Uh, well, that's because they're focusing in more on the cars, so we get the nice, beautiful, wider angles. But if you look at this, folks, you understand why they refer to this as the National Park of Speed. Um, it is just, it is just idyllic. It's a glorious, um, glorious until, place to be. Yeah, it's absolutely idyllic until they fire up the race engines. But uh, it is, uh, yeah, clearly one of my favorite spots. All right, Brian. I was gonna say, and hopefully, I can track where they are on track. But I think we ought to pick up the battle that uh, we had earlier uh, between Maddie Aust and Aaron Kaplan, and both. Uh, and this is the battle for. Uh, yeah, and I think they're coming up the, the straight now towards the start finish line. And here they come, those two BMWs. And uh, you can see now that Austin Kaplan have kind of left Alan Kossoff uh, just a bit behind. Right. Uh, but still a very strong battle here for the last step on the podium in T2. Let's do this, Greg. Let's take our break and do a call to grid. And then when we come back, we'll follow that Austin Kaplan uh, battle just a little bit more. Sounds good. Let's do it. Attention in the paddock, attention in the paddock. First call to the grid for race group number two. That's Formula Atlantic, Formula Continental, and Formula X. Please come to the grid. Race group number two, Formula Atlantic, Formula Continental, and Formula X. The grid is now open. 
All right, Brian, so let's take our first break of the day. You are watching the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints live from Road America. We'll be right back. Hoosier Racing Tire is proud to be the presenting sponsor of SCCA's Super Tour. Hoosier's mission is to be the dominant customer-driven provider of tires to race teams domestically and internationally. Realizing Hoosier's existence and continued success is dependent upon how well we meet our customers' expectations by providing the safest, most reliable, high-quality race tires that put you in the winner's circle. For more information, see one of our trackside support personnel or the local Hoosier Tire racing dealer nearest you. Or contact us at HoosierTire.com. Hoosier Racing Tires, truly designed for champions. Haggerty is the official and exclusive insurance partner for the Sports Car Club of America. Haggerty provides affordable off-track insurance protection for motorsports vehicles while in the paddock, in transit, in storage, and at the shop. They provide guaranteed value coverage and even have protection for your trailers. SCCA members can save 5% on insurance through Haggerty. Learn more at Haggerty.com. Haggerty, let's drive together. Ready for a new race trailer? Bravo Trailers is the exclusive trailer partner of the SCCA. Owned by longtime SCCA racers, Bravo Trailers work better, load easier, and tow better because we build them with racers in mind. Visit bravotrailers.com to see your new trailer in aluminum or steel. For over 25 years, championship winning drivers and teams have demanded Hawk Performance Motorsports brake pads. Now you can have their advanced technology on your daily car, truck, or SUV with Hawk Performance Street products. With the improved HP Plus pad for that hybrid street and track feel, or Super Duty pads for tow vehicles, their all new ER1 brake pad designed to take on even the longest race, and their all new high performance brake fluid, Hawk has all of your braking needs covered. Visit hawkperformance.com and like them on Facebook or Instagram to learn more about the Hawk Performance Advantage. Hawk Performance, what's stopping you? And welcome back to the National Park of Speed Road America for the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints, part of the 2023 Hoosier Racing Tire SCCA Super Tour right in the middle of our first of nine June Sprints Championship races here today, Brian. And it is uh, already uh, showing uh, what great racing we have here in the SCCA in multiple classes. Yeah, this is uh, kind of SCCA racing at its finest here. We've got several battles across all the different classes. Uh, looking real quick down to T3, um, Derek Chan, give them a little bit of love. He is your T3 leader. James Berlin is in second place in T3. And follow that up with Derek Wagner. So uh, all Minnesota cars from Rosemont, Lakeville, and Chaska. I guess we need to call this the, hack, the hockey crew uh, <laughs> in the first, second, and third in T3. Um, all are representing from the land of a thousand lakes, ten thousand lakes. Exactly, Brian. Although uh, you know, we we also look. We've got uh, two Nissans up at the front of that T3 field, uh, and then it's uh, BMW time. Uh, but Gamal Aguirre Gomez, he's been putting up a, a decent little fight there, just sitting in fourth. Uh, we'll uh, we'll try and track get into that battle a little later. But we've been watching this uh, this battle for third uh, in touring two. Uh, the two very similarly matched BMWs, and, and I think almost as exciting, Brian, is watching uh, those two drivers try to, uh, to try to hold one another off. It's how they've been working their way through traffic for the last uh, the last number of laps, and I think uh, Director Zach has uh, shown it pretty darn well as they have had to uh, basically uh, deal with a, a, a moving chicane or multiple moving chicanes and slaloms, yeah. <laughs> and still are only about a half a car width apart. Well, and, and that's what happens when you've got, what do we have, 40, 45 cars here? No, 30, 33 cars. There's always yeah. going to be someone who is off pace. Um, and you just got to make sure you catch them at the right time or hope that you catch them at the right time. Look at that side-by-side -side action going through turn one. That can end up badly. It looks like they did it just fine there, though. Yeah, and, you know, we'll have to take a look there because I think that was, I'm fairly certain uh, that that was uh, the 21 machine of Windsor, then Heisman, and I think Jeremy Butts, who had tried to make a move down the inside going into turn one, just kind of got pinned to the apex there, wasn't able to get around them. And yeah, there's Butts uh, now a little bit uh, and just didn't get a run out of turn three either as uh, he drops now down into fifth position uh, in touring four. Remember, Jeremy Butts, he was your pole sitter in touring four.
Four laps to go here. Nothing changed up front at the moment. Uh, Scroggin, Bowden, and Oss are still your uh, top three. Uh, Aaron Kaplan would love to change that up, though, and uh, and, and get past uh, uh, Maddie Oss to get a podium spot here. Uh, but she is holding on for dear life, and and uh, he's he's uh, uh, Kaplan has only been able to get within about a car length of her rear bumper, yeah. and not not really been able to get there to to really pressure her that much. You, you would think that being a bump, you know a car length away was a lot of pressure. Uh, but it just doesn't feel like that he's able to catch up to make that move. No. Hey, and I'm going to ask if uh, if director uh, director Zach maybe move forward a couple cameras over towards the kink uh, here as we're watching this battle. And actually, it's going to be a little bit further ahead. Um, that hopefully we can pick it back up uh, as Kevin Fryer and Sergio Slobin still swapping positions here for the lead in touring four as uh, Fryer now your leader and uh, we had the Brett Scoggin our overall leader and there he is coming up through Bill Mitchell uh, had to get through that battle for the lead in T4 and you can see directly behind them is Mark Bowden our second place driver overall and he started to close things down on Scoggin but as you can see he's now had to follow that T4 battle all the way through Bill Mitchell through turn 14, and he now has lost probably about 10 car lengths that he had actually made up on our T2 leader. Yeah, and with three to go, even though that's 12 miles of racing, uh, that may be an insurmountable gap at this point. Yeah. Uh, it looks like it's going to be, it's five seconds, and uh, if uh, Scroggin does not have any issues, um, it is really hard to make up five seconds here at Road America over the course of three laps. And look at this now. This yep. is that battle in, T in Touring 3 that we were, probably Touring 2 that we were talking about between Austin Kaplan, and they both get bottled up back behind uh, Windsor and Heisman and Butts going down into turn number one as they uh, as the T2 cars now try to muscle their way underneath going into turn number three. Uh, Brian there, and uh, you know, where you have these two battles for, for podiums in two different classes, yep. and you know, nobody wants to give an inch. Right, and, and it looks like uh, they were able to make it through pretty much cleanly, and uh, the gap between Oust and Kaplan hasn't changed now. Uh, you'll see them as they come through five, right back to about that one car length gap, and uh, they're now starting to work their way through a little bit more of uh, that lapped traffic, and uh, that's all part of the game here when you're dealing with our multi-class racing. It's not just being raw speed. It's not just being able to hit your markers. It's also being able to find your way and pick your way through traffic. All right, and I think, Brian, I think I have a, an answer now why the 88 car, uh, the Pontiac Solstice, uh, took to the pit lane a little bit earlier today, uh, Michael Dalton. Uh, and that is, uh, well, because he lost an exhaust, uh, and it's sitting over uh, over by turn 13, oddly, hasn't uh, run afoul of that 103 decibel limit yet, however, um, but uh, it is, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, it's got a nice little hideaway there over by turn 13 as uh, we continue to watch these T4 battles. Wow. Yeah. That is clearly the best battle on the racetrack, just like it was yesterday. Uh, we kind of ignored the rest of the, the rest of the groups after we kind of uh, picked this one up because the rest of the groups didn't have a whole lot of, of tight racing. And uh, right now, the, the gap between first and second in T3 is almost 10 seconds. It's five seconds in T2, so... Uh, that's why we're going to keep our focus here on on the, uh, oh, is that Maddie Oss slowing down? I believe it is, Brian. Let's see here as they come uh, come in the 14. Uh, no, I think no, it's Aust Aust is, is uh, Kaplan. Yeah, it is Kaplan. As Austin, uh, Aust the orange car, she, is, uh, she motors up and past our leaders in Touring 4. Uh, and that is now going to uh, move here as Kaplan. Uh, now comes down the pit lane. That is going to now move uh, uh, Alan Kossoff in the number 23 Porsche 911 up into third position, but a very uh, pretty good distance uh, back from Matty Ost's George and Black uh, BMW. Yeah, so now Matty Ost has a four-second gap, which is highly, highly manageable here with two to go at Road America. Although we just had another car come out into, uh, come off a of pit lane right up into traffic. But that yeah, that was the Pontiac Solstice that we were talking about a little right. bit earlier, the 88 car. So, going to come in, try to get a couple more, get one more lap in or two more laps in here before all said and done. 
All right, Bryce, so with two laps to go, let me quickly make another call to the grid for our next group. Attention in the paddock, attention in the paddock. Second call to the grid for race group number two, Formula Atlantic, Formula Continental, and Formula X. Please head to the grid, race group two, Formula Continental, Formula Atlantic, and Formula X. Please head to the grid, your race is next. Steve Moeller, Jim Wolf, Patrick McMullen, Ben Tyler, uh, John Montgomery, uh, all these folks. Ta uh, Taylor Hyatt, one of our friends on the on the podcast, uh, on the Inside the SCCA podcast, all in. Uh, actually, a lot of those folks have been on the Inside the SCCA podcast. Uh, good morning to all of you. Thank you for joining us as we get to the final laps here in our first race of the day. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you caught the uh, the comment there from Steve, Steve Muller as we were talking about Bill Mitchell, uh, yeah, uh, one of the designers on the Corvette. And he's referring to Billy Mitchell, uh, made famous in the movie King of Kong. Uh, <laughs> big, uh, big controversy over the, the, the world record highest score in Donkey Kong back in the day. Uh, but uh, <laughs> thank you, Steve, for reminding me of that. <laughs> All right. Oh, my gosh. I want to hear them talk about Donkey Kong on the F1 broadcast. So let's just get that out there right now, okay? Let's get it on like Donkey Kong. There we go. Uh, All right. <laughs> Right. As uh, Brett Scoggin uh, heading underneath the Corvette bridge, he's got some uh, some traffic behind him. We're now working the very last lap here from Road America, Brian. And here we go, coming down to turn one for the final time. He has a four-second lead over second place, and uh, that should be enough to just keep it going and keep it between uh, the white lines here. And uh, I guess it's now 10 corners, 12 corners to go until he is going to have the glory of putting a June Sprints trophy on his trophy case. All right, and Brian. That's and, pretty big. and the battle for the lead in Touring 4 now, heading down towards turn number one. Uh, and uh, it appears as though Kevin Fryer, there they are. Kevin Fryer, the uh, the gap that he built up over Sergio Slovin with the help of traffic over the last couple of laps has started to dissipate quite a bit. Now about four car lengths separating those two cars. And on the very last lap, uh, Sergio Slobin, uh, well, he was 18 thousandths of a second faster than Kevin Fryer. So, uh, you know, making up some ground slowly but surely. There we go here. Everyone now working their final lap. Trying to see if we can pick up that T4 battle here. Yeah, they're going to be coming down in the turn five now, Brian. There we go. Here they come. Right, right there, a nose to tail. This is not done by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, did, did they catch the white flag, Greg? Do you remember or no? They, yes. Okay, yeah, they so are, they are they, also on their final lap. They are also on the final lap. They are behind uh, Skogan and uh, our our T1, uh, probably a T2 leader, coming down into the kink right now. So uh, only a couple of corners left to go. All right, we got a standing yellow here in turn nine. Not sure what it is, but I'm guessing it's someone off in the uh, in the gravel trap here that we can't see. Uh, but that should slow them down terribly much as they come through turn nine for the final time. Uh, and people, I, I, I don't know if everyone realizes that taking home a June Sprint Trophy, this is the second most important trophy in the SCCA, folks. Uh, this is the uh, one of the longest consecutive running events. Here comes your leader up the... Um, up the hill for the final time. I think it's the second car here, right? Uh, no, that's the no, first, first car, car coming yep, through. Yep. That is uh, the white BMW Scroggin with Bowden uh, just behind. There you go. Scroggins takes the win. Bowden will come across in second place here. And now we'll pick up the, the uh, race for T4 here pretty quickly and uh, see who is the better in that class, whether it's going to be Fryer or Slovin. And they've started to make their way through some of that traffic, Brian, yep. as they come up through Bill Mitchell Bend. Here they are coming through 14 for the final time. It is still uh, Fryer first, Zlobin second. Will he be able to draft by? I don't think he's close enough, Greg. I don't know. And you're going to see. Well, you're going to see that Porsche blow by to the yep. inside. He might try to use difficult. that Porsche to drag him up the hill. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But no, not able to get it done. It is going to be. Uh, Fryer and Slobin again, first and second in T4. That's right. Uh, for the second day in a row, Kevin Fryer comes home with a June Sprints win. Now let's uh, let's check in with our Touring Three drivers. Now we know Derek Chan had a pretty impressive lead going into the very last lap over James Berlin, the two Nissans 
uh, out of Minnesota. Uh, Chan in the older 350Z chassis, Berlin in the newer 370Z chassis. And I'm trying to check to see whether or not they have already crossed the finish line here. Yeah, they have not, so let's uh, check them out here. And actually, I believe that is Chan, the 86 machine, coming up the Road America straight now for the win. And there you go, taking the win in Touring 3, Derek Chan out of Rosemount, Minnesota. Woo. And James <laughs> Berlin just crosses the stripe. He's going to finish in second in Touring 3. And closing things up in the last couple of laps, John Lagidas in the number seven Ford Mustang, that black Ford Mustang, comes home in third, 1.2 seconds back from Berlin. And Gamal Aguilar Gomez was only half a car length back at the finish, uh, just out of the podiums. Uh, They're finishing fourth. Derek Wagner, who had been up as high as third, will finish in fifth, about two car lengths back from Aguilar Gomez. Uh, with Patrick Price, David Oram, Keith Mur uh, Murrow, Steve Smychek, and Robert Domler, your top 10 in Touring 2. Again, Brett Scoggin, your overall winner. Mark Bowden finishing second. Matty Ost for the second day in a row will come home in third. Alan Kossoff ran his first fastest lap of the race on the last lap. And uh, Kossoff had made up a lot of ground at the end of that race. Brian finished only three car lengths back from Matty Ost in fourth. Alexander Williams fifth. Matt O'Toole, Brian Spiewak, Scott Sewell, Tom O'Toole, and Aaron Kaplan, your top 10 in Touring 2. And then finally in Touring 4, as we mentioned, Kevin Fryer for the second day in a row takes the win over, this time over Sergio Slobin. Jeremy Butts works his way from fifth back up into third. That was your pole sitter today in T4. Chris Windsor. Finished on the podium yesterday. Today finishes just off the podium in fourth. Ryan Heishman finishes in fifth. Mike Lamena works all the way up to sixth in T4. Richard Dickey, William Snyder, Richard Mooney, and Ryan Chachansky round out your top ten. All right, that's going to do it here for our first race of the day from the 68th consecutive uh, Chicago region, WeatherTech Chicago region June sprints. Uh, Greg, why don't you uh, do one more call to grid and take us to break? Sounds good, Brian. Attention in the paddock. Final call to the grid for race group number two, Formula Atlantic, Formula Continental, and Formula X. Your race is next. Race group number two, Formula Atlantic, Continental, and Formula X. This is your final call to the grid. All right, so let's take another quick break. And uh, when we come back, more racing action here, more SCCA road racing action from the National Park of Speed Road America and the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region Juice to Prince, part of the 2023 Hoosier Racing Tire SCCA Super Tour. We'll be back in a few moments.
the place. Look at that one. Is it five miles away? I'm Tom Joe. Welcome to Road America. With cars are designed, engineered, and manufactured right here in the United States, to make the quality that comes to pass in the world. They also want to drive America to come. And I'm sure it's a And that's why we're going to tell you. We're going to say our cars are made in the U.S. Welcome back to Road America and the National Park of Speed, or, well, it is the National Park of Speed, and the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. I'm Greg Ginsberg, along with Brian Bolanski. And, uh, Brian, you know, if, uh, if the next eight races or anything like that first, uh, our, our viewers have uh, some good things. We have some good things in store for them uh, here. As we've got our second group now starting to uh, make their way off of the grid, and uh, behind the pace car, actually, we'll, we'll see him here rolling off the grid in just a moment. It is uh, our first open wheel, first of three open wheel races of the day. This is time Formula Atlantic, Formula Continental, and Formula X. And it is the Chicago Region SCCA Challenge. 
where the first place finisher in each class will win a $200 cash prize along with a Hoosier Racing Tire Certificate for two tires. They're also going to win a Chicago Region June Sprints checkered flag, of course, the checkered flag that they take, the, uh, take to finish their races, and as well, they will get a Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints hat. Our second place finisher will win $100 in cash and a single tire certificate from Hoosier Racing Tire as well as a June Sprints hat. And third place finisher will win a $50 cash award, also a Breakometer $100 product certificate, and a Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints hat. So uh, as our two different packs, we're going to have another split start here today where we've got our Formula Atlantic drivers behind the first pace car. Then we've got our Formula Continental and Formula X drivers behind the second. Each one of those pace cars, beautiful C8 Chevy Corvettes in Road America Blue. Let's take a look at the starting grids for our two groups. We're going to start off with the Formula Atlantics, where it's starting 16th, uh, driving the number 27 Honda F3 is Jonathan Collins. Starting 15th, driving the number 88 Store F1000, Sean Beaver. John Norton will start 14th in the 02 Swift 014. Jeff Keecher will start 13th. He's in the number 31 Phoenix. Then we've got Jeff Antonelli, Jeffrey Antonelli starting 12th. He's in the number 171 Pro Formula Mazda with JR Smart starting 11th. He's driving the number 55 Swift. Alex Conger will start 10th. He's in the number 23 Pro Formula Mazda with Adrian Marl starting 9th, driving the number 5 Liget. Then we've got Brandon Schwartz. He starts 8th, driving the number 46 Pro Formula Mazda. Rob Radman, also to Pro Formula Mazda, starts 7th in the number 15 machine. Then we've got Shane Kennett starting 6th, driving the number 63 Store F1000 with Tony Oppheim starting 5th, driving the number 3 Swift 014. Then we've got Steve Forer starting 4th in the number 84 Swift 016. Chip Romer will start 3rd, driving the number 71 Swift 016. And then your front row in Formula Atlantic, Dudley Fleck starting 2nd, driving the number 74 Swift 016 out of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And your pole sitter today in Formula Atlantic driving the number 21 Swift 0 and 6 out of Cicero, Indiana. It's Jimmy Simpson. Now let's move over to Formula Continental and Formula X. Starting 10th, driving the number 99 Formula X, Formula Mazda, it's Ken Denon. Then we've got starting 9th, driving the number 12 Formula Mazda. That's another Formula X car. It's Jacob Vinkamolder. Then all the remaining cars are in Formula Continental. We're starting 8th, driving the number 13 Van Diemen RF99 is Devin Hansen. Bill Washlager will start 7th, driving the number 8 Van Diemen RF97. Then we've got Brian Tomasi in a slightly newer chassis in the uh, Van Diemen RF06. That's the 96 machine starting in 6th. Starting 5th, driving the number 6 Van Diemen RF00. It's Mark Hutchison. Starting 4th, driving the number 18 RFR Formula Continental. It's Tom Hope with Devin Lasser starting on the inside of row number two, driving the 05 Van Diemen RFO2. And your front row today in Formula Continental and Formula X, driving the number 42 Van Diemen RFO1 in Formula Continental. It's Bill Johnson and your pole sitter today, driving the number 65 Formula Continental Van Diemen F2000. It's Michael Verisons. All right, 13 laps, 52 miles to go to capture one of the most important trophies in the Sports Car Club of America, the June Sprints. There's two things you want to be able to call yourself in the SCCA, a runoffs national champion and a June Sprints winner. Bucket list races here uh, this weekend, and uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of drivers who are going to be able to say that they've won a June Sprints after the day is over. That's right, Brian. And so taking the win yesterday in Formula Atlantic was Jimmy Simpson out of Cicero, Indiana, our pole sitter in Atlantic. In Formula Continental, Michael Verison's taking the win. He's out of Burlington, Wisconsin. And in Formula X, your winner yesterday, Jacob Vinkenmolder out of Spring Lake, Michigan in his Formula Mazda. As our first group, our Formula Atlantics, are now making their way through turn 14, through the final corner. The pace car, now that beautiful Chevy Corvette, pulls onto the pit lane, turning the field over to our pole sitter, Jimmy Simpson. He's got Dudley Fleck to his left as they come up the hill here on the Road America straight. Starter looks over the field, and the start is waved off, Brian. No start 
And so uh, that also means that our second group will not get the start. We'll probably see that second pace car stay out on track. But with these 13 lap races, and you can see there the second pace car staying out on track, lap number one has begun. So at most we'll have 12 laps under green here. Well, that's unfortunate. Um, last, yesterday they didn't have a pace car on the front group and it went around so fast that it was already on uh, the back of the back group uh, before the end of the second lap. Uh, hopefully this front group will uh, slow down enough on this uh, uh, second lap uh, to not have that happen again, um, which is unfortunate that that's the way this played out yeah. um, because that really kind of you know, uh, eliminated the uh, the advantage of having a split start yesterday. Uh, we'll see how that works out this time. Yeah, exactly. And so, Brian, we did see uh, in our shot as uh, the second group was uh, coming around turn 14, one of our drivers pulled off track and onto the pit lane. That was the number 13 Formula Continental of Devin Hansen out of Greenfield, uh, out of uh, probably Green Bay, Wisconsin. And uh, I believe he has now taken that car back to the paddock. My hope is that because they had the pace car on the first lap, that the pole sitter will have an idea of the speed that they were hoping for. Yes. Um, and that he will kind of eat that. And it does look like he's going a lot slower on this lap than they did yesterday. Um, but, uh, yeah, let's hope they can pull that together. Uh, Race Untamed in the chat was suggesting that we talk about the color of the uh, pace car. Uh, we talked about it yesterday, but it's absolutely worth talking about again today. You're exactly... Uh, you're exactly correct. The uh, pace car color is Elkhart Lake Blue, not Road America. Not Road America Blue. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is Elkhart Lake, Lake is is Elkhart Lake that blue? I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. Hey, I, I, I grew up a lot in the Washington D.C. area. It's probably it's probably more blue than the Potomac River. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Green Lakes in Wisconsin. They actually have a lake called Green Lake, actually. Um, but anyway, good point. And yes, it is absolutely Elkhart Lake Blue Metallic uh, is the uh, the color uh, from uh, from Chevrolet for the Corvette. Oh, I like it. I like it. All right, so uh, hopefully uh, we'll keep these packs a little more tight this time, so we don't have that issue. This uh, this lap that we're doing right now is counting. The clock has started, uh, so this will end up being 12 hopefully green flag laps of racing. Uh, here comes our first pack here up the Bill Mitchell bend. He will, and they uh, still, yeah, and Brian, you notice they still have not packed up uh, as uh, if uh, they're anticipating a, maybe a single file uh, restart, which would not be the case. Right. No. Uh, but I am getting word now from four, at turn 14 that they are now starting to yeah. form up. And uh, hey, look at that. <laughs> there well, they the are now. Well, the news is that once they get to turn 14, there's still three miles to the start stand. So, yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> they can get packed up nicely here. Well, it, look, it looks like they have gridded up two by two all the way back uh, through that uh, field. Although a little bit of a gap there in, lap, uh, in uh, row number five, but uh, yeah. still not that bad. As the starter now is looking the uh, field over. And green flag is in the air, Brian, and we are underway. And that bright orange machine, a Jimmy Simpson, the number 21 machine, jumps out to an early lead coming down the front straight. Chip Romer to the outside, driver's left. And then Dudley Fleck, who's in the, uh, the I believe, the burgundy car now slotting right underneath Chip Romer's number 71 machine. So uh, Dudley Fleck moving into second position, Steve Forer back in third. But for the second day in a row, and we saw this yesterday on the opening lap, Brian, Jimmy Simpson starting to walk away from the field on the opening lap as we now have green flag in the air for our Formula Continentals and Formula X machines. And we have side by side Michael Verisons and Bill Johnson. Verisons in the white uh, number 65 machine there to your left, to his right, and then sliding in from third position. Uh, it appears that Devin Lasseur has managed to get around Bill Johnson as they now come nose to tail down the hill. And look at this as Mark Hutchison tries to take a look at Bill Johnson coming down the three. I think he got the move done. It does look like that. Good news is good clean laps here early on. And that, that second pack was much closer to the first pack this time. Uh, so we should not run into the same issues that we had yesterday. There is your leader, Jimmy Simpson. Wow, look at the lead he's already got there, uh, Greg. Yeah, pretty amazing there as uh, he has now opened up almost a 15-car length lead just in a half a lap. 
and uh, he, he was able to, to really stretch things out initially to the point where he's not even in the view anymore. We're watching the battle for second <laughs> coming down uh, through uh, coming down through the kink, and it looks as though, oh, and we've got a car that's gone off and spun coming down through the kink. Yep, his and, driver's uh, right there. You'll see cars sliding, uh, hopefully off to the left. That is where you want to be going um, to to take the next apex there. Uh, but now that the dust is cleared, everybody will see that car. Um, if that car is not uh, able to continue, uh, they'll go out and snatch it pretty quickly here. And uh, here comes the next group of cars coming through here. Two cars side by side, but they'll get straightened out here. And uh, they will have the opportunity to see that car there. The only problem is if you're like the second or third car in a line, but no one seems to be like that right now, you might not see that car. But everyone's gotten through nice and clean. Yeah, and luckily there, the, the big dust cloud is now gone. And he is right. all the way driver's right, just uh, poking out over the, uh, the edge of the track surface. We do have our emergency services teams responding currently as our first lap is now in the books. And Jimmy Simpson with a 6.6 .6 second advantage over Chip Romer, uh, Romer who managed to uh, to move his way back up in the second position after uh, having lost the uh, early positions to Dudley Fleck. Uh, big move here from Steve Forer. Forer who started in fourth now finds himself in third position ahead of Dudley Fleck. So uh, those two drivers swap the uh, the black and red machine of uh, Fleck now back in the fourth. James French now in his Ralt up into fifth position with Tony Oppheim sixth. That's in Formula Atlantic as uh, we do wait for the Continentals uh, to come through. And I believe Continentals, uh, let me take a look here, have now completed their first lap. Uh, here at Verison's uh, is your leader with Tom Hope and uh, much closer in Continental Land, Brian, than in Atlantic Land. I, th th I think I'm going to create a new theme park in the name of Continental <laughs> Land and have like those two separate areas. Uh, Formula X Land is going to be a little difficult though. Uh, but Verison's with, uh, he had about a five, uh, maybe a five car length advantage over Tom Hope. Another five back to Lasseur, then Hutchison and Johnson. Uh, and is uh, also Brian Tomasi did not take the green flag today in Continental. We had a number of drivers in Atlantic not taking the field. Uh, Shane Kennett, J.R. Smart, Jeff Antonelli, Jeff Keecher, and Marcel LaFontaine not taking the green flag in Formula X. And, uh, you know, I think I mentioned yesterday, a uh, pretty close race in Formula X with our two Formula Mazda drivers. Uh, Jacob Funkenmotor, uh currently your leader there. Uh, with uh, about, uh, last time we saw him go by, about six car lengths is our leader now, overall leader Jimmy Simpson crosses the line just as the rest of the Atlantic field is starting to come up the Road America straight. He really now stretching things out, uh, uh, put another second between he and Steve Four. All right, we've got a replay of that incident at the kink. We'll take a look at it right now with 10 to go here. Uh, Michael Barrison's your FC leader. Here is your replay. There is that car coming through. Where, oh, there we go. Wow, he lost it really early there. That is yeah. not the typical uh, the typical methodology for spin in the kink, um, and that probably helped him stay drivers right there uh, and out of the way of the other cars. So uh, he must have. Oh, and then we and have we've got one of our Atlantics, Brian, uh, pulling yep. off on the side. I'll have the number for you here. And they believe it's the seven one machine. Of Chip that Romer Chip that Romer. is uh, oh. pulled off. Drivers right there coming out of turn three. Uh, we've got, uh, you can see there, right past the flag station. They're going to go verify the number, and uh, we'll see if they need to get that car moved. But it looks like he's pretty far off the track. Yeah, and that's a place where they'll probably just leave that car till the end of the race there, and we'll keep going. Uh, we'll keep going. Uh, without a full course yellow here at all. All right, and so uh, also uh, we're hearing from the corner station that he still has the motor running. He may be trying to get that car back underway. We'll see if uh, see if that, if that car does continue. Maybe a gearbox problem or something. Yeah, exactly. All right, 10 to go. Jimmy Simpson, Steve Forner, Dudley Fleck, and uh, it's probably now James French in second place. And um, then you go down to your Formula Continental uh, class here, and you've got uh, Michael Barrison's Tom Hope and uh, Devin Lasseur. That looks very familiar uh, to me, Greg. Uh, pretty much the same way they ran up front yesterday. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and also, very similarly, uh, Jacob Vinkenmolder and Kevin Denault 
is your uh, are your two uh, first and second place cars in Formula X. All right, so this is, a, I think, a great battle to watch, though. Coming up the Road America straight now, Brian, side by side is the battle for second with Steve Forer and Dudley Fleck as they now are making their way down towards turn number one. And yeah, it looks like just a single car for a moment there, uh, but it is actually two. And I believe we now have Dudley Fleck at moving into second position, getting past Steve Forer on the front straight before the breaking zone of turn number one. Indeed, that red, white, and blue machine of Fleck moves into second and uh, James French, driver of the number 41 Ralt out of Sheboygan. He is not very far behind now. He is uh, only about six car lengths back. Yeah, most of our cars here seem to have come up with their, their place and their lot, what's going on. Uh, not a ton of side-to-side, uh, -side, nose-to-tail type action going on at the moment. Uh, so uh, that sometimes is what happens here. Uh, we've got an 11-second lead in Formula Atlantic, and then we've got a um, four-second lead in uh, in Formula Continental. So um, that is um, that is where we are with things at the moment. Yeah, and so Brian uh, just got word that the uh, the 71 machine uh, he is a keeper. Uh, they are getting the driver out of the car, and uh, they are going to drop the local caution there. Uh, so uh, they'll be back, of course, you know, where that caution was, it, it covers a good portion of the Marine sweep from uh, exit of three down to turn five. And uh, so with that yellow withdrawn, uh, you should see people getting a little bit more racy. Uh, and speaking of racy, uh, Jimmy Simpson just sets, resets the fastest lap at a 203.819. That was a full four seconds faster. Uh, then Steve Forer and Dudley Fleck uh, running second and third, and actually third and second uh, in Formula Atlantic. Um, so, Brian, one of the things, uh, and I, I don't think we've really talked about it much, and I don't want to jinx anything or anyone uh, here, by the way, uh, just crossing the stri uh, stripe and uh, completing lap number five, which will be the fourth under green, uh, Dudley Fleck now stretching things out over James French. Uh, that last lap now about uh, about 10 car lengths separating them uh, but uh, you know one of the things for us to, to look at here and I think especially as it concerns this race group uh, is the wind and the weather that we have here the wind is considerably heavier than we saw yesterday uh, it is uh, it appears to be blowing from uh, the flags directly across from me at least on the front straight uh, running against, uh, basically against traffic, running from turn one back down towards turn 14. And uh, I wonder with these very light formula cars, how much it would affect them. Yeah, I don't think it affects them much in that situation, but I will tell you, it will affect them going through the carousel, because uh, that's where you're going to get crosswinds uh, going into and out of the carousel. And uh, as you see that flag off there to the right, uh, you know, out the distance, that means that going into the carousel, they've got uh, wind coming from the right, coming out of the carousel is coming from the left. So impossible to set up your car for uh, for too much, uh, for uh, winds coming in different directions in the same corner. Um, but that's where it's more of an issue uh, than anywhere else um, for these cars. Um, and we'll see, you know, what that has, you know, what that does to them. All right, and uh, we're going to try and pick up here in just a moment uh, this battle, not for the lead, but the battle for second in Formula Continental, uh, Brian, as uh, it is uh, very, very tight at the moment, and I think that that may be it coming up through uh, through the Bill Mitchell bend. Uh, we'll definitely track them in just a few moments here, uh, but uh, Tom Hope and Devin Lasser have been at it now for, the, frankly, this entire race, and uh, we'll check here. And uh, actually, that's the battle for third in Formula Atlantic that just crossed the stripe uh, with uh, James French and Steve Forer. Is James French now running the fastest lap of anyone this race in the number 41 machine, takes over the last podium paying position, gets around Steve Forer, who had been as high as second position. They're coming down into turn one now, or actually through turn one. Oh, uh, pardon me, not the, not the battle for third. That was the battle for second with Dudley Fleck and James French having run the fastest, uh, the fastest lap uh, here. And uh, let's take a look. Yeah. 
And uh, those cars are 10 seconds back from your leader. Um, and that fast lap that James French uh, ran just before getting passed by Dudley Fleck um, was a 2.02.6. Uh, so with seven laps to go, if he's going to circulate two seconds a lap faster than our leader, um, that is enough time to catch the front of this field. So we'll see if they can keep that up. And uh, a matter of fact, Brian, that was uh, Fleck just passed, uh, or probably French passed Fleck for second. Okay. So the uh, the red, white, and blue number 74 of, uh, of Dudley Fleck now falls back into third position. Yeah, sounds like uh, that'll be reflected next time they cross the start-finish line here and hit the timing stripe um, once they cross here. So Flex on the move right now. We're going to keep an eye on that, Greg. Uh, we should also, let's do this. Let's take our break and get our call to sure. trade in, um, and then we can, uh, we can have our action all the way to the checkered flag here. All right, sounds good, Brian. Attention in the paddock. First call to the grid for race group number three. Spec Miata. Spec Miata drivers, please start heading to the grid. Race group three. Spec Miata, please head to the grid. And uh, let's take a quick break, and we'll be back here with more Formula Car action from the National Park of Speed and the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints in just a moment. Tire Rack was established over 40 years ago by an SECA member with a passion to find the right tires, wheels, brakes, and suspension products for racers and enthusiasts both on the street and on the track. As official tire retailer of Sports Car Club of America since 1995 and sponsor of the Runoffs Pole Award, along with the National Solo Program, Time Trials Nationals and National Tour, and Track Night in America, Tire Rack is proud to support the SECA and its members as they go have fun with cars. Mazza Vineyards is the exclusive sparkling wine for podium celebrations at the Hoosier Racing Tire SECA Super Tour, SECA Runoffs, and Tire Rack SECA Pro Solo. Celebrate your race weekend with Mazza Vineyards and learn more at enjoymazza.com. Summit Racing Equipment, the official high-performance source and proud sponsor of the SECA Road Racing Program, is celebrating its 55th anniversary as the world's speed shop. Haggerty is the official and exclusive insurance partner for the Sports Car Club of America. Haggerty provides affordable off-track insurance protection for motorsports vehicles while in the paddock, in transit, in storage, and at the shop. They provide guaranteed value coverage and even have protection for your trailers. SCCA members can save 5% on insurance through Haggerty. Learn more at Haggerty.com. Haggerty, let's drive together. Hoosier Racing Tire is proud to be the presenting sponsor of SECA's Super Tour. Hoosier's mission is to be the dominant customer-driven provider of tires to race teams domestically and internationally. Realizing Hoosier's existence and continued success is dependent upon how well we meet our customers' expectations by providing the safest, most reliable, high-quality race tires that put you in the winner's circle. For more information, see one of our trackside support personnel or the local Hoosier Tire racing dealer nearest you, or contact us at HoosierTire.com. Hoosier Racing Tires, truly designed for champions. Welcome back to the 2023 WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints, part of the 2023 Hoosier Racing Tire SCCA Super Tour. I'm Greg Ginsburg along with Brian Bolanski. And uh, Brian, uh, things are uh, not slowing down here in Formula Atlantic or Formula Continental. And, uh, you know, we just saw James French as we went to break set the fastest lap of the race. By the way, French, our 2020 SCCA 2020 prototype one national champion uh and uh, this being his home track he knows his way around but jimmy right. simpson returns the favor yeah uh and wow did he put in a flyer almost uh, almost uh two tenths of a second faster than french's previous fast lap yeah i think someone uh, pressed that little button on the side of their headset and said hey jimmy he's coming you know <laughs> because he uh, quickly got back on the throttle and and, uh, and refocused and, and moved on. Uh, but if you look right again, uh, James French has set, uh, gone blue in sector one again. So uh, he's not going to give up on this. And as you said, uh, he is a former national champion winning it at Road America. Of course, he is from Sheboygan, so that car is fueled by Bratwurst. And, uh, <laughs> and he will do his best to catch to the front uh, of this pack and catch Jimmy Simpson before this whole thing is done. Five laps to go. That's still 20 miles of racing here at Road America. So um, there's still a lot of time for him to, to try to get this thing done. Uh, but being 10 seconds back, he's really got to get a move on. 
Hold on, Brian. One second. I am receiving a special gift from a very special racer. As uh, Kelvin Dago has uh, brought oh. coffee and donuts. Uh, <laughs> Got to give that man a big hug for me. He has uh, been a longtime <laughs> friend of the inside the SECA podcast. Yes. Um, and he helped us. We gave away the uh, the awards for the best uh, military drive of the of the day at the runoffs last year, and he helped us uh, uh, put that award together. So uh, Kelton's one of the best guys. Uh, for, uh, he's a veteran, served our country, and uh, uh, I always enjoy getting time to catch up with him. All right, so we've got, I just gave Kelton uh, one of the headsets here, and uh, apparently, uh, you know, I bet you, you know, your wife has been racing in the Washington, D.C. region, Kelton, and, uh, uh, and uh, she might have heard a comment that I made yesterday. <laughs> so when we were on track yesterday, uh, as you thanked us for bringing coffee and donuts, she said, you didn't bring them coffee and donuts this time. What is wrong with you? <laughs> so I had to be sure I rectified that situation this morning. And happy birthday, Brian. Oh, Very, thank you, Kel. Uh, so, sorry you're not here. I actually brought a candle and a cookie <laughs> for you, and we were going to sing you happy birthday this morning with all the other racers. But uh, you didn't make the track this time, so hopefully we'll see you at the runoffs. We absolutely will. And, and i got to tell you, though, the only thing is, Proper form in Wisconsin would have been to deliver bratwurst for uh, the crew and, and not and not donuts. But I'm sure they won't turn out down the donuts. Where were you 10 minutes ago when I was at the counter? I mean, come on. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. And, of course, we're going to see Kelton a little bit later today. He's racing in Formula Enterprises 2. Uh, his race is uh, at 2.30 this afternoon. I'm doing the rain dance. For, uh, as, as we've uh, spoke before, uh, having a few issues with the car, but uh, – we're always pretty decent in the rain, so I'm not so sure if I want it or I don't, uh, especially with everything going on, but we'll be ready no, no matter what. There's a bunch of your competitors who are walking around right in your car right now trying to figure out what they can do to make sure you can sabotage. <laughs> if you're asking for rain here, i got to tell you. Oh, um, i, I got to go now then. <laughs> uh, All right, well, I'll tell you what, let's, Jago, let's, everyone. let's get back to the action here. Kelton, thank you so much. My You're friend, welcome, gentlemen. thank you, yeah. and say hi to your wife for us. Excellent. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks for the broadcasting. Also, we all really enjoy it. Thanks so much. That's great to hear. Thank you. All, all right, right, there you so, go. Yep. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. As I say, James French, he's uh, still working this. He's now uh, less than nine seconds back, um, but with four laps to go, Greg, he needs to make up some bigger chunks than just a half a second a lap. Yeah, yeah that's a, it's it's a long road to hoe or a big road to hoe or something like that. I don't know. I'm pulling out all the euphemisms I have this weekend. Uh, yes, it is a long way to go uh, here. And, uh, you know, if we if we take a look here at almost nine seconds. Yeah, I think that's going to be pretty darn difficult. And things are starting to stretch out uh, back behind French as well as, uh, you know, Flex still has a pretty big advantage now. Uh, almost 15 seconds back to Steve Forer. So, uh, and, uh, I, in, I will in, say, though, that yeah. um, Simpson, French, and Forer, uh, they're all part of Hayhill Motorsports, and uh, that team has had a great weekend. Uh, they finished uh, three of the top four spots yesterday as well. So uh, Hayhill Motorsports definitely has this track figured out uh, for uh, at least for this weekend. All right, and uh, you'll, Brian, we've got uh, some emergency services vehicles responding, I believe, over by turn five. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's. Yeah, looks like it went down into that. Uh, there's a there's a pretty big runoff area on the outside of turn five, uh, because you are carrying so much speed there out of the first sector, uh, and uh, we'll see. We can see the teams going and responding there. Uh, well, we'll uh, as soon as we uh, get some information on that car number, we'll let you know. And as we saw yesterday, if they didn't make the cut the access road to get off of that area. Uh, you do not want to leave a car down there because we saw a car come down there with no brakes yesterday. And uh, had that car hit another car, that would have been very no bueno. So yeah. um, uh, that that's um, – oh, and then we have a slow car here. Uh, that looks yeah. like one of our Continentals. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, and it looks like uh, looks like it's one of our Continentals there, and you can see the white flag is for that vehicle. Uh, and it, from the way it was uh, pitching around, Brian, I, I think there might be a, certainly a mechanical issue yeah. uh, there with that car, maybe. Or something. Yeah. So we've got the, in Continental, we've got uh, Michael Verison as your race leader, followed by uh, um, Tom Open second, and uh, Devin Lasura third. Although we're thinking of that. That it, and and I've just gotten word car. from the uh, from the corners that is Devin Lasur in the 05 machine we could see there as he pulled off the track uh, coming into the uh, coming into the cake 
And that is uh, going to move Bill Johnson in the 42 machine up into the podium positions here, uh, getting around the 0-5, and uh, likely uh, that'll move Hutchinson up into fourth. As, uh, Brian, the next time our leader goes by, our overall leader, Jimmy Simpson, uh, he will get the white flag. Just one lap to go as he's coming up. Uh, and there he is coming up through uh, through Bill Mitchell. Now, real quick, as we're getting to that point, let me make another call to the grid for our next group. Attention in the paddocks. Second call to the grid for race group number three. Spec Miata, please start heading to the grid. Spec Miata drivers, please head to the grid. Your race is next. All right, with... Uh about six miles to go here in this race for our race leaders. Uh, that is Jimmy Simpson, uh, James French, and Dudley Fleck. Uh, French picks off another half a second uh, off of Jimmy Simpson, but like we said, that's not enough uh, to get this done. But he's still pedaling it around because, of course, you know, anything can happen to that lead car in the final lap. Uh, CC Smith in the chat saying hi. She, of course, is the uh, Super Tour uh, uh, Series Administrator. She's watching here in California. All right, Brian, here coming out of turn 14 now uh, is our overall leader, Jimmy Simpson, leading Formula Atlantic uh, by a considerable margin. And white flag is in the air, and we are working the last lap here at Road America. All right, four miles until you get to uh, June Sprint's glory here. I saw the June Sprint trophies. It's a good-looking trophy, there, Greg. Yeah, oh, it is. I, I, it's it's more than the more than you know your typical thirty-dollar <laughs> wood little wood trophy that most people just aspire to when they come club racing. It's That's a right. it's a nice bit of hardware there. Uh, also, want to thank um, um, Devin Lasour. Pulled off in a great spot. Got out of the he way. Did. Uh, made sure that his competitors didn't have to worry about any kind of uh, problems there with that. And uh, that's, a, that's a power move there. All right, as we uh, look through the rest of the field here, uh, you know, again, things have really started to stretch out here in Atlantic uh, with uh, James French almost 10 seconds back from Fleck. Another 20 seconds back uh, from Fleck to four in Formula Continental. Uh, Verisons, again, pretty much from the start of the race, just started to walk away. We only have four drivers on the lead lap. Uh, Tom Hope, 20 seconds back from uh, from Verisons. Another seven and a half back to Bill Johnson in third, who would who would have just assumed third place uh, from Devin Lasser. Mark Hutchison, another 16 back from there. And uh, in Formula X, unfortunately, Brian, we're not seeing the battle that we saw yesterday uh, that uh, ended uh, probably within about three car lengths uh, separating Vinkamolder to Denault. At this point, Denault almost 40 seconds in arrears of Jacob Vinkamolder for the battle in Formula X. All right, there is your leader heading through Bill Mitchell Bend. It's that orange car. Uh, as a McLaren fan, I'm just going to call it Papaya. And uh, we'll see that thing come up the hill for the final time. It'll be Jimmy Spitz with the uh, Jimmy. No, that, Jimmy that's Spitz. that. Yeah. What, what <laughs> are you, Simpson. LA Law? LA Law exactly. fan or something? Jimmy Simpson with the June Sprint sweep here. Ah, <laughs> uh, good job. <laughs> there you go. Great, great run for two days in a row for Jimmy Simpson. Uh, really showing his mettle here at the, uh, and, and maybe his carbon fiber here at Road there America. You know for the June sprints as we wait for the second car to cross the stripe. And there you go, crossing the stripe, James French, and then Dudley Fleck. Uh, they'll come home second in third in Formula Atlantic. And we'll see if we can track the uh, track our leader in Formula Continental, uh, Michael Verisons. Actually, I believe, did we see? Uh, actually, I believe Verison's actually already crossed the stripe, taking the win uh, in Continental with Tom Hope crossing the stripe here just a moment ago, finishing in second. Bill Johnson uh, should be our next Continental driver to cross the finish line, and there is the 42 machine. Bill Johnson will come home in third in his Van Diemen. Tom Hope with... Uh uh, with some fans in the chat here, just uh, just down the street from me here in Downey, California, making the long tow out uh, to Road America for the June Sprint. So congrats to him as well. 
All right, and coming across the line now, uh, the remainder of our uh, remainder of our Atlantic field. We had uh, Co uh, Morrill, Conger, Beaver. We just had the 27 of Jonathan Collins come across the stripe as well. So let's run down here, Brian, the top 10 in Formula Atlantic. Of course, we talked about Jimmy Simpson, James French, and Dudley Fleck, your top three. Steve Forer, Tony Oppheim, Rob Radman, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Brandon Schwartz, seventh. Adrian Morrill, eighth. Alex Conger, ninth. And just now crossing the line, Fastest lap of the race for him. Driver of the number 88 machine, uh, that is Sean Beaver. He'll finish 10th in Formula Atlantic. In Formula Continental was Mike, uh, Michael Verisons with the win for the second day in a row with a commanding win. 25 seconds between he and Tom Hope. Bill Johnson will come home in third. Mark Hutchison, Bill Washlogger will finish in fifth. Devin Lasore. Uh, finishes three laps down with uh, that retirement. And Devin Hansen uh, only completes a single lap. And then finally in Formula X, Jake Vinkamoner will take the win over Ken Denal. So uh, let's make a final call to the grid for our next race group. Attention in the paddock. Final call to the grid for race group number three, Spec Miata. Please head to the grid now. Race group three, Spec Miata, your race is next, and so I, I think Brian, we've uh, we've given away the script here. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's take a quick break, and when we come back, it's spec time for Spec Miata action here at the June Sprints, uh, part of the 2023 Hoosier Racing Tire SCCA Super Tour. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Road America and the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. I'm Greg Ginsburg along with Brian Bolanski and Brian next up it's time for Spec Miata. 30 or probably 13 laps uh, here to the checkered flag for the Advanced Auto Sports Challenge where our first place winner is going to take home $200 in cash and two or a certificate for two Hoosier Racing Tires, also going to win Chicago Region June Sprint's checkered flag. Obviously, the, the checkered flag that they take uh, as they win their race, and also a Chicago June Sprint's hat. Our second place finisher will come home with $100 in cash and a certificate from Hoosier Racing Tire for a single tire and a June Sprint's hat. Our third place finisher will win $50 in cash, also a Breakometer $100 product certificate and a June Sprint's hat, but that's not all. Hoosier is going to award one tire to fourth through eighth place and is also going to have a random drawing for three tires. We also have the Advanced Autosports Highest Finishing Hard Charger Award, a $500 product voucher. So lots of prizes to win here today. Of course, uh, the glory of winning the June Sprints here in 2023. Uh, is only going to go to one person. So let's go and run down uh, part of our starting order here. Brian, we had 58 drivers over the course of the weekend set qualifying times. Let's run down the top 30. Starting 30th, driving the number 191 machine from Neenah, Wisconsin, it's Shane Sullivan. Chris Kraft will start 29th, driving the number 74 car. He's from Pillager, Minnesota. Starting 28th, Keith Harris in the number 95 car. He's from Chicago, Illinois. And Jeremy Butts, who we saw a little bit earlier today in the T4 race, he starts six, uh, 27th in the number 60 machine. Ryan Heishman will start 26th. He's in the 146 car. He's from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. While Michael Lomena will start 25th, driving the number 180, 188 car. He's from Oakland, New Jersey. Frankie Barroso will start 24th. He's in the 48 car. He's from Miami Springs, Florida. With Bob Stretch driving the 99 car. He's in, uh, from Arlington, Texas and starts 23rd. Starting 22nd, driving the number 80 Mazda Miata from St. Paul, Minnesota is Samantha Silver with Greg Sorg starting 21st. He's from Oak Park, Illinois, driving the number 71 car. Logan Stretch is driving the number 98 today. He's from Arlington, Texas, and he'll start 20th with Alex Stanfield starting 19th, driving the number 5. Nick Bruni, who's our reigning national champion in Spec Miata, he's going to start 18th today in the number 1 car. He's from Arlington, Virginia, with Brett Kowalski driving the number 15 car. The Las Cruces, New Mexico driver starts 17th, starting 16th. Driving the number 108 machine from Boca Raton, Florida, it's Jordan Rick Segrini with Jonathan Davis starting 15th. He will be driving the number 6 car. Andrew DeVoto will start 14th, the number 88 car comes all the way from Wilson, Montana. Todd Burris, former national champion in Spec Miata, will start 13th on the field today. He's from Melbourne, Florida, driving the 56 machine. Spencer Lofton will start 12th. He's from Henderson, Tennessee, and drives the 110. Skyler Cottrell driving the number 91 car. He's from Atlanta, Georgia, starts 11th and starting 10th today, driving the 14 Mazda Miata from Lakewood, Illinois. It's Alex Bertignoli. Michael Carter will be driving the 08 car. The Savannah, Georgia native will start 9th with Miles Gortz starting 8th, driving the number 41 machine. Starting 7th, driving the 199 car from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. It's Ethan Jacobs with Matt Novak starting 6th, driving the number 11 car. Cam Evans from Appleton, Wisconsin. He was your pole sitter for yesterday's race. He starts fifth today, driving the 155 car. With Tyler Brown starting fourth, he's driving the number 07 machine. He's out of Muskego, Wisconsin. Jim Drago, two-time national champion, driving the number two machine. He starts third today. He's from Memphis, Tennessee. And your front row today, starting second on the field. Yesterday's winner, uh, driving the number 39 machine from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's Danny Stain and your pole sitter today from Little Mountain, South Carolina, driving the number 66 car. Lake Stain representing Opium Autosports. It's Chuck McTutis. As uh, we have the field making their way down through uh, the Kettle Moraine, or probably the Kettle Bottoms, and uh, down towards Canada Corner. And Brian, we've got, also got a special guest with us here today, uh, and that is Johan Schwartz, who we're going to see a little racing a little bit later today, but a uh, known pro racer, and uh, thanks for joining us, Johan. Well, uh, glad to be here. What, a, what an event this is. My first time racing in this event uh, with uh, my companion uh, that I coach, uh, uh, Tom Noble, who uh, was... Uh, able to uh, take the checkered flag yesterday, so super excited for him, and he won uh, last year down at Sebring on the Super Tour, so 
he's uh, making great progress. Absolutely. All right, here we come up through uh, Bill Mitchell Bend here, and uh, we've got all the cars already lined up really nicely, two by two. Um, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, didn't when happen in Formula Atlanta. <laughs> exactly. When we're this early and they're already lining up, which means we should be able to have a pretty nice and tidy uh, uh, run up to the green flag here. I do believe they called this one off yesterday because they started racing too soon. Hopefully yes. they've learned their lesson here and they'll keep the speed down until they see the green flag. Our, uh, our Elkhart Lake Blue pace car coming off onto pit lane. Here we come up the hill once again and uh, looking fantastic. That's the best look at two lines of uh, spec as you're ever gonna see. Here they come up the hill. We're looking at the starter to see what the starter thinks. The starter likes what he sees. The green flag is in the air and we are racing at the June Sprints. And uh, there they all go across the line, heading down to turn one now. This is where we could have a moment, but we got through it very nicely yesterday. Let's hope we do the exact same thing today. Fanning out in the back of the field. Everyone looks like they're getting through very nicely. We'll pick them up here as they come down the hill from turn one into turn three. They call that turn two, which is not much of a turn, it's more of a bend. And uh, all of our cars coming through, lots of side-by-side -side action. I see a little puff of brake dust there. Uh, a little further back in the pack. That does not surprise me in the least. And now they come down to turn five. And uh, everybody looks good. McTutis, uh has moved up to uh, second, I believe. Actually, Matutis is, is your leader, yes, Brian. that's right. Uh, and uh, the big thing here is Jim Drago, who started third on the field, has uh, split the two teammates that started off in the front row, moving Danny Stain back into third position. Uh, and then sitting fourth, we've got oh. Tyler Brown. Now, uh, oh, and we've got a we've got a car that's run a little wide under braking, going down into turn five, and they've got a real wide, uh, real wide apron there on the exit oh, of five. There's a spinner right there in the back of the pack, and hopefully no one runs. Oh, that was really close, but everyone was able to avoid very, very nicely. And then we got another car that went up here at the exit of six. Johan, have you spent any time in Spec Miatas? I have. Um, when I started first in the U.S. and. Uh, Spec Miata was fairly new. Uh, that I did a fair amount of regional racing in the uh, Spec Miatas and uh, in the southeast. Uh, there was uh, ECR, so I was co-driving with people that I was also coaching. So it's incredible seat time. They, um, it, it, it's almost should be mandatory that anybody who wants to start racing should start off in a Miata. It's such a great learning tool. The competition is so close, and uh, you know they are also everything being relative one of the least expensive classes to run so it's it has a lot of good stuff for going for it and look at, i mean going through the s's there they they don't lift and they push each other through the s's so if you want to learn racecraft this is one of the classes to learn it in absolutely ever start a race with 56 spec miatas i have not and i am impressed how well they're doing i mean you've got 56 guys that all want to win right yeah. And um, there are some opportunities that could be had or hold that was there. And uh, some of them obviously either took it or, and if they did, they didn't, you know, have um, very little contact. So it's, it's very impressive. They, they really, uh, people just watching this could learn a lot. All right. Uh, turns out that car that uh, we saw go around coming through turn eight, that was the 118 car. Uh, that had gone around. That was Julie Dahmer. She uh, has now obviously uh, gone and continued. One of the quick notes, and uh, nice to have Mike Meathead Collins in the chat and maybe sending me some notes also. Uh, it looked as though the front row uh, of, uh, and this may have helped the whole field uh, grid up here to start this race, uh, Brian and uh, Johan, that uh, McTutis and Stain, they, they kind of hung back a little bit from the pace car. Very slow start running up the hill, trying to then get that advantage uh, as the green flag flew. We saw McTutis really get a very good jump when the green flag came out. Uh, but now as our racers are working lap number two, uh, bit of a bit of a breakaway now, I think with the top five or six cars starting to separate out. But uh, we're seeing here, and we kind of talked about strategy early on with these, with these longer, you know, uh, called the sprint race, only 13 laps. But a lot of these drivers here um, really not jockeying for position early on, just trying to get in line and, and work their way up and maybe be able to use the draft to work away from other drivers. Yeah, yeah I think all that to Denny Stain. He's just making a move for second place right here, uh, trying to get up with his partner there, Chuck Tutis. Uh, we'll see what happens as they exit turn six here. Uh, but uh, there was that move there, and they worked together, Greg. Uh, if anybody has a chance, and there you go, Steady moves into second place, Denny Stain. 
um, right behind Chuck Petutis. If you have a chance uh, to go look at the interview with Denny Stain after uh, yesterday's race, uh, he was so emotional that he got the win and with the help of Chuck Petutis. And then, and then Chuck came in. Those guys definitely worked together. And I imagine if there's a possibility, uh, Stain will return the favor today uh, and help uh, and help Petutis get to the Greek, to the checkered flag. Yeah, I mean, you can sell. I mean, every time I, I see uh, Denny at the track, I mean, he loves to spec Miata racing. And whether he finished first or fifth, I don't think it makes much of a difference as long as it's been a good race. And every time that uh, spec Miata, most of the time, I should say, you know, when they are working up front there and drafting back and forth, I can't imagine him not just having a huge grin on his face the way he is. Exactly. I mean, you can hear it from his interviews. He's he's always uh, uh, very, very complimentary of the racers around him, and I think he likes a, a good, clean race and a tough fight almost as much as he likes taking the checkered flag. Now, uh, Brian, a little bit further back in the pack, one of the drivers that we should be looking for, I mentioned the, uh, the number one car, reigning national champion, Nick Bruni. He started 18th on the field. Um, he is uh, now up, I believe, into 12th position uh, in the uh, the blue with orange stripe number one machine. Now, uh, earlier in the weekend, uh, actually during the test day, uh, he had some issues with the motor that was in the car. Uh, crew from E Street Racing replaced the motor, and there he is. He's in the, uh, the, the third from the back of that first pack now. So uh, definitely making his way up through the field uh, here, and they replaced the motor. It wasn't running exactly right yesterday, uh, and it looks like they've started to get it dialed in as uh, Bruni now uh, sitting right up in uh, 12th, uh, 12th position with Todd Burris, uh, another one of his teammates running 13th. Side-by-side -side action through turn one here, and lap after lap, it's happening, and lap after lap, uh, they're, they're doing it clean here, which is uh, pretty impressive because uh, turn one tends to be a little slippery here, uh, but they're making it through just fine, thankfully, and now side-by-side -side action going through, uh, going through turn three as well. Yeah, I think first and second, they're going to stay like that for a while yeah. and see just work together and, right. you know, teammates and the other guys and, and strung out. So now we'll see how everything pans out here with the strategy, right? Because if they start racing each other too hard, the other guys are going to catch up. So there, there's all these things and pieces exactly. of puzzle that constantly has to be evaluated for every move and everything that you want to do. Yeah, and you know, so, and, and I was going to say, Brian, and it was interesting yesterday, Johan, in uh, the much shorter race, which was only about six laps, six or seven laps, uh, that's exactly what they tried to do. But the effect of the draft is so strong with these Becniatas and with these very long straightaways, they couldn't really escape from the rest of the field. Uh, with uh, with Todd Burris and Jim Drago, uh, really they were there until the very end. And now we see jumping into the lead as they come into turn eight, Jim Drago in the number two machine who has a couple of championship wins here at Road America. Uh, he's your new leader. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. I was just going to say real quick, what happened there is that um, uh, McTudis went wide coming out of five, lost his momentum, and that's when Drago was able to pull up right past him. So um, that's why it's so important to hit your marks and hit your apexes really well here, especially when you're in a tight draft like this. Yeah, and you're constantly under pressure, right? There's, uh, we saw that... Uh the pair had a, a good lead, or a good lead. They had a couple callings, and then uh, but, uh, Drago was able to catch right up. And then uh, you still have to race late, break late, and kind of keep the tandem together. And then Drago said, "You know, because I think that Danny probably didn't want to make the pass right. on his teammate." And then Drago saw the opportunity. So now it's going to be interesting to see how what what happens now. Now you can see Danny going for second place and say, hey, let me help out here and let's get pulled back up again. Yeah, and that was a, that was very interesting coming up through Bill Mitchell as, uh, as McTudis was all the way driver's left and uh, we saw Stain and then following Stain, uh, Tyler Brown uh, actually driving around the teammate going to the right and now what we're finding as they come onto the front straight is uh, Chuck McTudis. Looks like he's now falling back probably around to fifth or sixth position. Actually, uh, about four cars all battling <laughs> right now uh, for, for uh, fourth. And uh, interesting here, uh, with great move up through the field, Michael Carter, who had run Spec Miata for a number of years, took his first win on the Super Tour, I think back in 2020. Um, he has now moved up into fourth position. He's part of that lead battle now uh, with Drago Stain and our new third place runner, uh, who is Matt Novak, who started sixth in the field today. Right, right now, the gap between first and eighth place is less than one second. If you go back to 15th place, the gap is less than three seconds right now from first to 15. So there is, there, anybody still has the chance to win this race here uh, in that top 10, no question. 
Um, what's the best uh, 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 drafting uh, pairing, Johan, to try to pull away? Is it two cards? Is it three cards? What's the best in this? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not checking sure if, if, if three is faster than two. Um, so I think the key is that you're doing it with a teammate and you kind of know which, you know, you spoke about uh, prior to the race that if we get hooked up, this is what we're going to try to do and so forth. Now, with now you can see Danny is actually taking the lead. He's kind of like, okay. And then, uh, you know, uh, Jim Draco is back into third. So obviously with what happened there, then Danny kind of took over. Let me go ahead and pull ahead. You come with me kind of thing. Exactly. So, uh, you know, but it's uh, Draco is going to be up there again. I mean, you know, that resume that he has with building cars, building engines, and, and also a, a good driver, you know. Uh, that one second in, uh, between the eight cars, I think, is going to be there for a while. Yeah, probably they've been yeah. there for a while, and I think that's only because of the length of this entire train at this point. You can see here that uh, that there are somewhere along the lines of about ten cars, uh, with the exception of that one little gap there uh, after our sixth place car uh, and, uh, uh, with Tyler Brown. Also interesting to note, uh, Jordan Rick Segrini, who had uh, mechanical issues on Saturday morning and qualified at the very back of the Spec Miata field. Uh, for yesterday's race, worked all the way up, started 57th, finished uh, 26, so uh, almost right in the middle of the field. He is now up to eighth in the field in this race right now. So uh, the driver, uh, the driver out of uh, Boca Raton, Florida, uh, right now running ahead of the two uh, former national champion Todd Burris and reigning national champion uh, Nick Bruni. Yeah, we're going to notice here that Chuck McTutis, who was Denny Stains, uh, Denny Stains. A drafting partner has draft fallen all the way to the back of this pack. Um, he is going to be the last black and yellow car there uh, in that big lead pack. Not quite sure what the situation is with that, uh, but definitely something uh, or possibly something amiss with that car. Uh, he has dropped all the way down now to um, 12th place as they cross the line. So um, we'll have to try to figure out what the deal is. Now the drafting partner for Danny Stain is Matthew Novak. Um, th that, those are two guys who probably haven't worked together at all, um, and they're going to have to figure out a way to do that. Yeah, and if you get a new drafting partner, even if it's not a teammate, you may also just kind of settle in like, hey, let's keep it this way. Obviously, they all know each other, teammate or not, right? And so little signal inside the car, let's try to see if we can pull away. Right. And then we'll try to settle it on the last lap kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whether he's, whether he's your teammate or not, the, 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 the object is to have the, the smallest barrier possible to getting the win. And if it comes down to a, just a battle between two cars, who cares? Is it Danny Stain? Is it uh, is it uh, you know Matt Novak? Who it doesn't matter? Uh, and uh, you know, as we're now uh, with nine laps to go in this uh, the 13 lap race, it may change again soon enough. We'll have to see. So it, it was interesting, Brian. You asked about you know whether these cars draft better uh, with two cars or three cars or what. Uh, I I look back and probably the biggest uh, test, the largest amount of testing that was done on this was back when the runoffs were at uh, uh, at Daytona International Speedway. Mm. Sure. back in 2015 because this was actually part of the testing uh, that these Spec Miata drivers did. We've got a driver who looks like went very wide out of turn number eight and has now re uh, recovered. I'll try and get the number on that in just a moment. But what they found is on the speedway portion of the track itself, uh, the two cars actually worked much better than three. Um, it was actually very difficult to keep the third car in that pack there, and, and four was just wouldn't work at all. And so they settled on two, and I think that is, you know, I think more or less um, carried over to some of these other tracks like Road America with these very long straights as well. And I think part of, you know, I think it, ultimately if you uh, time everything correctly, I think maybe second place uh, on the last lap, last corner, might actually be where you would like to be at. So, Certainly. you know, it's like, do you, you know, you want to put yourself in position, you can see Draco is now back up into second place, right? So what's going on there now, right? It's, what's Danny thinking right you're now, right. too? Yeah, what, what do you do when you're in the lead, when you when you come across the stripe with one lap to go? Yeah. <laughs> and then, and, and do, you, do, you, do you actually let, the, let somebody buy going into turn one, knowing that you then have the opportunity to retake the lead going into Canada Corner, for example? There's all, you know, the little shell game that goes on throughout the race here is amazing here is that we now have what we had originally on the last lap was a two-car breakaway. Well, that two-car breakaway, Brian, it is now completely gone uh, as we've got Stain, Drago, uh, Novak, Rick Segrini now up into fourth position. 
That driver is absolutely on fire. Uh, Tyler Brown, Michael Carter, all locked nose to tail as they were coming into one. Greg, is, is this a, a tire uh, marking race? Are they in that you see yes. that agreement this weekend? So, yes. So I'm wondering if possibly uh, that, that Chuck Petutis burned off his tires between yesterday and today, and he just doesn't have the grip to stick with the guys up front. Yeah, go ahead, Yeah, I, I think actually the uh, the Hoosier tires um, uh, heat cycle so well, and the trap being the, the, the way that it is, um, I don't know if that's the case. I think we might okay. be dealing with something, and maybe it's what happened down. It was a turn five. Five, yeah, we're. That could worry. maybe have something that happened down there sure. that caused what happened, and then that's now the cause for him not running so well. Yeah, and, and you know, and I noticed, I, or I mentioned that the, that big runoff area on the outside of turn five, uh, that apron there. The, is concrete and gator teeth where, where they have multiple dips in the pavement. And if you hit that wrong and you have the car angled the wrong way, it could certainly throw the alignment out to throw the toe off uh, on the car. And that might be affecting me. Might just not have the straight line speed that some of the other cars have here. Yeah. Greg, let's do this. Let's get our brake out of the way here because we're going to have an exciting last couple laps here. Yes, we so are. Let's do our call to grid, get our brake, and then we'll come back and uh, take you all the way to the checkered flag. Attention in the paddock, attention in the paddock. First call to the grid for race group number four, E Production, F Production, H Production, GT Lite, and B Spec Racers. Please start heading to the grid. Race group four, EP, FP, HP, GT Lite, and B Spec. Please head to the grid. Your race is next. So let's take a quick break, and we're going to thank some of our partners and sponsors. And when we come back, we'll take you all the way to the checkered flag here in Spec Miata from the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. We'll be right back. Ready for a new race trailer? Bravo Trailers is the exclusive trailer partner of the SECA. Owned by longtime SECA racers, Bravo Trailers work better, load easier, and tow better because we build them with racers in mind. Visit bravotrailers.com to see your new trailer in aluminum or steel. For more than 100 years, Sunoco, SCCA's official fuel partner since 2001, has been fueling victories both on and off the track, which is why Sunoco has trusted to fuel over 50 series of racing, driving, and winning, including the SCCA National Championship runoffs, SCCA Pro Racing, Trans Am, NHRA, and NASCAR. To find race gas near you, visit SunocoRaceFuels.com or call Sunoco at 800-RACE-GAS. Get more bang for your buck at SummitRacing.com. Choose from millions of in-stock parts from over 1,500 named brands, parts for racing, street performance, trucks, plus tools, accessories, and more. For over 25 years, championship-winning drivers and teams have demanded Hawk Performance Motorsports brake pads. Now you can have their advanced technology on your daily car, truck, or SUV with Hawk Performance Street products. With the improved HP Plus pad for that hybrid street and track feel, or Super Duty pads for tow vehicles, their all-new ER1 brake pad designed to take on even the longest race, and their all-new high-performance brake fluid, Hawk has all of your braking needs covered. Visit hawkperformance.com and like them on Facebook or Instagram to learn more about the Hawk Performance Advantage. Hawk Performance, what's stopping you? Welcome back, everybody, to Road America, the National Park of Speed, and the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. I'm Greg Ginsburg along with Brian Blansky and special guest Johan Schwartz. And uh, as we came back to coverage there, it looks like, uh, well, certainly something, Johan, to, uh, to break up that lead path. Yeah, that was uh, some exciting stuff. I don't think he lifted. No. He, he maintained the position and it, it was he was on the grass, but uh, he's like, I, I got to get back on. And that's another thing about these guys that are racing these races and in and, and such a tight pack. A lot of these guys have developed an incredible sense of car control because sometimes you have to, you know, really push the car, you go off and, you know, you correct it and don't hit anything. And it's, uh, it's pretty impressive uh, considering uh, the amount of cars that are here and, and how with respect they're racing each other. And if they do get a little bump, these guys are quick to correct it. So it, it's, it's really fun racing. So, Brian, I think what we saw there also is that the uh, that uh, fight with that car going off at of turn six, it's allowed now Danny Stain to open up about a uh, about what about eight car length advantage uh, over our second place runner, who I believe now is Jordan Rick Segrini 
in the 108 machine uh, there with Jim Drago running in third. Uh, we'll have to see if uh, Stain can uh, manage to hold off the field here as we've got somebody running a little wide through 10 and dropping, uh, dropping wheels there. You know, we had a little bit of uh, rain here last night, which has dampened the ground slightly, but as you can see there, uh, a lot of dust and dirt still flying through the air. And yeah. actually here, Rick, uh, Jordan Rick Segrini, I apologize, is actually in the blue 108 machine. He falls back into eighth position. He's working with Michael Carter in the 08 right now, trying to get back up towards the front. That's Tyler Brown in the uh, the silver 07, now running the second. And, and, and nothing makes Danny Stain happier than looking in his rear view mirror and seeing two and three wide uh, behind him. That's just the best news uh, for him to be able to have the potential to stay out front. Uh, the more those uh, those guys in the back uh, race for position and don't stick with the draft, the easier it's going to be with six laps to go here uh, for him to stay out as, as long as possible. The one thing you don't want is to have you get caught with two laps to go and just drive on by. So uh, he's got to keep that in mind as well. All right, so uh, just uh, got word uh, going into turn six, coming under the Corvette Bridge on the last lap. We saw Jordan Rick Segrini drop back into uh, uh, drop back into eighth position. Apparently, there was a little bit of contact, and when we saw the car go off uh, coming through turn six, that was actually Jordan Rick Segrini. He and uh, he and Jim Drago. Uh, there had been a little bit of contact on the exit there, and uh, whereas Drago was able to uh, uh, was sitting to the inside, the driver's left was able to uh, to keep the car running. Uh, Segrini. Obviously lost a number of positions uh, in doing that. Should also mention real quick, uh, Brett Kowalski, driver of the number 15 Spec Miata. Uh, he was a driver that had a pretty good hit coming out of the kink yesterday on the exit of the kink. Uh, smacked the tire wall pretty hard. Uh, it was a little surprised to see the car on track for today's race. Uh, he's made a run down the pit wall and uh, uh, pit lane, and it appears as though his race now done. Well, what's interesting, a lot of times how well they are quick. These guys have worked on these cars for so many yeah. years, and uh, they're really good mechanics there, the teams that are here. How they're able to get the cars back together and have them come back out to race, unfortunately, obviously, something was a little more missed, but they, yeah. it's pretty impressive. Now, now what's important is, and I bet you uh, within the next lap or two that the, uh, there's going to be some guys right behind Danny Stain where the other guys say, hey, we need to stop racing now. Let's just focus on catching up with back up to the lead, and then we'll start take, uh, put, putting ourselves in position again. Because obviously leaving Danny out there by himself with even seven, eight car lengths and the other guys just having to train, and they're going to be right behind. And there we go. So, uh, and, and, and there's, there's that advantage now completely ball. gone. But here's <laughs> something. Brian, look at this. Yeah. Look at who's drafting up with Jim Drago now. Uh, and uh, Danny Stain don't, might don't have some, some real help in just a moment. Yeah, don't look now. That's Chuck Matunas in fourth place and uh, uh, making the move up through the field. That's pretty impressive to go from 12th to 4th here uh, in just three or four laps. Uh, so he is, uh, he's going to be right there before too long as we, uh, as we keep moving through here. That's going to be an interesting story to see what happened down in turn five, falling back and now kind of get back into the rhythm again, you know? Uh, if the car had a little something going on in this and, uh, and now it's back again. So very interesting what's going on. And now oh. they're coming. Oh, they're coming off there in turn three. And then they're ca catching up to uh, a lap car too. So how they negotiate that is obviously going to be critical as well. Well, I think what we're seeing here, we've seen a couple of cars hanging out here on the last few laps. They're starting to realize that there's 20 minutes left or 20, yeah, 20, uh, 20 miles. miles left in this race. And uh, there's not much time left to get to the front. So uh, it's no more time just to wait in line. If you're in 10th or 12th, you want to get to the front of this race. Now is the time to go and get there. Yeah, and we can see they're coming out of turn five. I think a couple people have that idea. And uh, as they uh, come underneath the Corvette Bridge, that's likely going to split this uh, long train of cars up a little bit more. Uh, and you can see now uh, with the... Uh, with Chuck McTutis up in the third, uh, he's uh, trying to do his best to hold off Jim Drago as they come down into turn number eight and uh, perhaps uh, give uh, Stain his best opportunity uh, at a second win here this weekend. Uh, as, uh, he's going to try and leave it to Tyler Brown, uh, or leave it to Danny Stain to hold off just one car, and that's Tyler Brown. Yeah, we had that car there basically move over and almost stop on the track to let the lead pack through. Now there's a second lead pack. I don't know that you want to do that, the, uh, the slow and stop uh, method of moving over because you're just going to get a whole bunch more cars coming. Uh, but uh, did not have any effect on the leaders here. 
uh, that first car, uh, that first lap car. So good on him. Yeah, now it's also, you know, you want to see green flag racing. Right. You don't want to see it end on the yellow, right? And obviously, Road America does a great job with the hot pole. So, right. how, what kind of, the, what the track does, right? If you were to go into a different track that would full course yellow for, for just somebody sitting on the side of the track. So, with only now four laps coming up soon to go, it's like, what do you do? Okay, I'm at Road America, hot poles, just local yellows. Maybe it's good to be in second place. Right. But you also have to start thinking about if it goes full course. If it does, exactly. <laughs> you know, so there's all those things going through your, your mind right now. We've got the usual suspects, Greg, up at the top of the of, of the uh, of the rundown here. Uh, Danny Stain, Jim Drago, Charles McTudis. These are all drivers that we see up there a lot. The, the, and a few names that we don't, and those names have, have hometowns of Muskego, Wisconsin, and Bartlett, Illinois. And, and these are hometown drivers who have lots of time here at Road America. Uh, getting into the mix here at the June Sprints. Yeah, indeed. I think the wild cards are Tyler Brown, are Matthew Novak, uh, that are currently running second and fifth. Of course, Novak has been up as high as second uh, here today as well. And, uh, you know, I, I keep looking back, and I don't want to jinx things here, but I, I remember a run uh, that uh, Danny Stain here had at the June Sprints when rain started to come uh, come out. Actually, the, the, the track started off wet, went dry. Stain had opened up almost a, I'd say, probably a 15-second advantage over the rest of the Spec Miata field, and then the track dried out, and everybody came back to him. And uh, right now, he does have just that one driver behind, but I think we're already starting to see uh, McTutis and Drago starting to close things back down as the laps drop down. As, uh, the next time they cross the start-finish line, there'll be just three laps remaining. Well, and now McTutis is trying to bridge that gap by himself, which is tough. Um, but it looks like he's uh, not too far back from the second place car. If he can get there, uh, it is going to be a very, very interesting last few laps. Yeah, and matter of fact, it looks like uh, Matt Novak did get around Jim Drago as they came underneath the Corvette bridge to move him now up in the fourth position. And uh, Michael Carter uh, sitting in eighth, and uh, he's in striking distance again. He's a, a Super Tour winner in, in his own right. Uh, spent a number of years running in uh, the Global MX-5 Cup and uh, is now back uh, to SCCA Road Racing. Yeah, I have no doubt uh, that uh, there's going to be pair here coming up uh, when they come out of 14. I think uh, uh, he's going to be right on, uh, is it McTutis that is going to yeah. be right behind uh, Danny? And, uh, and and a perfect example also with these guys racing, who is behind me, know who you race. Right. What do they do, right? But how are they racing? Are they putting the bumpers to me when I'm at, at a lot of yard? Do they, are they concerned about that? Do they lift a little bit so we don't get uh, out uh, of shape? Uh, so it, there's all those things that you are considering with depending on it, who you're exactly. racing. Exactly, and, and, and that's where you have the unknowns, where, where Stain has been racing against a Drago or his teammate McTutis or a Nick Bruni or a, a, a Todd Burris for years and years and years. He doesn't have that experience with Tyler Brown. Uh, he doesn't necessarily know those tendencies, and uh, we'll have to see how it plays out as they cross the start-finish line now uh, to start uh, our 11th lap of 13. And uh, as they do, it's uh, Stain and Brown and then McTutis uh, locked in, I believe, uh, as they cross the line uh, with Matthew Novak. So Novak is now worked up to the back of the 66 car. Yeah. Uh, we've got those, uh, those two pairs now. And uh, uh, Drago has uh, dropped a little bit off that pace. We'll see as they come down the hill. Yeah, the Tyler's on. Also a situation where, where while Denny Stain might not know a lot about Tyler Brown, Tyler Brown probably knows a lot about Danny Stain and knows that he's going to race him clean. And if they work together and can pull away, when they get to the final lap, they can race each other really hard. And Tyler Brown will know he's not going to have any issues with Danny Stain as far as being roughed up. And they can just have a fun, hard battle for the win here on the final lap. Yeah, there's one thing Tyler Brown does not want to happen right now is for the two other cars behind to come up. Correct. So I don't think he's going to battle Danny too hard unless Danny makes a mistake he may take the lead otherwise he's going to stay there in second place yeah. and then it's going to be a turn 14 shootout yeah I mean anything anything to uh, to, to keep from running the risk of losing that gap to stain 
uh, early on trying to, and, and I'm sure Stain probably knows that, that he probably doesn't have to worry about a full-on attack with two laps to go, uh, or he doesn't have to worry about, uh, you know, trying to beat him down into the breaking zone in turn five, and uh, that, that it likely is going to come down to that final corner. Yeah, if that happens, the other guys are going to be right on Right back on him, yeah. exactly. So I think they, they're both on the same plan right now. That plan, you know, but then they're going to have separate plans on the last lap. There's no doubt about it. This is turning out to be a great race. Yeah, and uh, they're coming up on a little bit of slower traffic here as well. That might create some monkey wrenches as they come down and make the run, uh, make the run down the kettle bottoms over towards Canada Corner. We'll see here if they're a little close, and uh, you know if they get to that uh, that slower car coming up through the Bill Mitchell Bend, where things start to tighten up and those cars get really loaded up. Uh, it, it might also uh, bring our leaders back uh, back to the second pack. It's and what's interesting, interesting uh, oh, go talking ahead. about go, yeah, uh, talking about the Hoosier tires and how well they're holding up. They're people that are sending personal bests here on lap ten. So you know the tires staying consistent throughout uh, uh, this whole session, which I think really speaks highly of the Hoosier tires and what they've been able to develop with this series. And, and don't look now, our two-car battle up front is yeah. now a four-car battle. I We've know. got a couple of spinners there uh, in turn 14, but they look like they're in a position where they could probably continue. Uh, yeah, and Drago, Jim Drago has a mechanical issue. Yep. He's off. Looks like Nick Bruni, his teammate, also went off, and we've got another car over at turn 14. And uh, so, I mean, that's certainly going to complicate things now uh, with two laps remaining. And, and McTood is... I was going to say, if you're in that top four pack and you want to win this race, you might want to get there right now because if they have to go full course yellow to get that car at the exit of turn 14, you want to be in the lead right now. It's time to go. All right, Jim Drago brings his car down the pit lane. His race is now done. He is not going to take home the June Sprints win here today. As uh, it is now, and Johan, we talked about this, what you didn't want to have happen. It is now four cars lock nose to tail as they make their way down towards turn five, battling for the win. Stain, Brown, McTutis, Stain's teammate, and Matthew Novak. Right. And all and lock nose to tail. Just to let you know, that car is cleared from turn 14, so we're going to go and stay green for hopefully the rest of this race. Yeah. And McTutis just said, you know, fastest lap of the race. I mean, he pulled right up there. It looked like they, those two cars had a pretty decent lead, and now they're back there. So he's really setting in as the, there's uh, really some hard driving down in turn five. All right, looks like uh, the car that uh, was over 14 might be the 110 car. Uh, and I'll, I'll get the number on that. If it was the 110 or 118 machine. Spencer Lofton uh, now on the pit lane. should also mention, as you said, that uh, McTutis just set the fastest lap of 241.572. That is underneath the track record uh, that Stain set yesterday um, here with this newly repaved track. One of the few track records we've actually seen here set under racing conditions. Oh, and uh, just got, it is the 118 car that was over in 14. Uh, Julie Dahmer out of Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Sorry about that. All right, there is your four leaders coming through the kink now for the second to last time. Uh, once they come up over the, uh, oh, there's a smoker right there. We'll hope that car can stay with it. It might be tire smoke. Uh, they may have gotten in with somebody there. Uh, as they come across the line this time, there'll be one to go. It'll be four miles to June Sprint's glory for one of the four drivers up front. Uh, Danny Stain, Tyler Brown, Charles McTutis, and Matthew Novak. Those are four cars just through our screen. And uh, they are getting ready to set us up for what could be a spectacular final lap here at Road America. If I was to speculate right now, I would think that uh, McTutis is going to try to go for second place and position himself right behind Danny Stain. And that's exactly what's happening going up the hill. Uh, Brown tried to make a little bit of a defensive move to the left. And then uh, Charles, uh, Charles McTutis went to the right. He's trying to get by here going into turn one so he can be on Danny Stain's bumper for the final lap. Yeah, and, and Brian, while that was happening, we had Brown and Novak, obviously, on driver's left, locked nose to tail, while as McTutis was still trying to get up to the back of Stain. And that is going to move Tyler Brown now in the 0-7 machine up into the lead as they come down the hill towards turn number three. Stain still has positioning to the inside to driver's right, but he's now going to slot behind our new leader, Tyler Brown, in that uh, 0-7 machine. McTutis and Novak still fighting it out for third. 
Yeah, but it looks like Tyler Brown's kind of like in the no man land position. If, if McTutis and Denny Stain can work together, uh, they can drive right past that first place car there, uh, either going down into Canada Corner or coming up the hill. We'll have to see how it works out here. Uh, but I would not want to be in first place here uh, with those two cars behind me. So not only do they have the processing of knowing when to do the brake and brake release and get back on the throttle, yeah. they are all measuring each other. Uh, who is where? What am I going to do? Who can I trust? Who's going to go with me? That is happening while they're doing everything it, it, else. Exactly. And, and, and you saw there where, you know, with McTutis and Stain moving over driver's right almost in lockstep almost immediately the other two drivers nose to tail they had the benefit of of actually already being locked nose to tail and try to push past uh so uh you know it is uh certainly it is stain's uh stain is probably in the best position right now and he's got mctutis who's gonna uh, as you mentioned try to push him up into he, the lead he's probably gonna certainly help out you know mctutis would like to win obviously sure. but uh, the way that it is right now he's certainly probably going to try to help danny up and then see what he can he do, do on the, on the back on the front straight here and get him at the line as they come out of the kink for the very first uh, very not the very first Wow, I'm, I'm 12 laps behind <laughs> the very last time and make the run down the Canada corner. You yeah, still we'll have help. the smoker that's hanging in there. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. All right, so here we come. This is going to be the finish of this race. Next time we see them, they'll be coming through Bill Mitchell Bend. Who is it going to be? Is it going to be Tyler Brown, Danny Stane, Charles McCoolis, or Matthew Novak? Now we've got the two cars, uh, uh, Stane and McTutis, working side by side to try to get by. This might be good news for Tyler Brown. He had a little help there, too. Here they come up the hill from turn 14. On the inside right now, you've got Tyler Brown and... Uh, and, wow. and uh, oh, boy, I can't even Novak. think who's there anymore. Novak's right there as well. We'll see where they come to the line. Who is it going to be? Is it going to be Stain, Brown, McTutis? It looks like it is going to be... Tyler Brown is going to take the win. Matthew Novak will be second. Danny Stain will be third. A spinner on the front straight. I'm, I think that was the smoking car we were talking about earlier. And it's the 88 car, Brian, that's uh, right off of the wall directly in front of us. And uh, That uh, went around. Yeah. Yeah, he put everything on the line. He was pretty uh, wide in 14 as well. I mean, he <laughs> wanted to see what he could do. Glad to see there was no damage done. Yeah. Well, at least All right, got so talked about, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, well, you know, the, the sneaky Moose Motorsports machine there uh, almost snuck right past us here in the grass. All right, let's take a look here. Uh, again, Tyler Brown taking the win today. Uh, he is going to win the Advanced Auto Sports Challenge. Congratulations, Tyler. He takes home $200 cash, a, a, t a certificate from Hoosier Racing Tires for two tires, the Chicago Region SECA June Sprints checkered flag, as well as a June Sprints hat. Finishing second uh, is going to be... Matthew Novak. Novak will take home $100 in cash, uh, a certificate for a one Hoosier racing tire, as well as a June Sprints hat. And then we have finishing third. It is Danny Stain, uh, who will take home $50 in cash, a Brakometer certificate for $100 uh, in product, as well as a June Sprints hat. And then we've got a single Hoosier tire going to fourth through eighth places. That is Charles McTutis, Michael Carter, Alan Stanfield, Todd Burris, and Cam Ebbin. And uh, I'm I'm going to leave it to somebody else to decide who the hard charger was. The hard charger <laughs> is going to take home a $500 product voucher from Advanced Auto Sports. Congratulations uh, to them. But, uh, Johan, what a great race. What a fantastic race. They always put on. And it's nice to see sometimes, unfortunately, on some of these races, there's been, you know, two laps and then there was full course yellow. But this is what we want to see. I mean, great respect for racing. I'm sure they're going to give each other high fives when they come in to the uh, impound and, and that's what you want to do. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Very yeah. clean. We, we heard about that one, one bit of contact about mid race, but otherwise very clean racing and with just such close quarters. Uh, just, uh, it still stuns me how they can drive for so many laps 
and be able to hit their marks when they're essentially looking through the windshields of two cars ahead of right. them. I mean, it's really, it's really uh, some of the most spectacular racing we see in Spec Miano. We shouldn't discount it. I mean, it's one of those classes, if you come and you have co-workers that don't know a lot about racing and you say, <laughs> I finished 10th this weekend, or 10th, I thought you were like one of the fastest ones. <laughs> I mean, 10th in this class is, is a big accomplishment. Absolutely. Yeah, it, so it's a, it really, it's, uh, yeah, so people that uh, want to learn how to race and get involved in racing, uh, Spec Miata is the place to start, and uh, and you can see how what kind of racecraft you can develop yourself into. Yeah, absolutely. Paul, Paul, Paul Miranda in the chat, maximum style points for the 88 car spinning across the finish line. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and how about Tyler Brown? After seeing the Super Tour regulars come up here yesterday and, uh, and take the first and second place on the podium, says, get out of my home track, folks. From Muskego, Wisconsin, the hometown boy comes and wins his uh, his uh, June Sprints Trophy, and I just love those types of stories uh, for us here. All right, 88, 88 yeah. cars. Just ma he made it over the start and finish. Yeah, exactly. If he, if he had spun a little bit before, everybody, the whole field would have gone. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. So, would have had trouble. Yeah. And, and style points were going across backwards. I mean, but, that's yeah, the best yeah. way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Brian. Real quick, let me make a call to the uh, final call to the grid for our next group. Attention in the paddock, final call to the grid for race group number four. That's E Production, F Production, H Production, GT Light, and B Spec. Please head to the grid. Your race is next. Race group four, head to the grid. Your race is next. And so, uh, Brian, I'm sure we want to thank Johan Schwartz yes. for joining us up here today. And, Johan, you are scheduled to race uh, this afternoon. I think 4.15, uh, probably not 4.15, uh, um, yeah, 4.15 p.m. You're going to be racing in STU. Yeah. It's scheduled to start on the pole today. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, you know, PM uh, W Motorsports that is uh, all the way from Massachusetts. Great crew uh, that is there. They've got Dan and Kent that are working on the car. And uh, we ran really fast in qualifying. So we got hopes that it's not going to rain. So maybe we can... Uh, we can bring a record home as well. Well, that would be wonderful. So uh, good luck to you, Johan, and uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. All thank right, you everybody. We are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, going to have our production uh, GT Light and B-Spec racers going for the glory here at the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago June Sprints, Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints, pardon me, and we'll be back in just a few moments.
back, everybody, to the National Park Speed Road America at the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. I'm Greg Ginsburg along with Brian Bolanski. And next up, after that amazing Spec Miata race, we've got the Carl Haas Challenge for our production and B Spec cars. And let me not forget GT Light. First place winner is going to take home $200 cash and a certificate for two Hoosier Racing tires, as well as their Chicago Region June Sprints checkered flag and hat. Second place, $100 cash, a certificate for a single uh, Hoosier Racing tire, as well as a Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints hat. And our third place finisher, $50 cash, a Breco Meter $100 product certificate, as well as a June Sprints hat. Uh, we are once again going to have a split start with our production and GT light machines in the first group behind the first pace car and our V-Spec drivers uh, following behind behind the second car. Let's go and I'm going to give you the top 16 in a 39 car uh, production field starting 16th. He is uh, driving his H production Mazda 2 Topeka, Kansas. Jesse Prater, that's the number 34 machine. James Samaras driving the number 95 F production Mazda Miata. Didn't finish yesterday's race. He, uh, hopefully we'll see him out on grid today. David Brown's going to start 14th driving the number 11 F production MG Midget. Then we've got Joe Rainey, driver of the number 171 E production Mazda Global MX5 Cup car. He starts 13th, starting 12th, driving the number 20 H production Volkswagen GTI. He's your reigning national champion in class, Chris Schaffsma. Steve Sargis, driver of the number 18 H production Triumph Spitfire. He's your H production pole sitter. He starts 11th, starting 10th. Your GT Light pole sitter, driving the number 2 Honda CRX out of Summit Point, West Virginia, Graham Fuller. Starting ninth, driving the number 13 F production Honda CRX. It's Ed Hosney with David Strickmodder. Starting eighth, driving the number 28 F production Acura Integra. Lance Lofman will start seventh, driving the number 22 E production Datsun 240Z with Ken Kennard. Definitely looking for some redemption today. He is starting sixth in the field, driving the number 51. Acura Integra, that's an F-Production car. Doug Weaver will start fifth. He's in the number three F-Production Mazda Miata with yesterday's winner in F-Production starting in fourth position, driving the number 52 Mazda Miata. It's Mason Workman. Aaron Johnson in his, the 08 Honda S2000 scheduled to start third today with our front row then Tim Schreier, driver of the number 38 E-Production BMW 325iS and yesterday's winner, overall winner and winner in E-Production, driving the number 89 BMW Z3 from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, John Brackey. Now let's move over to B-Spec, where we have 22 cars that have set qualifying times. Let's run down the top 16. Starting 16th, driving the number 03. Uh, Chevy, uh, pardon me, Chevy Sonic from Janesville, Wisconsin. It's Jonathan Wicker starting 15th, driving the number one. For, uh, is that correct? The number one. I'm showing Ford Fiesta. Uh, Chris Doherty starting 14th, driving the number 63 Mazda 2. We've got Bill Collins out of Invergrove Heights, Minnesota. Mark Goodman starting 13th, driving the number five Mini Cooper. He's out of Nashville, Tennessee, starting 12th, driving the number 107. Mini Cooper, it's George Badger with Peter Zeckert of GT Light fame, starting 11th, driving the number 85, Honda Fit. Then we've got Paul Steffen, driving the number 193, Honda Fit. He starts 10th, starting 9th. It's going to be Joseph Gersh, driving a Toyota, get this everybody, Yaris. Uh, <laughs> that is the number 19 machine. Starting 8th, driving the number 134, Mazda 2 from Elroy, Texas. It's Chris Taylor. Stephanie Anderson is going to start 7th, driving the number 138, Mazda 2 from Racine, Wisconsin. Starting for, uh, starting six, driving the number 111 Ford Fiesta from Willis, Texas. It's Gail Corley. Car Kent Carter is going to start fifth. He's driving the number 92 Mazda 2 from Houston, Texas. Joe McLugan is going to start fourth, driving the number 36 Mazda 2 from Marion, Texas. And your front row in v spec driving the number 40 Chevrolet Sonic from Greensboro, North Carolina. It's Stuart Black. And your pole sitter today driving the number 43 Toyota Yaris. Four-door <laughs> sedan from Sealy, Texas. It's your 2019 national champion, John Phillips. Uh, for those of you who might not have followed around yesterday, uh, uh, Greg had a very uh, creative pronunciation for Yaris. Yeah, and, Yaris. Uh, we, we were trolled significantly. We were trolled significantly in the chat. 
Uh, so uh, we're going to get Yaris right today. I might not get any of the other names of the drivers right, but we're going to say Yaris right all right. For the rest of this race. Yeah, you'd, uh, think I, you'd think I was Dorsey Schrader or something, you know? Uh, <laughs> 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 all right, here comes our first pack here uh, up the hill from Canada Corner. Bill Mitchell Bend is there. There is our beautiful Elkhart Lake Blue Corvette, our pace car. Uh, now, hopefully these cars will uh, pack up here a little bit better than they are right now. they got a long ways to go to the green flag, though. So uh, still time to get everybody uh, all lined up nicely. And, um, yeah, there we go. Here they come. And uh, now they're going to start lining up. I think, Greg, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, there is an uh, up production Miata uh, near the back of the pack here, which I believe is Eric Krill's old race car. That, that um, is, that is new correct. Driver. So... All right, here they come up the hill, getting lined up pretty nice. Still a little str strung out a little bit, but they're at least lined up two by two. And uh, they're going to come up over the hill. We'll get the, a look at our starter to see if he likes what he sees. And here comes our green flag. We're getting going here. Here comes our driver's little, uh, little passing action now, a little deeper into the pack here as they head down to turn one for the first time. This is all of our production cars and GT lights. Here they come for the first time here. And Liz, as Schreier tries to take a look to the inside of John Bracky, not able to get past. And uh, we had then the uh, the Datsun 240Z uh, also take a look to the inside. Great moves there by Lance Lofman in that yellow 240Z. Makes up a number of positions uh, to move into fourth place overall. But then it looks like he's going to slot back behind. He loses a position again to uh, Mason Workman in that number 52 Mazda Miata, uh, who was our winner yesterday in F production. And then uh, here they come and stringing out kind of nicely here as they exit turn three, headed down towards turn five. And here is the start of our B spec race as the uh, Toyota Yaris takes the early lead here as they cross the start finish line and head down to turn one for the first time here. We'll see if that Yaris is able to keep the uh, lead up front for all of turn one. And, and actually, Brian, because I uh, I uh, made a small mistake in running oh. down the grid as we've got a driver off over at turn Couple number five. Drivers. Yeah, in, in production. It's actually our pole sitter in B-Spec is Rob Archick uh, out of Brunswick, Ohio, driving the Honda Fit. That was that oh. white and silver machine we saw coming down uh, the inside into turn one, and he is your leader. Um, he has gotten around. That's why I get for not going to the second page. He's gotten around John Phillips, who is starting second in B-Spec. There we go. Here they come down out of three cleanly, heading down towards turn five. There were three cars off uh, in turn five from the earlier pack. It looks like all of them have uh, been able to continue and move along, so that's nice. So the Beast spec cars will have a clean shot at this thing. And it uh, looks like that one or two poking out there to see if they can try to make the move here. Uh, this is another one of those drafting classes. Draft is real important here uh, to be able to make speed and keep the momentum going. So uh, uh, they all uh, negotiated turn five very nicely as they head up the hill towards turn six. All right, and so Brian got word that that was the 48 machine, uh, the uh, the F production Mazda Miata of Michael Sturm that we saw go around over turn five on the opening lap. Uh, started off uh, in 22nd position in that uh, in that production car field. We'll see where he, uh, he is after lap number one. But yeah, you mentioned it in in uh, B spec. Very tall cars, very narrow, uh, but and punch a real big hole in the air because of how tall they are. And we can see there go. Three wide going into the carousel, Brian, as they come underneath the Speedville Bridge. Uh, we'll, uh, hopefully, we'll see three cars come out. <laughs> Hard to tell if they did all come out there. Uh, but uh, it, it did look like there was like some flying pea gravel there. So I'm not sure if uh, there was one car in the sand trap there at the entrance to the, uh, uh, to the carousel. Uh, but here they come through the kink very nicely. Uh, going out there, if they uh, touch that curb, that's the fast way through that corner. And if you notice there, folks, if you've been to Road America before, right on the outside of the kink there, there's now spectator viewing. Uh, that's somewhat new over the last few years. That would be a great place to watch those cars. All right, Brian, uh, another development here. We saw him pull off early yesterday after only a lap or two. Greg Gopper, driver of the number 15, eighth production Honda Civic. He is on the pit lane. Also, our H production uh, pole sitter today, Steve Sargis, did not make the grid. Also seeing now on the pit lane, uh, the number 77 GT Light uh, uh, Mazda 3, driven by Eric Vickerman. He is, for the second day, 
pulled in early, currently on the pit lane. And here are your first group of, uh, oh, there's a, looks like a, possibly a Mini Cooper there. Oh, no, that's a Volkswagen Golf that went off there at the exit of turn, uh, uh, turn six and, and was able to get back together and, get, and continue on. That car right there going through our lane, able to collect and keep moving. And for the second day in a row, Brian, we're seeing uh, seeing where John Brackey has opened up a pretty good advantage over Tim Schreier. Now, in, during yesterday's 25-minute sprint race, it took a while for him to do. It took about four laps uh, before he was able to separate himself out uh, from the 325 driver. Uh, but already here on just the opening lap, uh, he has opened up uh, about, a, well, I'd say probably about a good six, maybe seven car length advantage uh, over the uh, the second place runner. Uh, the gap now sitting at about 1.3 seconds. Now, I mentioned yesterday, or I mentioned during, as we were running down the grid, uh, about uh, about uh, uh, the Acura Integra driver, Ken, uh, Ken Kennard, driving uh, the number, actually not, I'm sorry, not Ken Kennard, uh, one of our uh, Acura Integra drivers uh, yesterday, uh, and yeah, I believe it was actually Ken Kennard uh, who had uh, uh, been leading the race yesterday, going into the very last laps in F production, and he ended up in the gravel trap over at turn number seven. I have to see. I don't see that uh, that number fifty one uh, machine out on track. At least not the Acura Integra, but I'm showing him as circulating. We'll have to see if he switched over to a different car. Yeah, definitely. Also, Steve Sarge is not making the race this morning either. So I uh, want to just give a shout-out to Yuri Colazos, pulling for Mason Workman on F Production and Aaron Johnson in E Production. A little bit of fan base there. LP is rooting for the 76 car. Uh, the 76 car is, um, as I scroll through here, where is it? Kevin Stuckey in B-Spec, a Chevy Sonic. So, got some fans in the chat. And here's that B-Spec race now, Brian, coming up through uh, through Bill Mitchell Bend and our 2019 national champion uh, now has gotten around our pole sitter. So, we'll put John Phillips up into the lead as they come out of turn number 14. And, uh, you know, that four-door four Yaris was thought uh, a couple years ago to really be uh, a, a, a dark horse in B-Spec uh, and perhaps a little bit more aerodynamic than the rest of the field. And because of the sloped rear window, might not put as big a hole in the air, might be a little bit more difficult to draft off of. And uh, as they came across the line, he opened up about three car lengths on Pekarczyk. But Pekarczyk now is able to draft back up and takes a quick look to the inside uh, with our third place runner in the class. Uh, very close behind. That's Joe McClugan in the Mazda 2. Yep, and when they changed the name to the Yaris, it got faster. So yes. uh, that was very helpful uh, for that car uh, to get better in, in B-Spec here. So, uh, and, and keeping a look at uh, a lot of the cars here um, deeper into the field, David Daughtery is in, thir in, uh, in 13th spot in the Honda Fit. He is always one of the faster cars. So uh, we'll see if he can make his way up through the field. Also in 14th in B-Spec is Jonathan Wicker. Uh, if you've listened to a lot of our Super Tour coverage, he joined us for one of our race weekends at the booth here with us. And uh, he may come back and join us again later today for one of our races. So, uh, fr friend of the, of, of the live stream here, we want to keep uh, uh, an eye on him and see how he can work his way up. He had a lot, a lot of car problems this weekend, so um, hopefully he's got a bit sorted out now. All right, and, uh, you know, Brian, we were just uh, watching uh, as our leaders of B-Spec came down into turn one, and Joe McLugan uh, had to move down to the inside to try to make a move on Rob McCarchick, and it didn't work out very well for him uh, as uh, he just wasn't able to carry a lot of speed out of turn number five. You can see now our top two drivers have started to open up a bit of an advantage, and Stuart Black in that red with white stripe uh, uh, Chevy Sonic uh, starting to close things down just a little bit on Klugman with uh, Stephanie Anderson, Gail Corley, and Chris Taylor there in very close proximity as well. Of course, uh, uh, Stephanie Anderson in the pink and white 
Mazda 2. We, uh, I think we featured her during the runoff this past year. Uh, the the X-Factor Racing folks actually built her B-Spec yes. car from a bare shell. They, it was caged already, but basically built up her car during the test week at, uh, at Virginia International Raceway right. and the runoff. And it showed to be a pretty quick machine. She did very well, and uh, I was very quick in practice, and uh, and uh, qualified again very well in B spec here this weekend. Our first place car in H production is a name we should all be familiar with, but not for H production. Uh, that is uh, that is multiple national champion Jesse Prather uh, in a Mazda two, and uh, this is uh, this is a new class for him. It's actually a class he hasn't won a national championship in, Greg. That, that is correct. And it was a great battle yesterday between he and our reigning national champion, Chris Schaffsma, that uh, I'd say probably for a good two-thirds of the race, uh, they were uh, they were no more than about a half a car length apart uh, and having to not only work their way through slower traffic, you know, being in age production, they had some faster traffic trying to work their way through them uh, as well. And uh, it wasn't until about two laps to go uh, where Shaftsma lost the said Jesse Prather taking the win uh, there here yesterday in H production and uh, he's already jumped out to a pretty substantial lead about five seconds over Shaftsma. <laughs> you know and if you're an H production driver if you're the top level of H production and all of a sudden you see Jesse Prather show up in H production you just say really couldn't you have just stayed in E production or F production and left us alone um, you know, or do you say, oh, bring it on. We want we want to race against the best that's out there because he is clearly one of the best production racers in the history of the SECA. So uh, two ways to look at that, I'm sure. You know, and, and interestingly enough, Brian, so uh, uh, at Hallett Motor Racing Circuit uh, earlier on in the Super Tour, Jesse also showed up, yep. and, he showed, and he showed up with multi-time national champion and F-Prod, Eric Prill, and they were both running spec racer fours. Yes. <laughs> and I think it might have put a little bit of a chill through some of the spec racer four <laughs> drivers. But but that, you know, that wasn't the ultimate goal for Jesse and for Eric. Uh, Eric taking the year off from racing, and, and Jesse obviously had the plans here uh, to run the uh, the Mazda 2 that he's currently running in each production. Yeah, he hinted on that uh, when we talked to him. Jesse was our guest on our Super Tour preview for Hallett, that he had something new coming. I couldn't get him to spill the beans, but now I think we've figured out what that new thing is. So. All right, this is the battle for the lead coming underneath the Speedville Bridge in V-Spec. And uh, uh, Pekarczyk has caught back up uh, to the rear of John Phillips. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that uh, race car that Pekarczyk is running has a, a bit of a history. That was uh, uh, the Pirelli World Challenge TCB championship winning car, I believe, in 2014 or 2015, uh, driven by a friend of mine, Brian Price. And uh, used to be painted uh, red, white, and blue. And uh, it, got a, it got a new livery. Uh, when uh, many of these cars, when they came to the runoffs at Indianapolis Motor Speedway uh, back in 2021, the B-Spec drivers, many of them, uh, had put special liveries on the car, basically as uh, throwback NASCAR uh, entries. And you'll see uh, Pekarczyk's car. Uh, you'll see uh, Chris, Taylor motor, uh, Chris Taylor's car also with a, 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 a livery, a bit of a throwback, and uh, many of them that way. If, if anybody's wondering why you'd want to race in what might be the slowest class in the Sports Car Club of America, if you watch this pack of racers as they come through turn 14 and up the hill, there's their leaders in B-Spec. But look at this pack right here coming through right now. If you're wondering what the allure is of racing one of the slowest cars out here, this is the allure. It's, you know, 20, 20 cars all packed up, having an absolute hoot of a time. And that's why they do it. Yeah, and you know, Brian, if, if you're all running the same speeds and now coming across the line, there you go, as they fan out Isn't that uh, <laughs> there, it, it is a hoot to drive. And, you know, in the, it, it, it really is a driver's class because you have to find a way to carry as much momentum through these corners as possible. And you have to find a way to mitigate the loss of speed when some of your faster class cars start to come through because we're starting to see now John Bracke in uh, the BMW Z3, the 89 car, and right in the middle of this pack coming down into turn three is the BMW of uh, Schreier. He is trying to find his way through as well. Yeah, and uh, uh, our associate producers in the chat, Jim Kurt says that Jesse Prather brought that F Mazda M2 from Mark Bracke. So, um, looks like that's going to be his new attempt here uh, to get another national champion and yet another class here. So, 
We're coming up on eight laps to go here, Greg. I think this would be a good time to take our break. Oh, wait, we got a car that just decided to drive off there at the end of uh, turn five. Uh, thank you. That car was slowed down enough. That it and and that is, and Brian, this is a big development, although he was quite a bit back from uh, Jesse Prather. That was the 20 car, the 2 0 car of Chris Shaftsma running oh, wow. second in H production, our reigning national champion. Well, there we go. I will keep tabs on that and see what happens there. Let's take our break and uh, we'll come back and uh, we'll get you. Uh, Hopefully, green flag action all the way to the finish. We'll be right back. For over 25 years, championship winning drivers and teams have demanded Hawk Performance Motorsports brake pads. Now you can have their advanced technology on your daily car, truck, or SUV with Hawk Performance Street products. With the improved HP Plus pad for that hybrid street and track feel, or Super Duty pads for tow vehicles, their all-new ER1 brake pad designed to take on even the longest race, and their all-new high-performance brake fluid, Hawk has all of your braking needs covered. Visit hawkperformance.com and like them on Facebook or Instagram to learn more about the Hawk Performance Advantage. Hawk Performance, what's stopping you? Tire Rack was established over 40 years ago by an SECA member with a passion to find the right tires, wheels, brakes, and suspension products for racers and enthusiasts both on the street and on the track. As official tire retailer of Sports Car Club of America since 1995 and sponsor of the Runoffs Pole Award, along with the National Solo Program, Time Trials Nationals and National Tour, and Track Night in America, Tire Rack is proud to support the SECA and its members as they go have fun with cars. For more than 100 years, Sunoco, SCCA's official fuel partner since 2001, has been fueling victories both on and off the track, which is why Sunoco is trusted to fuel over 50 series of racing, driving, and winning, including the SCCA National Championship runoffs, SCCA Pro Racing, Trans Am, and HRA, and NASCAR. To find race gas near you, visit SunocoRaceFuels.com or call Sunoco at 800-RACE-GAS. Shop anytime, anywhere with the Summit Racing app. Mazza Vineyards is the exclusive sparkling wine for podium celebrations at the Hoosier Racing Tire SECA Super Tour, SECA Runoffs, and Tire Rack SECA Pro Solo. Celebrate your race weekend with Mazza Vineyards and learn more at enjoymazza.com. If you like what you see today, become part of the action by joining Sports Car Club of America. Whether you want to drive, flag, or just have fun with cars, SCCA membership opens the door to all kinds of motorsports to feed your obsession, along with 65,000 like-minded members ready to be friends. Ask someone trackside how to get involved or visit scca.com for more information. So welcome back, everybody, to the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. I'm Greg Ginsburg along with Brian Belansky. We're in the middle of our production and B-Spec race. And Brian, we have a bit of a cor uh, correction. I had uh, every single person in the North Carolina region of the SCCA who apparently has better eyes than me uh, tell me that no, it was not Chris Jasma that went off track. It was yesterday's B-Spec winner. Uh, that is... Uh, uh, that is George uh, George Black, I believe. It's probably not George Black. Stuart Black, driver of the number 40 Chevy Sonic. So it wasn't the 30 car. It was the 40 car. And I should have noticed a big red machine or a little red machine going off of turn five. And uh, so our, our winner from yesterday looks like uh, he's now done. Well, there you go. Seven laps to go here. John Bracke is still your leader. He's got an 11-second lead over second-place car Tim Schreier. Uh, the people in chat root for Mason Workman must be happy. He's in first place right now in F production, uh, but not uh, without pressure. Right behind him is Doug Weaver in second place. Uh, both those drivers in Mazda Miata. Shooting down to H production, Jesse Prather is your race leader at the moment. Chris Shafsma is uh, in second place, about uh, nine seconds back from Prather. Uh, GT Lights, your race leader right now, is Graham Fuller. In, uh, in first place, and then uh, in second place in GT Lights is uh, Jonathan Stalzer. And of course, looking down at B-Spec, John Phillips, your race leader at the moment. Uh, Rob Karchik is in uh, nine, uh, the 99 car in second place. I hope I'm getting that name right. You know, being a, 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 a Molanski, I should be able to say Karchik. Yes, you uh, think, right? And uh, I think I got it right today. I got hey, but at least you that. can say Yaris. So right. uh, you can say Yaris. Yes. Uh, and Joe McClugan is in third. Phillips in the Yaris. Uh, a, a Yaris, a Fit, and a Mazda. Uh, one, two, and three. And then in fifth place, we've got a Ford Fiesta. 
uh, uh, of Gail Corley there. Uh, he is in fifth place. We had a change, though. Uh, David Doherty, as I was saying earlier, has moved himself into, uh, into fifth place now. He was down in tenth. And Chris Doherty, right behind him in sixth place in the Ford Fiesta, father-son right there. Um, and uh, so they're moving their way up. Ken Carter, uh, who was on our uh, Super Turf broadcast from um, Hallett, from Hallett uh, for a couple of races, he's now moved up into seventh place. And, um, yeah, that's what we got going on right now. All right, Brian, real quick, i got a quick announcement to make here for people at the track. Attention in the paddock, attention in the paddock, Justin Clark, driver of the number 110 Spec Miata, please see the race director in impound. Again, from race group number three, Justin Clark, driver of the Spec Miata number 110, please see the race director in impound. All right, Brian, that, that, was, my, that was my call. <laughs> Beautiful. Well done. Thank you. Well done. You, you act like you've done this before. Not really, no. <laughs> uh, it, we have a whole afternoon of racing, by the way. After this race, we're going to take a break for lunch. Uh, that'll probably be about an hour. And uh, then we're going to pick stuff back up here uh, at about 1245 Central Time. And... Um, and uh, that's going to be our Spec Racer Ford group. 80 cars or so started yesterday. Uh, we hope to get almost all of them back today. Uh, and then we've got five races this afternoon. So um, lots of stuff. And we may have Mother Nature involved with our racing this afternoon. Well, well. well funny you should mention that, Brian, because uh, Mother Nature has uh, decided to come to Road America. And uh, already getting a little bit of drizzle here on the front straight. Okay. Yeah, yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah. I think we could see it on the camera uh, coming down here into turn number eight as well, uh, starting to come down slightly uh, here. Yeah, you can see the little yeah. little specks starting to show up there on camera. Yeah, I'm going to not make any um, um, ideas as to how heavy the rain's falling by looking yeah. at our cameras, because I did that once uh, where it <laughs> yes. felt like it was slowing, and I got the whole all of the corner workers left, or, or getting on my case because it was not anywhere near slowing. Yeah, it was so. it was a torrential downpour at the <laughs> time, exactly. So, uh, that's pretty funny. Well, you know, um, as big as this track is, it's kind of like Spa. You can have rain at one end and not at the other. That is uh, that. Road America is definitely big enough for that. And uh, you can see the rain starting there uh, in our camera, pointing down towards corner 14 as well, towards the last corner. So uh, we'll see here. I mean, at the moment, uh, it is just, it's just—it's just kind of spitting. It shouldn't really be uh, in any kind of uh, position to affect our drivers. None of the drivers have windshield wipers running at the moment. Right. Uh, and uh, but, you know, but the the thing we have to see here, Brian, as we uh, watch, and it looks a little heavier down at turn one, yeah. is how this track plays out. Um, you know, we, we had rubber put down by IndyCar last weekend. We've had rubber put down the last couple of days. Uh, there was a little bit of rain last night, not much. Um, and it certainly uh, certainly hasn't affected uh, many people. We, you know, we saw track record set again in Spec Miata. You know, but, uh, you know, these drivers, they're certainly not going to have any idea of whether there is a rain line or whether there's actually a need for a rain line right. on a track that is so green. Well, and... and um I completely lost my Oh, yes. Uh, in this particular race, in this particular instance, you've got a, a, a track with a lot of heat in it and a race tires with a lot of heat in it. So with only five laps to go, unless it really starts coming down hard, uh, these, these drivers here should be able to negotiate this pretty well. What will be the interesting thing is if we do get a lot of rain here between now and, and when we start up our next race, uh, cold, cold tires on a track that will have cooled some, uh, that may be very, very interesting. Yeah, and uh, in the chat right now, uh, Brian Staszynski, who sat in with us uh, for our Formula V, Formula 600, and Formula F race yesterday, says there isn't rain at Turn 8. And, uh, well, he's on the scene. He probably knows. It, maybe I'm just seeing sunspots. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, that certainly looks like rain to me. Um, maybe he's sitting in a different part of Turn 8 or um, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, well, it's just turn nine, so maybe between right. turn eight and turn nine, there's no rain. Um, <laughs> oh, never mind, just started. <laughs> uh, there you go. He's Thank you, Brian. He's spoken too soon. 
<laughs> yes. All right, so uh, let's go and uh, reset the field here. Uh, John Bracky, our overall leader, whether it's raining or whether it's dry, he just sat the fast slap of the race, a 229.90, wow. and he's extended his advantage over Tim Schreier to almost 17 seconds uh, with Aaron Johnson and his Honda S2000 running in third. Uh, in age production, Jesse Prather now with a almost a seven-second advantage over Chris Chasma with William Trainer in third. But this is a battle we need to watch. We need to watch now. Coming down through turn one, heading down the hill towards turn number three, Mason Workman and Doug Weaver, two Mazda Miatas. This is the battle for the lead in F production as they're now coming down through turn number three and on to uh, the Moraine sweep uh, here. And... Uh, this is a battle that has been tightening up over yeah. the last number of races, or not the last number of laps that last time by Doug Weaver, a full second faster than our current leader in the class, uh, Mason and, Workman. And I got to tell you, we're getting enough reports now that it looks like most of the track is being ra rained on at the moment. And I, there's actually enough rain, Greg, coming out of turn three there. I was seeing spray uh, coming off from underneath, uh, underneath this car right here. This is uh, Eric Hill's old car. Um, there was spray coming off the, the rear wheels of that, the rear tires of that car. So in some areas, it's coming down pretty significantly at this point. All right, so now you're going to see who is your racecraft king and queens and who, is, uh, who has not really done a lot of rain racing uh, because this is going to be a rapidly changing or track conditions here now. Uh, as the as the rain comes down harder here, um, four laps ago doesn't sound like too much until you realize that that's still 16 miles of racing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's here a, at Road it's a lot of America. racing with no tread on your tires. Uh, the, yep. the, the B the B spec racers have two tiny little sipes that run uh, the entire circumference of the car of the tire dead center of the tire. But the majority of our production car racers likely with no sipes and checkered flag is being shown early, Brian. We are going to end this race early and taking the win, and I did not hear a reason why that was coming out, uh, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can get some information on that. But Checkered Flag is out. Taking the win here today is John Brackey in his BMW Z3. We're starting to see more cars, as you right. can see here, go so. off on this, uh, this damp track. I just got a message from Race Control. Checkered early for rain. Well, there, there you go. We had Gail Corley come up the pit lane a little bit early. I think uh, he was one of the first racers to uh, to throw in the uh, the white flag uh, or or wave the white flag. Greg Gopper uh, back on the pit lane as well. We can see a car now, uh, one of our V-Spec cars, off track there. Drivers right going towards the Speedville Bridge. So let's run down as uh, now taking the win in F production. Uh, is going to be the 52 machine of Mason Workman was running third overall uh, with Doug Weaver just crossing the line a couple seconds behind. So uh, in e-production, taking the win is John Bracky. Tim Schreier will finish in second. Aaron Johnson in his Honda S2000. Well, we're gonna we're gonna have to wait here, Brian, to see who crosses the line uh, and and gets to the finish. So actually, I tell you what, I'm going to hold off a few moments here before I start running down the full order because it, uh, it looks as though, for example, uh, in GT Lite, our leader in GT Lite, Graham Fuller, was just going into the carousel. And and this is where I, I wish that I had the... Uh, no, no uh, to uh, producer Brendan, I wish I had some of the timing scoring ahead for I racing when I could see it telling me immediately when somebody crossed the checkered flag uh, and uh, and uh, and ended their race. All right, so uh, we do have and we know in H production to see Prather has crossed the finish line. He takes the win in H production. Chris Jasma will finish second. Uh, only three seconds in arrears. He made up a lot of ground on the last lap. William Trainer in his Volkswagen Scirocco, the number 17 machine, uh, waiting for that car to come across the line. But here's the big surprise in B-Spec. John Phillips comes across the and takes the win with Joe McClugan finishing in second. David Doherty comes home in third, multi-time champion, almost nine seconds in arrears. Then Chris Taylor. Bill Collins fifth, Rob Pekarczyk, who was our pole sitter in B-Spec, 
Oh, and we've got cars that are going off now and going around, going down into turn one. And again, these are some of our production cars that really have no way to evacuate the water uh, that they are going over and uh, very easy for them to, uh, to start hydroplaning. As uh, Rob Pekarczyk, our pole sitter in B-Spec, finishes in sixth position with Stephanie Anderson seventh, Peter Seckert eighth, Chris Doherty in the number one Ford Fiesta will finish ninth, and Joseph Gersh in the Yaris will finish in tenth. And uh, that is one of our Mazda RX-7s uh, that we saw go off there, and uh, I believe, and I'd have to get the number, that's either Rich or Ron Olson. Uh, either the 66 or the 81 machine uh, that we just saw go off there uh, the, the, in e-production. The only thing I can think of here as far as stopping the race early because of rain here, um, which is not typical of what we do in the SCCA, I'll be honest with you, um, is with this new track surface, there, there is probably some, some knowledge that uh, this this race track is it, it extraordinarily s slick with its new surface here, right? Um, and with these cars on slick tires, um, that that may have been the deciding factor here. Um, you know, I, I I never like to be the guy that second guesses what happens in race control. So, um, but uh, it is not normal for us to stop a race early because it has started to rain. Um, um, but uh, you know, looking at what's happening here. Uh, it, maybe there was some knowledge going into this that you know hasn't been shared with you and I, which is not uncommon, um, and uh, that that would make some sense to me. But usually, what happens in these situations is, uh, you know, drivers have to decide whether to stay out there on the tires or on, or come in and change tires for um, for uh, you know for rain tires if they're prepared to do that. Um, and uh, sometimes the crews are ready for that, and sometimes they're not. And that's all part of the strategy and the racecraft here that we do. So, um, but yes, it is definitely a, uh, a, a rained out racetrack at the moment. Uh, but I do know that the spec racer boards who come out after lunch, they uh, all have the ability to put on rain tires and uh, we'll get back racing after lunch. All right, but before we do, Brian, let's finish running down the uh, the finishing order here. Taking the win in GT Lite is Graham Fuller in his Honda CRX, Jonathan Stalzer in his Toyota Corolla finishes in second. Eric Vickerman, driver of the GT Lite Mazda MX-3, only completed a single lap. In e-production, John Brackey and Tim Schreier, your uh, first and second place finishers. Aaron Johnson in his Honda S2000 finishing in third. Lance Lofman finishes just off the podium in fourth. Rich Olson fifth. Ron Olson sixth. Anthony Parker seventh. Joe Rainey, Brian Heitman, Joe Rainey, and Jeff Anderson did not take the green flag today. And then in H production, uh, we had Jesse Prather, Chris Schaffsma, uh, and William Trainer taking the podium. Angus Chrome uh, finished, uh, finished fourth with Greg Gopper only completing six laps. As we mentioned, Steve Sargis did not take the green today. And then finally, in F production, Mason Workman, your winner for the second day in a row in the number 52 machine. Doug Weaver finishing second. Ed Hosney finishes third with Ken Kennard fourth. Uh, today in a Mazda Miata, and he started, and I did get word, Kennard did start from the back of the production car field because he switched cars, went to his Mazda Miata that he's been running for years. Uh, apparently some issues with that Integra after yesterday's spin. Uh, Eric Greisinger finishes in fifth. Gerald Lamb, sixth. Michael Fro, David Stripmotter, seventh and eighth. Michael Sturm, ninth. And Michael Hart, tenth in uh, 10th in F production. So uh, that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, rounds out our uh, fourth and final race of the morning, the Carl Haas Challenge. And again, our uh, winners in each class taking home $200 in cash, a certificate from Hoosier for two tires, the Chicago Region June Sprints checkered flag, as well as a June Sprints hat, second place finisher, $100 in cash, a certificate from Hoosier for a single tire, as well as a June Sprints hat and our third place finisher, $50 in cash, a $100 product certificate from Brakometer, and a June Sprints hat. All right, well, that's going to do it here for our last race before lunch. This next race is scheduled to start around 1245 this afternoon Central Time. So uh, uh, we are going to take a break until that, that time comes. Uh, once we come back to racing action, we have, uh, we have six, uh, five races left today. Uh, first up is going to be Spec Racer Ford. Then we've got our Formula B, Formula 6, Formula F race. Uh, then we have our P, uh, FE2 in production, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, prototype race. 
is our, our third race this afternoon. Then Big Four, all of our GT cars and our T1 and A sedan. And our final race of the day, Super Touring Light, Super Touring Under. And that will be uh, the way we finish up our uh, 68th consecutive Chicago Region WeatherTech Chicago Region Jute Sprints. Should be good stuff coming, so don't go away. Uh, but we will take our break. And when we come back uh, after lunch, we'll have a whole bunch more racing to talk about.
previous year, but this year there is one race in particular that has everybody licking their chops. It is the first ever race under the lights in runoffs history. It is time for Friday Night Lights, presented by Mazda, the run to the medals for Spec Miata. Hi, everybody. I am Greg Creamer, joined by Dorsey Schrader. And Dorsey, uh, this is going to be absolutely incredible. 62 cars turned in times for this race. And just to throw a fun little wrinkle at things and get this thing even curiouser and curiouser, we have had now for the last 15, 20 minutes a persistent light drizzle out on this track. Hats off to John Doonan, who uh, oh, absolutely. put this thing together for Mazda. They paid for the Daytona Speedway to turn these lights on. It's not like you're turning your bathroom light on. It's like turning the whole city's bathroom lights and the rest of the house, too. This is going to be the coolest thing. There are fans everywhere. I've been on the Internet. There's fans looking at this deal. I mean, this is a big, big, big event. It's going to be awesome. Racetrack's wet, slippery. It's, this is going to be a memorable race. I don't know for a bad reason or a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be, you can see the shine there up on the banking. This is going to be interesting. There's a third member of our broadcast team. His name is Hayward Wagner. And speaking of Mazda, he is standing by with none other than John Doonan. John, my phone is blowing up. I'm getting text messages, emails. Instant, every, everybody is asking me, what's going to happen? Have you ever seen this kind of excitement for a club race before? I haven't, Hayward, and we couldn't be more pleased to give this opportunity to the fans that have come out, the corner workers, the staff, and certainly our racers. There's a group of 60 Spec Miata drivers over there that are just jumping for joy and the excitement of the opportunity to race at Daytona is one thing, but to race under the lights is, is takes it to another level. Now, obviously, you've been in Mazda, involved with Mazda for a number of years at the pro level. You've been at Daytona when Mazda has won major professional racing events. How does Spec Miata fit into this Mazda racing world for you? Well, the heart of everything we do in motorsport is grassroots racing. So our staff gets to go to about three dozen race weekends a year, but there's none better than this. Uh, when you see these drivers from all over the country come together, uh, we're like a family. It's a Mazda family. And literally tonight we've got uh, executives from corporate. We've got Mazda dealers. We've got people watching all over the world to see the excitement of Spec Miata at night. Well, watching all over the world is certainly the case. We've the live streaming video. Um, What's your prediction? What are we going to see tonight? Well, throughout the week, we saw one thing, and that was drafting. Uh, pods of two cars hooked up. Unfortunately, the rain's going to add a little extra excitement to it. Uh, you know, we don't pick any favorites, but I've certainly seen Danny Stein go to the front in the rain. He did it at the June Sprint, so we'll see what he's got tonight. But, you know, this is for our customers. That's what our program's all about. Uh, the customer experience with Mazda is very important to us. And uh, Driving Matters is our latest campaign, and uh, tonight, driving's going to matter. Well, for myself, for everybody on the broadcast team, for the thousands of people that have stayed tonight, that have decided they're not going to the hotel, Outback can wait. They want to see this. Thank you so much for making this happen. Well, we're pleased to do it, and all we hope for is a good, safe race. All right, back to you guys upstairs. He talked about Corey Collum, who's fourth. He talked about Preston Partis, who's fifth. Jonathan Goring, who's had a tremendous amount of, of success over the years in this category. All of those guys, though, this is their first runoff start. So, uh, but obviously some serious track knowledge here paying off for a few of these drivers. The other thing I wanted to ask Dorsey was, you know, when you're doing pack racing, you know, whether it's two cars or you're just running in a big pack and it's very close quarters, which we always have in this class, you're driving through that guy's windshield or maybe the next two or three windshields. Now you got spray coming up. So visibility even more affected. What does that do when you're pack racing? With spray. That, that is a really big problem, no doubt about it. Anybody but the front row is going to be eating more and more and more of that mist. Um, I'll tell you where it comes in really handy right now, too, at this racetrack anyway, is having spotter, a really good Ooh, spotter. Yeah. You need those guys to be able to tell you because because of that mist like you're talking about, because of all the cars around, your visibility is reduced. You have to be told clear, clear, clear when you start making, cutting and thrusting through this traffic. Just got word from race control, five minutes, five minutes to the roll-off. So uh, everything looks now to be set. Obviously, uh, they just delayed things a little bit to make sure that the teams could, if they wanted to, uh, make any kind of tire selection choice that they wanted to here. Everybody now seems to be set in what they want to do. Uh, the word, as we heard, coming from Hoosier that right now, you really don't have much of an option. You want to be on a sticker, uh, dry tire, and uh, just hope that that rain stays away. And then pray for half the race to <laughs> go your way it is going to be a hard job for these guys to yep. stay clean you know until this track gets to look right there you see the yep. spray coming off that car 
Well, that's plenty wet right there. I mean, he's, he's throwing Seriously. a rooster tail of spray. Yeah. So for the first, say, uh, eight laps, probably half the race, seven, eight laps, it's hold on and then see what you got. It's going to be interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's so counterintuitive for a race driver and, and, and certainly some of the club racers out there to be patient. Don't go crazy. Just get through the first few laps. Let things settle. Then start to go racing. You know, get your good start. Fall in the line with somebody that you can trust and ride until things start to dry out and you get a feel for your car, get a feel what the racetrack's doing, and then, you know, assess your situation, yep. make your move. Opportunity here. There's a look at some of the great workers. Again, this is not just a showcase race for the drivers here at the uh, SCCA National Championship Runoffs presented by Garmin Verb. It's a showcase for every volunteer member of SCCA. It's a club. That's the key word. It is a club. All of the members here, uh, for the most part, are here on their own dime. They are volunteering. This is a passion that they have, and it starts in tech uh, it's in, at registration. It ends in tech and every specialty in between. And, of course, the workers that are out there in the mix are uh, most often those corner marshals that are out there in harm's way providing direct information and assistance to the drivers but to a person, we need to say a big thank you. This is a huge undertaking, and to every volunteer that is a Hundreds part of, of this you. club, oh, yeah, that is a part of this club, a huge thank you. And, again, for being willing to stay a little bit later into the evening here to watch this one. But I don't think anybody's upset about no, having no. to stay and there, watch this There is more boy. of an electric vibe oh, ab yeah. about this, this racetrack this weekend, and this race in particular is pushed to the limits way above. I mean, everybody, I was in the motorhome park, and people, when I came out to come over, they said, what time does it start? What time does it start? You know, I said, another half hour. Yeah. You know, and they're, they're getting ready to go up there by the fences and crowd in, which I think is probably not smart. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Exactly. And the word from race control, one and go, which basically means the grid marshals now have the clock and they can let it go. Conehead. And uh, there you go. Well, that's that's one way to get keep the rain off of the old noggin. Let's check in with Hayward one more time before we go green. Guys, we've seen some amazing racing so far today, some really good fields. This is what a qualifying sheet looks like at the runoffs. For most classes, this would be a pretty full sheet. For Spec Miata, that's page two. This is page one. 61 cars qualifying for this race tonight. The biggest field at the event, the most exciting race of the event, going live right now from Daytona International Speedway. And, and I hear there's one of those credit card swipe machines down there on pit lane for parts. Goes straight to the part <laughs> department of Mazda. So, yeah. you know, when you pull in and get the assessment done, you just swipe, you swipe on. Swipe and get the uh, new bumpers get what on. You need. Absolutely. And just, you know, just to throw a little, uh, a little motivation into it here. There's not another race after this one until uh, the next season yep. starts. So I was going to bring that up. One race for all the marbles for mm -hmm. a national champion. At the fastest racetrack they've ever run on. One yep. of the most prestigious racetracks in the world. In the rain. Uh, can I add anything more? But no pressure. But no pressure. Right. Yeah. Boy, I, I'm so excited about this. This is going to be spectacular. And it's going to take a while just to release this massive field from the pre-grid. Here they come onto the front straight. Lights ablaze. Now, there's been another thing that's been discussed here. Obviously, you've got cars of varying vintages that run here in Spec Miata. Some have the pop-up headlights. Some don't. All of this drafting and this long, long run here, there's been talk about is there a disadvantage that's significant with those pop-up headlights? I mean, that's how close they're playing the other uh, numbers here. Luckily, because there's so many cars, there wouldn't be as much of a disadvantage because right. you always have somebody to draft with. But, uh, you know, if you're the lead car with the pop-up headlights, probably, you know, I, I saw some pretty ingenious things being done like they do at NASCAR, that you, you know, body fit is huge here. Yep. So I've seen guys taking where the hood fits the fenders and, and taping that or, 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 you know, sealing the edges of all that stuff. It makes a big difference. You're talking about the cars are going to run at their ultimate speed. The, the terminal velocity for the car will be achieved here yep. today. Like I said, with the B-Spec car, you could drop it from 35,000 feet out of an airplane and still go just that same speed that's going to run here today. Yeah, it's just going to be sure as fast as it's ever. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And so what you're saying is even air going through a seam in the bodywork can anything. slow you down. Yeah, I mean, that was something I learned back with Sports Renault, Spec Racer, Ford, whatever. You have to take advantage of every single little thing to make that car as clean as possible. Because you know that guy sitting next to you on the grid did. Yeah. Oh, and you see how slippery that corner is I told yeah. you about, International Horseshoe. You could spin a shopping cart there. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I remember uh, I was having some fun corner working at the Rolex 24 a few years ago, and uh, I was working at turn six, the turn that leads up onto the banking out of the infield. And uh, I think in the first 10 laps of that race, I called in 20 spins. I yeah, mean, it, it is greasy. It's it's astronomical. <laughs> you can't believe how slow you have to go to not spin out there. And, of course, the rest of the racetrack's really, really fast. So you're used to going fast. You get to that corner, and you went, like, I had the clutch in that spot. Yeah. You know, yeah. How can that be? It, 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 it is glass. Well, it's going to be interesting here as they are going to be out and around. And then again, it's 14 laps or 40 minutes. Should easily get to 14 laps, I would think, barring any long, long, long cautions. And, uh, you know, it's basically a flat out sprint. I would be suspect of that of that pace car. Two reasons. A, we don't know who's driving it. And <laughs> B, it's got a number on it. Well, good point. And it fits the class perfectly. It fits the class. It's just the newest, <laughs> latest model. So if the five wins this race, I'm, I'm, I'm calling foul. I know. Well, yeah, that'll be, a, I'm sure, appealed. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> right off the bat. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, a great point. I mean, that's the future of uh, the Miata. That's the new ND, the one that uh, is just now the brand new Miata. And they have now for the MX-5 Cup, they have that MX-5 Cup car as being tested for the new global MX-5 Cup Series, which is going to be running next year, not only a North American Championship, which has run for a number of years now, but Europe and Asia as well, and it's all that new MX-5 platform. It's going to be great stuff, and it's nice to see that car out and leading the field. Quite amazing uh, accomplishment for Mazda, what, yeah. what they've put into this. John Doonan and, and his group of guys you know, put on a fantastic show. This will be no exception to the rule. Yep, the busiest and nicest group of guys in motorsports. Certainly John Doonan, uh, he is, er, I, he has to be beaming himself to some of these locations. His idea, his, you know, turn the lights on. They, they're they paying yep. for it, this to happen. Yep. And everybody, everybody owes him on this one. Oh, absolutely. And look at this field now coming out of Speedway turn two down the super stretch. They get a look now at that bus stop and just what the grip levels are. And on these pace laps, especially in these conditions, you're you're exploring a little bit. Hey, what kind of grip do I have where? Yeah, and, and right now I would think they don't really have much choice of anything. I, yeah. I mean, you're more or less a reactionary driver in this situation. You know, we're going to get a green flag, things are going to happen, and you're just going to play off of the things around you until you can get a good reading on what's happening. And it was interesting, in that night qualifying on Tuesday, the only night session, it was cooler. Everybody knew it would be the fast one. And Andrew Carbonell, for the first five laps of that, was never higher than 26th. The next lap, pole. Yeah, and Selen came with them. They found the right gap and hooked up correctly. That's why you can't take this qualifying uh, with, just take it with a grain of salt. Yep. Because you get that one good run with a, a, a partner, and it can move you up half second, six tenths of a second. Yep. Now, you can't do that through the race. But. Exactly. Well, lights are out on the pace car. It is about to commence. Friday Night Lights, presented by Mazda at Daytona International Speedway. The Friday feature, if you will, of the 2015 SCCA runoffs, presented by Garmin Verb, in the coverage of this 50-second running of this great event, is brought to you by Mazda. Tonight is presented by Mazda. Friday Night Lights, look at the size of this field, those. <laughs> we're pulled way back with that camera, and we're not even covering the field yet. There's yeah. guys still behind that camera. Yeah, it's just an immense field here. They're just now coming out of Speedway 4. You've got this run that leads into the super stretch. Pace car will make a late move down into pit lane, and then Andrew Carbonell has to maintain the speed of that pace car until the green flies, and uh, everybody's got to be, even in these uh, spec Miatas, not the most powerful cars in the world but you've got to be careful jumping on the throttle here in these slippery conditions pace car is in waiting for the green and we are green we are racing here at daytona and immediately that is corey column and that yellow machine popped out from that four starting spot right away going to three abreast here and down to the inside that is carbonell but here comes column he has cleared the uh, second and third qualifiers column going with him here now hard onto the brakes down into turn one and a big slide everybody so far hanging on to it dorsey that was very impressive. Very nice start, orderly start. Everybody clear through turn one. I would not have bad. No, there's a car backwards in yep. the wall right there in turn two. Oh, boy, and it looked like Column was. He did. He cleared Andrew Carbonell. So a phenomenal launch there. Also for the 156, a good run as well as they now through that uh, international horseshoe and heading toward the kink for the first time. See if we're going to get any kind of full course yellow there. Obviously, one car was run backwards in the wall. I don't know about more than that. 
Boy, that was a phenomenal launch, timing it well by Corey Collum. And uh, let's see who slots into that second spot here. Uh, came up from a bit back as well. It's running the 156, and uh, we'll give you an update on who that is. I think that's Todd, uh, that might be Todd Burris, who uh, got an absolutely phenomenal jump. Wow, yeah, that's why I couldn't spot him. That was, he started 11 spot, Dorsey, and on that start is now second. That's quite amazing. Corey Collum, I mean, driving it like he stole it for sure, which I would too because I'd be afraid all those buddies of mine behind me. Look well, at this. Good draft, two car draft. Now, if these guys will work together, they can actually pull away from this whole pack. I would do that right now if I, I was them. And let's not race with each other on the first lap. Let's try to get away from all these idiots back here. Yeah, clear it. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly right. Clear it out here. You've got an opportunity. You've somehow been able to make that kind of a break. Don't throw it away now by getting aggressive yeah, and just wanting it. to lead. Yes, they look, are. Look at that. Just nice two-car draft. That's fast. We know it's fast. And they're, they're going to play discipline. Now down into the bus stop for the first time at speed. Nice job by both of those drivers. Understanding what's at stake here. Ooh, Carbonell back in. Steps out just a little bit. That cost him momentum up onto the banking. Good save, though. Yeah. He, he gathered it up right away. But did cost him a spot, but not much here. And he's now in the middle of a uh, red Miata sandwich at this stage. And again, now that car coming up behind him. Uh, we have heard the word. You can go ahead and bump your. I think in these conditions, though, a lot easier to upset a car oh, if you yeah. hit him and uh, obviously loosen him up. Yeah, the rules of the game are that you can go up at bump draft or you can push on someone. If you turn them and send them into the infield, you're going to get a penalty. If you wreck them, you're going to get a penalty. If you take the position because you pushed them and got them loose, you're going to get a penalty. Other than that, it's all free. Yeah, and Andrew Carbonell actually able to get back and around and into that uh, third spot right now because Selen Roland actually chose Carbonell as they came up here instead of Bolanos. And uh, when you're together in that pod, as John Doonan so aptly uh, referred to it here, the uh, two cars, that paid off and it just pushed Carbonell. It wasn't a bump draft. It was just arrow push. Took him right back up into third. And there Ooh. you go. Boom. That was in the middle of the corner there. Yeah. That, that one you have to watch out for, particularly when it's wet like it is. These tires doing a really good job. I'm impressed with uh, the amount of grip that's available. Well, you know, and Elvin Goulart is in the sixth spot. Dorsey, he started in 17th. So we've had some guys that just played that start, and it was just, they just went to the outside and drove around it's, a lot of it's people. probably the name. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. think he came from here. Yeah, it's just amazing <laughs> yeah, what they're doing here. Four-time national champ, as I said, just never in this category. But a good run there as uh, Alex Bolanos now just hounding this black and uh, blue number 79 of, uh, again, an awfully talented driver, Andrew Carbonell. Ooh, running way, way wide there, but giving himself some good momentum. The only question is uh, the track limits regulation there. They've been fairly comfortable letting him run pretty free yeah. up in the sixth there. He's been running that line like he's trying to modify drain line more or less. Uh, Andrew Carbonell work, working the high side to see what kind of grip. I think that was a bit more than what he wanted. I think it, you know, he tried it and it, and it took off on him. I think so too. And boy, right now, Elevan Goulart is flying. That's the third car in your frame. Again, started 17th, sit sixth, and is uh, in that draft now and closing right up on the back of that 57. That is the red Momo entry of Alex Bolanos. Love that speed shot as you get that spray blowing up as they head by into the bus stop. Ooh, look at this is again Carbonell better that time through the bus stop and he gets that little bump from Bolanos and here comes Goular and now we've got that first three car draft at this stage let's see how well that works well they're getting braver let's put it that way they're, they're willing now to push one another so they, they felt the car underneath them they think it's okay to do this see and this is what they were saying the guy said when you get a third car in the picture the third car just loses everything and just drops back Goulart had a great run out of the bus stop but when those two cars in front of him hooked up for some reason that third car cannot yeah, take it, advantage of that it would only work if you if the third car was able to touch the second car and stay locked together like that yep. which we might see later on in this as we 
Oh, I'll tell you though, it is bringing. Oh, here we go. Bolanos down underneath. Carbonell down into turn one. And already it, lap traffic as he gets wide right there in turn uh, exit of turn one. Oh boy, this is close stuff. Meanwhile, that car first in your frame, your leader, Corey Collum, has you could barely see Todd Burris in that white number 156, who started in 11th and sits behind him. As a matter of fact, boy, for a second there, I thought Burris might work an outside pass there, and now Bolanos up into third and he's there. gone around. Yeah, oh, yeah, off to the right. Somebody spun there in the, in the grass. He, he should be able to get going again. I think I'm he's pretty nervous. impressed with the, the amount of grip. I mean, these guys are not running a rain line. They're running right on, right on their normal line. A little loose right there. For the second place car. A little bit of a flat slide, but uh, I mean, you would expect that. Boy, they are pushing the envelope. And here comes Bolanos, that third car, the red Momo entry, chasing down the Krispy Kreme 156 <laughs> of Todd Burris. And Todd, I mean, we've seen Todd race uh, a lot of different things. He's raced in the uh, Continental Tire Series. He's uh, raced in World Challenge. Ooh, Look at this, Bolanos going for it all here. And he may just have made that work, Darcy, down to the inside. Pollum in that yellow and blue car swings to the outside, but that opened up and let Burroughs come through. And now those two running side by side opportunity here for Bolanos to break a, away just a little bit. If I was a white car, I'd lift a little bit right now and tuck back in behind. That's not doing anybody any favors side by side like that. Yeah, well, obviously, Column right now is going to. There we goes. Yeah, Burroughs. I think he realized if he didn't do that, yeah, you're just, those two are going to team up and just break free. Absolutely. You got to. You got you to think. You got to think ahead of where you're at. Somebody in the pits here with uh, trouble. Oh, that's frustrating for sure. I haven't seen the car number yet. It's. Uh, I think it was Justin Elder. They said. I just heard. So a problem there. Boy, that's frustrating. All the work you put in to get to the runoffs. Mm. Boy, Column. There. Now there's a little puddle over there. That's just that little divot for people that run wide. But boy, did he get a run and he's got he? Burris coming with him. Does he do it? No, Burris now, says, I had too much speed. Burris, here, here's a problem. You go for a pass attempt, but you have to be able to have somewhere to go if you make it. He would have had to pass both those cars. He obviously couldn't, so he ducked back down. It would have been better just to brush the brake a little bit with your left foot, keep the throttle wide open, and stay tucked up underneath. It's cost him two car lengths. Yeah, boy, this is just uh, fascinating. These drivers said it. Two cars are great, three cars. That third car just disappears right off the tail. And uh, this is pretty interesting stuff here. Bolanos, what a event he's been having here. Again, qualified third, dropped back to about fifth or sixth, and has fought his way right into the lead as they head down turn one. Now through the S's. You can adjust your speed just by brushing the brake, just putting your foot over there and getting rid of the speed that you don't want. But you don't want to lift off the throttle because you lose the full momentum. The engine's got to spool back up to get it back. It takes too long. The other way works really well. Burroughs, a great run out of the S's, and now he's going to try the outside pass on Column through the International Horseshoe. Does he make it stick? That's brave. That sure is brave, but it worked, I think. Now well, he's well down here because yeah. they can't go through here, side mate. Well, now yeah, we've seen him that. do it. That's what we said in a, a race earlier, and by golly, they did it, and they do right there. So. All right, here we go. Boy, Burris just stay into the outside. He's finding grip out there, Dorsey. But there, you notice he's got one tail light out. You yeah, have so to have at least one working. So, so if he you're loses nasty, another one, yeah, that's if a you're stop. you're a nasty guy, you just go out there and tap that other one. Knock that other one out. And Burris completes with a oh, big nice lurid slide. slide. That's it. That's a momentum killer. Yeah, he killed his momentum, but it was a good handful of yeah. wheel there. It was a, a great save, but it's just going to. That's Cost a really it. tricky area down on that flat. You want to get to the throttle early, but boy, as soon as it breaks free, it, you really can't do anything. But what he did right there is unwind his steering wheel and use up the road. And guess who that is? Just giving him a little tap there. That's Elevan Gular once again, 17th now to fourth. And Elevan is one of the more aggressive racers out on the track as well. So this could be fun. Hayward, what are you hearing in pit lane? Guys, I just went up and down the pit wall. I talked to every single crew member that was wearing a headset, asked them who they were talking to, what they were hearing. Radio silence across the field right now. These guys are busy. Their hands are full. They're not coordinating with one another to try to set up drafts. They're running with who they're close to. I asked all of them if they said anything about grip, if they said anything about conditions, and just shaked heads. Nobody's doing any talking. The only thing, other thing we have is the 51 cars here on pit road. Yeah. Lost a pulley, lost a belt, overheated, so he's done. No, oh, that's so frustrating again uh, with what's going on. But you know, that makes sense to me. You don't want to just, I mean, 
let your concentration dip no, to just push the radio button and right now. When, when a driver's being quiet like that, he, he's got full concentration on what he's doing. That's the rain factor right there. They, they really need to just, you know, they know where they are right now, especially the, this group. Yep. Two cars of two draft in each. Goulart really been banging the back end, uh, and that's yeah. okay of, of Burris. Well, and look what it did. They were a ways back, Darcy, and it's brought them right up now to that group and made it a four-car battle again. And on the way, Goulart just set fast lap of the race at a two-minute 34.061. So a great lap by Goulart. I suspect he lives in and around where it rains every day. It might be. Yeah, he's <laughs> pretty comfortable with it. Look at this move now. Diving down to the inside of Burris. Now, we know Burris this. works the outside very well. But if Goulart now can come up and latch onto the back of Corey Collum. And he has. Yep, there you go. Now, uh, really, I mean, Burris, if uh, he you gets, know yeah. See, I don't agree with Burris right here going down the inside to this left-hander. They're doing it, yeah, but they're slowing themselves up to be able to do it. I think he, at the last second there, he said, all right, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, say, I'll just Boy. pass all you on the outside then. <laughs> and that Dorsey doesn't know anything. Well, he just gets—he he gets these great heads of speed. Trouble. He's just well. He didn't lose much. Up a little bit there. Ooh, and he just got in. Just tapped the 70 of Goulart. Yeah, he's—he's he's on the edge of having a disaster. It just hasn't happened yet. What's, yeah, there he goes again. Remember, he's loose right there that last time. So, yeah, what's your phrase? It's erect. It just hasn't happened yeah, yet. It's, it, but it's—it's—it's it's, it's gonna it's fix him to. <laughs> Well, once again, they have to do it all over again. And when Burris got sideways out of turn six, they lost that yeah. six, seven car lengths. And now Goulart's got to just get onto his bumper and drive him forward again. Look how clean, you know, Bolanis and, and Colum are. They, they are hooked up together, driving a real nice, tidy, tidy line. They're trying to get away from that stuff behind them. And we know Alex Bolanos, an amazingly talented, experienced driver in runoffs. How about Corey Collum in his first runoffs? Yeah, running, I mean, he looks like a very savvy veteran. Oh, he's, he's tied up with somebody who is a savvy veteran. Well, that's true. And that's what you want to do. I mean, why, why learn from somebody who's not the top? Yep. And Corey, again, from Cape Coral. Of Florida, he's got a lot of laps around here. And the nationwide points, uh, interestingly, he was only 42nd uh, in that points tally, but uh, he's got some huge experience here. That draft just pull the car yeah. right up into the back. I don't see any dry line even forming yet. I found that kind of that's interesting. But I remember our humidity today was probably something like 87%. Yeah, it was high. That's it was a good really point. high. And Boy, these two now. They've made a bit of a break, haven't they? And that's what they were wanting to do, too. See how they're cleaning? They're right nose to tail, pushing one another. It looks like Goulart has gone around Burris, and now Burris has to be the one uh, to just be a little patient and work with Goulart. Otherwise, they're going to lose touch with these guys right. completely. I mean, they're just not quite as tidy. I mean, you really need to run that draft. Like I said that, if you're like four or five cars like these cars, if you ran a plumb bob from the right front headlight to the right rear tail light, all those cars should be touching the plumb bob. They should be over here a little bit or over there a little bit. You lose ground that way. You know, you're, you're not getting efficient. Now, with these cars, though, I mean, when you're running in such close concert, lap after lap after lap, is there any risk then of uh, not getting enough air into the radiators and yes. the brake nuts and overheating a bit? You know, it's been really warm. It's not so much because that rain cooled it down, but it has been warm. I saw that a couple times today where guys had to pop out and start getting some air to the radiator. Yeah, if you're tucked that close, like those two cars right there, your radiator is only eating the exhaust from the other car. Yeah, and that battle we were just looking at, uh, tell you, back in 45th, 46th, the 88 of Michael Lemania, the number 30 of Nicholas Soriano, Alex Acosta, Spencer Rutherford. Doesn't matter where you look here, you find these uh, groups that have picked up and have clumped up. And by the way, last lap, Corey Collum takes away fast lap at a two minute 33.559. Second lap, pole, by the way, was a 218.6. So you can do the math. That's the uh, lack of grip that's coming into play here. Those uh, fastest laps should start falling pretty quickly yeah. now because things are going to dry out. Uh, no rain in coming down. Now you see a lot less spray now coming yeah, off absolutely. of those tires, isn't yeah. it? Well, but those two behind, Goulart and Burris, they've calmed down. Burris is not looking in and out all the time. He's just tucked right in, and they're now making ground right that's, back up again. That's what it takes. You want to yeah. be just single file, just as tidy as possible. Don't have a headlight over to the left or a headlight over to the right, because that's just adding drag. And how about Christopher Haldeman, who sits in the fifth spot right now uh, in that number 72 machine. And uh, he has come from a ways deep in the pack. And right now he's doing it by himself. He was 10th on the grid, Dorsey, and he's all by himself and still finding good pace. That's hard to do. Too. Yeah. I mean, he just tells you he's got a really strong car. If he had somebody to play with, it would be a lot better. 
And there he is sitting in fifth all by his own Lonely self right fifth. now. Yep. But uh, somehow he's finding some pretty good pace. I mean, his last lap was a 240, a 234 three. So, I mean, he's less than a second off of those guys up front. He's losing time, but uh, the guys behind him right now, uh, which includes Andrew Carbonell, your pole sitter, Jonathan Goring, one of the best, Craig Berry, one of the very best, Justin Hilly, uh, who's been phenomenal this year in the nationwide points in his conference as well in majors. They haven't been able to run Haldeman down. These two-car drafts are making 127-mile-per-hour runs right now. That's almost 10 miles an hour faster than what they could do by themselves earlier on. So 126, 127, anybody who's tidy in that draft. Yeah, interestingly, fastest speed we've seen now, that was a while ago, so we don't know if he was with somebody, was Haldeman at a 132.8. Now, that's a really good go right yeah. there. That is impressive having a look here. And that is, uh, that's that battle we were talking about with Carbonell, that blue and black 79, the 118 of Goring right behind him. And behind him is Craig Berry at this stage, that silver. Mazda Miata and they've got a little bit of room those guys have built up back to the 48 of Justin Hilly. Carbonell, a lot of people were worried about him but uh, he just he got passed early there made that little bobble in the bus stop and it looked like he was able to save it and, and stay with it but he's just fallen adrift a bit. Andrew of course runs a lot of pro series in the same kind of car. He, you know they could have changed his setup or whatever for the rain the last minute you you sometimes you just do a last ditch effort yeah you know disconnect a sway bar do something you're trying to try something different doesn't always work by the way yeah it doesn't always work but as you said yeah running in the uh, continental tire sports car challenge current points leader in st here at this stage of the season pro level driver so. absolutely there's a little little help from jonathan goring as they're trying to break away from as i said uh, Craig Berry at this point, then Justin Hill, then in 10th, completing the top 10 right now is the 84 of Todd Lamb, another very experienced driver Absolutely. who's uh, done some pro stuff as well. Halfway through the race, now there is no spray, and I see a little of a light color going through the, the bus stop here. Yep. So it's starting to dry. And with that, we'll see uh, if one car over the other has an adv advantage. And ironically, you see that little bit of a dry line. It means you have to be even more precise because now you're carrying speed on the dry line that's above the grip level that you've got. If you get off of that dry line, you better be pretty spot on right now as we go back to our lead battle here of Alex Bolanos and Corey Collum. And I have not seen Corey make one significant step out from behind Bolanos. He's, they, these two get it right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you look back behind them, and unfortunately, Todd Burris is just not as clean drafting on El Elvin Gulag. He, he always sticks his head out, or, you know, pops his pops his headlight out, takes a look. He, he's probably not comfortable being that close the where you can't see yeah, the visibility. Yeah. You see him right here. I mean, they're just not as tidy. It'll be interesting to see once this dry line gets a little bit uh, more embedded, if you will, if Burris finds that comfort level and is able to stay there. But boy, they get into the uh, infield here and they do close up a bit. It's like flying in formation. I mean, the seeds doing it again right there. Yeah. Post to the inside instead of following his teammate. You got to fly in formation. You have to trust the guy in front of you. You know, you, you do everything he does. And if he runs it into the wall, you're going to run into the wall too. Target fixation sometimes is a good thing. You know, you just, and they don't have the confidence. You can tell those two guys have not worked together. And uh, they don't have the, you know, the, the, the confidence to, to be that close. Well, I think you might be onto something with that Corey Collum. You know, a, a lot of experience here at Daytona, not a lot of experience at the runoffs. Alex Bolanos, uh, a, a top flight driver here with a lot of runoffs experience. And I think you're saying, you know, you know Corey Collum, it's doing two things. One, he's just exactly following in Bolanos' wheel tracks going, this is how I'm going to learn here. And at the same time, it's being very uh, effective in this draft. But Goulart broke yeah. Burris there that, a little bit, got that, a great run out of six. That's what I've been watching. Goulart. Yeah. Goulart just broke the ranks, and now he's caught up. If he can get a little bit closer to the 23, he can tag that team. He's going to lose his teammate back there, but I don't think his teammate was helping him either. I think that Todd Burris was hindering uh, the progress. Yeah, but again, we see what happens here. You don't get close enough as that third car. They just drop you. Yeah, you got to force the issue for sure. You got to be right touching on the back bumper. All right, down through the bus stop as we are working lap eight, just gone by halfway here in this run to the gold in Spec Miata. See, I don't know if Alex Bolanos and, and, and 
Corey have worked together before. It certainly looks like they do, because watch this. I mean, he just comes in, closes in, makes contact, and they are absolutely welded together. Uh, yeah, taking a look, they have, because they're both running for the Autotechnic team. Uh, so they've done this before, and they ended up, I mean, they, they gridded third and fourth, so they were probably a duo in that draft yeah. in, in Tuesday Night Qualifying. Perfect two-card draft. They're not messing with each other. They have complete confidence in one another's ability, and that's how you get the job done. And now you look at Elvin Goulart by himself. He's lost touch with the front two, and he's lost touch with his teammate, and uh, the two of them now dropping back pretty quickly. And Corey Collin lowers that time. Remember, it was just a couple laps ago, uh, Doris, they were running in the 234s. It's now a 230.5. Yeah. So the speed's coming. Yeah, the track's drying out. You know, everybody's got a good handle on their car. Now they feel, you know, what, what grips underneath them. Up until that point, I mean, uh, Burris had a really quick lap at a 231.5. Uh, and then Collin nipped underneath it with that 230. And we've got some traffic coming up, too, I think. That had to happen sooner or later with <laughs> 62 cars. Yeah, exactly. You know, somebody just had a moment somewhere and lost enough momentum. And we have seen what can happen, and traffic can certainly break up a good drafting duel. And if you catch it at the wrong spot, it can bring everybody behind you right on to year six here as uh, they come through once again. Element Goulart's in yeah. an awkward situation. He's he's kind of lost the pull of the front two. Uh, he's, he's by himself. His teammate that he was using to, to give a pass before Todd Burris is uh, dropped back from behind him. He doesn't want to wait for him. That, that wasn't working. He's was a great draft partner. And here we go up under the banking. And there will be traffic ahead this time. And I think uh, it might be the uh, number 75 of Michael Collins. I'm not exactly sure on that, that they're going to catch. And a lot of this comes down to, you know, sometimes where you catch that guy. And this is where the corner marshals that we were talking about with those blue flags, this is where they become serious players in any event, is letting that car that is about to be swarmed here know that you've got some fast, fast race leaders coming up and let them go, and I think he just did. I think he moved to the, yep, he just moved over and let them come through. And that's the easiest way to have things happen. Just, yep. You don't lose time, you don't cost them time. Look at this now, Colin, just a little bit slower through the bus stop, but close enough. Yeah, here it comes. Doesn't, oh, yeah, it it doesn't take a, much to find that uh, that yeah, hookup, and, does and it? Look at him now. Instead of he could go right around him with that kind of a run, he could just pass for Lee. But no, I'm your buddy. I'm going to come right back behind you. We're going to just keep running our deal because we don't have, uh, you know, we're not down the end yet. Yeah. That was enough of a run. He could have taken the lead right there anytime he wanted to. You know, I wonder if one of the reasons we're not seeing quite as aggressive bump drafting as we certainly did in the qualifying sessions is because it's at night, and at night you've got to have at least one taillight working, and you hit a guy too hard and knock them both out, uh, you're knocking a teammate potentially into a penalty scenario. So maybe they're just playing a little nicer right now. I doubt that'll last much longer. Well, that's true. You get to a certain <laughs> point. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's a very good point. Say but, somewhere in the next, like, five laps, that'll all go away. Boy, this is about as big a margin as we've seen from that front two back to Goulart and Burris. Two seconds now. Yeah, they've truly And Burris lost. has gone back around the 70 of uh, Goulart. Ooh, and I think they actually might have made contact with him. And Burris had fast lap. Now it's pipped by Bolanos, who goes a two-minute 30.346. So Burris found some speed there. He's just now, now that it's drying up, if the track yeah, that could be back it. to him, yet? yeah, it absolutely could be that that set up on the car is a possibility. Oh, they're not hurt, they're not helping each other a bit right now. Oh, well, Burris wanted the over under there, didn't he? And he still might get it, too. Yeah, he just got a little wiggle there. And uh, unfortunately, Dose, uh, they're dropping back. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, yep. they're racing now for third place, right? And Jim Drago has fought his way back up into the top 10. Remember. Uh, he had qualified 15th and uh, has fought his way into the top 10. And the reason I say that is something we were hoping to chat a little bit about is the infamous Drago Wiggle. We just haven't seen much of it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Everybody right now is trying to be as straight as they can get. <laughs> exactly. You know? It is starting to dry in the banking, too. I just saw a, a pretty clear dry line. So guys that didn't have the right ring set up should start getting quicker. And Gular again able to just put about six, seven car lengths between himself and Todd Burris as they head out of turn six. You see them heading into the straight. Now, this is getting interesting because Chris Haldeman in that fifth place car, the number 72, has been running pretty much by himself. But Goring, Carbonell, and Barry now have uh, 
sort of borne down on him a little bit, and they have closed that margin up significantly. Right, Brunel just tried to have a look to the inside, didn't quite get the job done. But again, we're running out of race time, too. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to start trying things here pretty shortly. Yeah, we're working lap nine of 14 here. And Carbonell, as you said, now tucked right behind that uh, black and orange car of Boring. Carbonell in the blue and black machine. All of them chasing that yellow and black entry of Chris Haldeman, the number 72, the X Factor Racing Carbotech Mazda Miata. And here they come. Yeah, and they're just going to push their way right on by. Can't defend against that when it happens. You just take it, you know, try to tuck back in as soon as you can behind him, and he does. Boy, Carbonell just read that beautifully, didn't he? As he just cut through, sort of threaded the needle, and then he, but he's a little bit too hot down into one. He's going to hang on to it. Yeah, he got a good save right there. Boy, and there you just saw again that battle for third. They're side by side again. Burris and Gula. I wonder if they've just said, well, we're not going to be able to go have, for the gold. Yeah, I think that, you know, they're, they're not just racing position. But that's going to put Carbonell now. Uh, by my read, he is going to now be up into the uh, fifth spot. And that's a great comeback drive going from seventh to fifth just in that one double overtake. And again, up front, Burris and uh, Goular are just, uh, they're almost banging fenders now. Yeah, it's a, it's a two car for the lead, and it's going to get ugly here pretty shortly. You know, right now they're playing well together. But once they both know it's between them for the win, yep. they'll, they'll have it out then. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Can't wait to get to it. We still have a few laps, though. Uh, about six before that happens here as we're enjoying this battle now between Andrew Carbonell leading this uh, trio right now. Haldeman right behind him. And then a uh, oh, big wide run there. I know I shouldn't say what I'm about to say. Yep. But yes, this has been remarkable with 62 cars that we haven't had any big spins. We haven't had any big crashes. We haven't had any kind of uh, craziness under really trying situation they have done a great job and Dorsey uh, let's hope that wasn't the old announcer jinx as they say <laughs> that is spooky I indeed that on purpose I'm not sure yeah There's well I'll tell you this is great stuff Woo! somebody in trouble there that's a lap car right in the front of our leaders tried to get out of the way and uh, didn't really balk them too much now we'll see whether Gular and Burris were able to take any kind of advantage of that, and I don't think so. No, I don't either. Yeah. These two guys are working perfectly. Superbly. Absolutely yeah. working perfectly. You're not going to run them down unless you do the exact same thing that they're doing, and yep. then you'll probably just be equal to them. Yeah, last lap by Corey Collin. First time now we've got a driver down sub 230 into the 229s at a 229.5. As these two, uh, this has just been phenomenal execution of what everybody said would be the winning plan. It was just who did it best. Yeah, and, and they're doing it as good as it can be done. They're doing it perfectly. You know, obviously they must have practiced this. It's, it's not as easy as you think, particularly with the wet surface, to run in tandem like that. Well, you've got to be really be in sync, as you said, in terms of feeling comfortable in the car with these uh, sketchy grip conditions oh, yeah, and the definitely. like. You've got to be happy to run with a guy that close. Second place car can't see a thing. He's just he's responding off the back of the car in front of him. Wow, Jonathan Goring in six though, the 118. Part of that battle we've been following is they have run down Chris Haldeman with Andrew Carbonell. Just turns a 227.8. Uh, excuse me, 227.992. So this track now that we're getting down to some serious grip lap by lap, it's improving dramatically. And you can see it now, the light, lighter color. It's still a one-lane racetrack, though. Like I say, if you're going to make an attempt to pass anyone, it's going to get sketchy. Working out of the West Horseshoe. Coming up. Dipping the brake here. Crucial corner. It's still pretty damp, but the approach to the apex there, isn't it? Yeah, they're, they're running. You see both of them wagging the tail a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, they're running right at the edge. But they're really tidy. They're really clean with their drafting. They're really clean with their turn-ins. They're hitting their marks. Well, you can see there's a couple of spots on the bank now where it's just flat dry. It's uh, it, it's it's happening. It takes a lot of concentration to do what they're doing. It, it's not as easy as it looks. Boy, this is just impressive the way these two have been able to do just to take this game plan and just make it work. Now, this probably isn't going to work as I see like four wide back here. <laughs> yeah, this, I believe a scrum might be the best way to describe these guys here. And that, I think part of it is, is they're coming up on some traffic and it's That's also that battle. Yeah. Yeah. And they are coming up on traffic. 
Oh boy, now yeah, that's Goular. He is under huge attack now. Carbonell and the oh, 118, and they touch, and here goes Carbonell down go underneath. Right by him, you watch. Right around the bottom because of that contact scrub the speed. Goular tucks underneath it, tries to get the draft. That could have been a big wreck over there. Yeah, and that's Burris, that fourth car, the white Krispy Kreme entry now as he just kind of comes up and tucks right in behind the 72 of uh, Chris Haldeman, that blue, uh, yellow and black machine. Three laps to go, I, it's on now. Yeah, it's got to be it. This day, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't Actually, stay five to go. anybody. Not, not for these guys. These guys are going for broke. Yep, that's Here a comes good. A three wide down into one. Wow. Boy, this Goulart's, is furious stuff. Goulart says no. <laughs> I, I don't want it. Ooh, too too deep for. We've seen sh yeah. Charbonneau has he has uh, Carbonell has overrun that corner a number of times. That time it caught him, and we're anticipating white flag this time by Darcy. Yeah. It, it's wow. It's gonna get crazy now. All right. Well, this is pretty fascinating, and Haldeman has been able to fight through and do a nice job as those guys have gone through on Goulart and Burris. Burris trying to get underneath Goulart again. Oh boy! Didn't make it yeah. then. Yeah, that's that battle for third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. But here we go, yeah, Bolanos now and and uh, Corey Collum. And at this stage, uh, are, are they thinking? All right, now it's mano a mano. Yeah, it is. Uh, right now, I think it's it, gloves are off. You know, let's see what we can do. They've got first and second if they don't wreck each other. There's third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh. Just back there a little bit. That orange and black machine of Jonathan Goring. That's the Alphas Unlimited, Dixon and Rossini Motorsports machine. And uh, again, Haldeman has done a superb job. He had to do a lot of this on his own. And I think you got to give a guy pretty good credit for that. Good run up ahead for second, first and second. See if he's going to pass him this time. And nope. here comes, it's again, Carbonell. Carbonell is still helping. Boy, he's giving him a nice push here. I think they're just trying to make a break maybe uh, from that duo that's been fighting behind him here. And then settle it for this final metal spot here. Boy, leaving everything to the last lap, that's that's risky too. I think I would have wanted oh, to try it once. Traffic, got traffic for, for the leaders. leaders. Free run for third and fourth. And then here is fifth and sixth with seventh, that uh, car of Goring again. And the leaders easily clean and through on this traffic. And again now, this is coming up out of Speedway 4. And boy, look at that. Column again in that draft just comes right up behind him here <laughs> and into the tri oval this time. We're anticipating a white flag and a bit more traffic They're up in front. Let it go to the last lap. Let's we'll see what happens. Here we go, folks. Watch up in the upper left corner. Still there nice is the white flag and traffic. They're going to catch him right as they get into the braking zone down here of turn one. Dorsey, this could be tricky. If it stacks him, Carvinell's coming. He's not that far back. He moves out of good. The car moves out of the way, gives him room. That's nice. Yep. There's Carbonell working that outside line. He's in the grass this time. Yep. Ran too wide. That's going to kill his momentum, and he's going to lose touch. But yep. look what happened here. That little bit of traffic, just enough. And suddenly, Haldeman has made this a three car battle with the lead. He's going for second, Dorsey. Can he spread the needle? Can he go through there? I don't know. He's got second place for sure. Wow, what a move by Haldeman. And again, Andrew Carbonell, that fourth car in your frame. This could become suddenly a four car battle if he can catch just a little bit of a toe here. But what a drive. Haldeman to by the Haldeman. outside. Oh, and he's going in way, way deep. But he's got it. He's he got did it. it. That's I wonder it. if he didn't set his car up for a drier track and it's starting to pay dividends. That's an awesome outside pass. Nobody wow. would expect it down there. That's how he did it. And yeah. look at look at Carbonell the inside. This could be contact down here. Yeah, I wonder if these guys maybe didn't go with a little different setup that wasn't great in the damp, thinking it was going to dry out. Second place, Carbonell working to the outside. He's got a momentum run going. Boy, he does. But look at the escape Haldeman has made. That's 10 car lengths, Dorsey. Yeah, that's unbelievable right there. Carbonell up to second, but he's got nothing at all. And Christopher Haldeman, if he hangs on to this, he's had to have done it, a lot of it by himself for a while on this track. What a story it will be here. He started this lap in fourth. He leads by a ton. That now is the battle for your final podium spot, and they are quickly closing. It could become a three-car battle for second, third, and fourth. 
behind here. Here they go into the bus stop. That is a look at uh, some traffic again. It's the cars up in front of uh, what we're seeing here right now they got that are going to decide this. Less than a half a lap to go. There he is. He's gone, man. That, whatever he had stored up, he, he just unleashed it. He's wow. driving away from this entire pack like they weren't even out there. I think that they played a little bit of a setup game, and it may have been an absolutely brilliant move. Haldeman out of Speedway 4, up into the trioval. He started the race in 10th. He started this lap in 4th, and Haldeman comes through. What a battle for second, and Andrew Carbonell somehow carved his way back up into the second spot, and for third, I think Corey Collum got the guy he followed for Jeez, 12 of these 14 was, laps. That was photo finish for third place. <laughs> I, I have no idea who won that deal. Carbonell, good job. And the fireworks unleash here at Daytona International Speedway. Boy, even more lights here for Friday Night Lights. Presented by Mazda, and what a race it was, and what a final two laps in particular, <laughs> but especially that last lap by Haldeman. Look at this. Here's the finish. Oh, it is going to go to Bolanos. <laughs> you sure? He, well, <laughs> it sure looks like it by, what, a foot at most. Yeah, maybe. <sighs> that was unbelievable here. Hopefully the transponders were working. No, just incredible here. Yeah, what we were seeing here. Uh, well, they said a visual will override a transponder. Man, Haldeman, though, i got to tell you, he, once he made his he move, he had so much in reserve, he just literally just went right through that field like it was not out there. Haldeman was hauling. Yeah, he was definitely hauling. Just incredible what he was able to do here today. Fantastic run here. Now they're working through and uh, trying to uh, obviously scoring is looking at that third place finish here. Wow, what a story that was. Just fantastic here. Now I'm. Uh, yeah, things are cycling around a little bit here. We're trying to. Yeah, you can't uh, go off our scoring our here at this scoring. stage. But here is another Elder, look Here's at that it. finish. Finish again. And that's Bolanos in the red car. Gosh, that's Ooh. close. That's so awful close. close. I mean, from our camera angle alone, we can't really say what happened there. Carbonell, though, we had a great job. He he came from way back to come up there. Yeah, just an incredible run. And uh, I think part of the consternation here might be it may, I'm just trying to clarify here, uh, there's a, a possibility that the uh, car is very similar colors. Goring on that last lap turned a 224-2. So we're, uh, we're wondering now whether it was actually Jonathan Goring that was able to put that run together. Of course, he started in the sixth spot in the Alphas Unlimited Rossini Motorsports entry. It was a phenomenal run. Uh, by him as well, and uh, we're just going to have to watch here. Uh, well, some of the cars still coming around and finishing, Dorsey. But I, I am really impressed, Greg, that we did this in the rain. We did this at night. We did this with 60-something cars, and we Absolutely. didn't have any kind of a big deal. I mean, no spins, no crashes. It just really, really bodes well for the guys. did a great job tonight. They sure did, and I'm just trying to get an eyeball on the number. That second car in the queue there, I believe that is our winner, and it might just be Jonathan Goring. And either way, it was a staggering last lap. And as he turns here, that was Goring. It was Jonathan Goring that put that together. Wow. Uh, the color scheme uh, just uh, caught us out a little bit, and I'll be honest about it. But John Welcome back to the Hoosier Racing Tire SECA Super Tour, live from the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago region June sprints is as you can see right now uh, you want your weather tech uh, floor uh, mats here today because it is still raining at uh, at Road America I want to give you a quick update here on two things first of all um, we had stopped earlier uh, the the race the previous to lunch here we had stopped it early and uh, we were originally told it was because of rain and uh, while I mentioned that that didn't make a ton of sense to me because we usually race in the rain uh, we have since found out that the uh, the reason that it was stopped early is because there was lightning near the racetrack. And uh, when there's lightning near the racetrack, we stop racing and we get our corner workers in from the corners and all of our outdoor personnel in and uh, undercover because those folks don't have any kind of real, um, uh, real protection. And uh, if you can show us real quick, Zach, the shot of... Um, 
um, the entrance to the kink. It's a good um, a good example of what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, there you go. That's a corner stand there off to the right with no protection there. Um, and um, we don't like to let people stand out in a lightning storm for that. So that was the reason the race was called earlier. Uh, it's also the reason why we're not going back to racing right now. We just had another lightning strike here just a few minutes ago. And uh, those lightning strikes are, um, we have to have a 30-minute wait uh, after every one of those lightning strikes uh, before, uh, without another lightning strike, before we can go back to racing. So uh, we're on one of those holds right now. So it looks like it's going to be probably at least another 30 minutes. Uh, but keep an eye here on the stream. We're going to update the, uh, the text at the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the uh, screen here as we go. And we'll put some information in the chat when we have some more information. But um, that is what's going on. We're in the middle of a weather hold because of lightning, and uh, we're going to go back. Um, uh, we're going to go back. Also, we're finding out here that there's more rain and storms expected to come through again at the top of the hour. So uh, this could be a little longer than we'd like, but we're going to do our best to get everything in. In the meantime, we're going to go back to some of our archived uh, runoffs action, and I don't know which, uh, which uh, runoffs we're going to see, but the 2010 runoffs is going to be our next, uh, our next replay. So enjoy that. Uh, while you're uh, having your lunch or, or hanging out and uh, waiting for us to get back to racing. And we appreciate you hanging out with us for this. This is the Hoosier Racing Tire SCCA Super Tour uh, live from the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago region June Sprints. We'll be back and let you know what's going on shortly. This is an interesting one because as if you watch the coverage here on SpeedCastTV.com last year, some of the races are combined classes because the popularity of Sports Car Club of America, uh, there's so many teams, drivers that want to get involved in it. They've added a few classes, but they wanted to make sure that all the classes that qualified in terms of numbers had a shot at a national championship, but trying to keep the race numbers down to something that could be covered over three days. Some of the smaller groups that have relatively similar lap times, they've combined into multiple race groups. In SCCA national and regional competition, that's often the norm. A little bit unusual here at the runoffs, but it worked very well last year. Yeah, it seemed to come off pretty well seamlessly. Uh, usually the leaders won't find each other on the track. You know, you might get some of the, the back markers uh, getting passed, but it uh, didn't really interfere last year with any of the championships. And it was some great racing, and we've got the two groups today. One is T3, which is a relatively new class, uh, and it is a class for very, very um, high performance potential. And there's T1, T2, T3, Turing 1 through 3. Uh, and obviously, they're more stock-based, but very high performance. The newest edition, this is the first year it's running at the runoffs, is called STO and STU, Super Turing O and U. And with the T3 cars today, we're going to see that STU class. It is the smaller of the new super touring classes. And basically, it's an opportunity for some of the pro classes, uh, drivers that may be able to get one of those cars and run them. Here's a look at what Touring 3 is all about. Oh, yeah, they're uh, late, mile, late model high performance sedans. Uh, really exciting cars. You, you, you kind of get the tuner following, which they've done some modifications to them, and uh, they're pretty exciting to be watching on there. They must run DOT tires and, um, yeah. Yeah, man, safety performance modifications, that's the other thing. These cars are quick, and so, you know, whatever is required for safety. You saw last year's champ, Bob Boylo, is not here, but his son is, and he's been picked by sports car. He's had a very, very good season so far in his uh, division, which is Rocky Mountain Division, where he won the championship with four wins. Uh, it's a little bit further down the qualifying order than he'd like here, and we'll certainly be getting to those grids in a moment, as I said. Then the STU class, uh, what... Uh, is the opportunity here. This is for World Challenge Touring Cars, MX-5 Cup Cars, which are much um, quicker than a Spec Miata class car, although we do have some uh, Spec Miata cars that will be running here, and the IT category cars, which is normally a regional only class, but some of them are very quick and they want an opportunity to go for a national championship, so they've given these STU and STO uh, cars and drivers an opportunity to give it a go, so we're going to see how that unfolds. 
the uh, STU class and the STO, their first real run uh, this year with everybody from around the nation coming together was, of course, the June Sprints right here at Road America. They had 19 entries in STU alone. So it's a class that everybody's going, wow, we can buy some of this really trick pro cars and be able to, to run them here in SCCA club competition, and it's proving very popular. Oh, absolutely. There's a good pool of uh, used cars available, and it's a great opportunity to get out there into some pretty good equipment at not relatively not a lot of money. Huh? <laughs> well, Obviously. yeah, all <laughs> things are relative in racing, to be sure. You can see you get some spots on one of the camera lenses there. There is the possibility of a little bit of moisture yet this morning. In theory, it's supposed to get better in terms of rain and sun as the weekend progresses, even as the day progresses here. But uh, right now, if you can tell, very overcast at this point as the field is out on its parade lap. Uh, get you through some of the grids right now to let you know who's doing what. Uh, as I said, the defending champ not here, but the 08 champion, Brett Spod, is, although he's back in the order as well. Let's go through the starting lineup and let you know who is going to be here. Sage Marie, who qualified second last year, but unfortunately ended up in the gravel trap early, is on the pole, the number four. Entry out of Huntington Beach, California. Winner in his division, the Southern Pacific Division, sponsored by Honda Performance Developments and B.F. Goodrich. Joining him in the front row will be the 07 of Chad Gilsinger out of Marysville, Ohio. And the Alpen stars from Carl Honda Sport S2000. Second row, number 87, Bill Steinhoff, will be on the inside. Finished second at the sprints earlier this season here at Road America in his Nissan 350Z. And the 34 of Kevin Fandazzi, who is in a Cobalt SS. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those. Third at the sprints this year. Row three, the number two of John Costello. Runs out of the Northeastern Division in the Race Labs entry. Uh, then also the number 74, Jim Lighthizer, out of Westminster, Colorado, in the Hoosier and Breck BMW Mini BMW Z4. In row four, seventh will be number 44, Robert Hines, in his uh, Goodyear Carbocheck Redline Nissan 350Z. He'll be joined on that fourth row by the 08 of Jeremy Lucas out of Delaware, Ohio, in a Honda Performance Development via Goodrich-sponsored Honda S2000. Row five, Frank Levinson on the Coletti Motorsports Honda and Tommy Bolo, who we said was favored here by Sports Car Magazine, but had a little issue in qualifying. It could be interesting to watch him come up through the pack. Then number 65 is Chris Sarian out of Wheat Ridge, Colorado, and the Peak Eurosport, Larry Miller VW GTI, and Brett Spotty, number 12, in the uh, Phoenix Hoosier Redline entry. And uh, he was second in 09, as well as being the champ in uh, the gold medalist in 2008. And then 13th on the grid, number 37, will be Michael Sullivan. In the STU class, as we've got a good field here, 20 of them has shown up. The pole by the, held by the guy who won the June sprints rather handily, the number three of Joel Weinberger in the Continental Audi Fall Line, Audi A4. Just a great car. He'll be joined in the front row by the 81 of Richard Cullen in the Hoosier Smart Builders Corp. Acura. Then we've got uh, second row, Phil Parlato, number 16, the Phil's Auto Body BMW, the 41 of Michael Pettiford. This, again, the STU grid that will be a split start. The Go For It Racing School's VW Jetta. Number uh, five in the qualifying order in that third row on the inside, 01, Don Istook, the Revo Technique, Stop Tech Brakes VW, and the number 33 of Greg Amy in the Acura Integra. All right, here we go. Coming up to the front straight, we'll finish that STU grid in just a moment as we are ready to go. Pace car is in. There is the launch, and oh, a problem, big problem for Joel Weinberger as that Audi just laid down when the green flag came out, and he is right now just being swarmed, and it's Richard Cullen followed by Phil Parlato who jumps into the early lead heading down into turn one, and for Joel Weinberger, who has been the pace setter all year. Oh, and Parlato, very, very loose, and also a big moment as well. Mike Petterford got crossed up off to the outside of turn number one, and uh, so issues early, and now we get the green flag for the T3 category. T3 down into the first turn. Again, Sage Marie with Chad Gilsinger on pole, but obviously, Bart, the track conditions a little bit damp out there still, and it's catching a couple of these guys out. Well, and the cold temperatures, too, are playing into it. They, It is a long lap, but it's hard to get some heat on these tires. They really have to be aggressive, and uh, it's definitely going to be slick for the first few laps. Absolutely, and we've been talking about the T3 is actually a nationally recognized class. Like we said, the STU category is the class that is being given a an exhibition of sorts here this weekend, although they've got the big numbers and the like. But the issue here is the STU cars are actually a bit faster than the T3, so that's why, as we said, it's a split start. They start those guys first. 
they're very close. So as you said, you could get some of the slower cars in STU being swarmed by the T3 cars, but the leaders generally are not going to find each other, so those class battles are going to be easy to follow. Yeah, it's really nice, too, because the spacing of the cars really helps out. Once you actually start getting to some of the back part of the other class, they're already spaced out, and hopefully they're not in their own race, because you really don't want to be interfering with their race, but generally you can work your way through and get past them, and you definitely shouldn't run into the other leaders. It does make things exciting, though, when you're in your own battle for one of the class leads and you come up on some of the guys that are a little bit behind the pace in the other class, and you've got to work through them, try not to lose that guy that you're racing. And that's where years of experience is going to play in. Uh, a lot of the champions have got a lot of track time. Uh, they're going to use some of the back markers. If you can get past someone right in the right spot, maybe you can pin your competitor behind them for a corner or two and, and get a gap. So you've got to use every opportunity that's out there. And you mentioned the tires, the cool conditions. One of the things these classes run on, it's, as we said in the description we saw with the graphic, a DOT tire. They used to shave them. Now they're actually just molded. But it, they have tread. It's not a, a, a full-out racing slick. Is that a benefit on a track that's cold like this at all and damp in spots? I, I definitely think it's a benefit. You know, you're going to be able to get some more heat into them, but they're really going to have to scuff, as you saw in the opening lap, uh, on the pace lap. They were really trying to get some heat into them. The track who got very cool last night, and the other thing is we did have some rain. So, as we'll see here in a little bit, the um, between the kink at 12 always stays damp, even though the front straightaway is drying up. And we were talking about the weather. What is supposed to happen here is once this cloud cover, this front that we're underneath, as Cullen comes by and he has opened up a significant lead. Weinberger, whatever the problem was in the early going, he found it because he is now back into second. And, I mean, he was outside of the top ten in that STU group by the time they got down into turn one handily. And he's now back in second with Parlato able to save it there in third. And Mike Pettiford, though, with that big moment when he ran off. Fortunately, and... <laughs> You're running here this weekend. You're going to be racing in, in, in Sports 2000, and I overheard you thanking some people from the track for paving the exit, the runoff curbing past the uh, gravel trap over in, in, in turn one. That really helps. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Road America's done a great job of upping their game and increasing the safety and quality of the facility. Instead of just having pea gravel, we did have an opportunity where a um, competitor dropped some oil and ended up going wide and won, and instead of getting stuck in the pea gravel, we were able to drive off the... Um, asphalted area and bring it back on track. Yep, unfortunately we do see that uh, we lost our feet and we're working on that, but uh So, excellent race going on out there. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh just having some minor technical issues here in the booth, so we're kind of dropping in and out of the feed. We'll try and get that locked up for you. But to uh, give you an idea right now, as I said, Weinberger, with that problem, I really thought that, that his race might be over because, I don't. I mean, if you missed a shift or whatever, don't do that very often, and he just stopped. But he's second. Parlato back into third. Don Istuk is fourth. Toby Grahovic, a great run early up into fifth. Then Greg Amy, then Mike Pettiford doing a nice job with the recovery. Then it is down to Fenske, Reynolds, and Quila. And then your T3 leader right now is Kevin Fandazzi. And uh, he had a great start. He had actually qualified in the fourth spot, was second in the Central Division in terms of points with a win, but he had a lot of podiums. But he's always been very quick, and he sits right now already up into that STU field handily, 11th overall in this one, leading in the T3. Steinhoff currently sits second in T3. Third in T3 is Chad Gilsinger. Those two had qualified third and second, respectively. And Sage Marie is fourth in the T3 category right now, but a number of the STU cars splitting him at this point. And that's where this is going to be interesting. You've got to work your way through all that traffic uh, to, you know, to challenge that guy in class in front of you. This multi-class racing is interesting stuff. Yeah, and like you pointed out, you know, during the season, they have raced in other classes. So it is something we're experienced with. Some of the classes at the national championships get their own race obviously a big deal, but, you know, they've been around each other, working with each other, so a lot of these guys, it's nothing new to them. Right, and obviously, yeah, as you said, if you run regionals, nationals, and SCCA, you run multi-class. We've got a good battle right now for third in the STU division.
Bill Parlato and Don Istook came by side by side, and Istook just a nose in front. So a good lap for Don Istook in that VW, pushing Phil, uh, Parlato in the BMW back into the fourth spot. And Toby Grahovic continues to set a very stout pace right now. Grahovic had qualified in the 11th spot, third in his division this year, and uh, was just back in the order a little bit. He's out of the Southwest Division now, but he. Chicago, Illinois is home. He'll always be a send guy for those of us who have been around for a while. But Toby, a great start from 11th up into that uh, top five right now in the STU category. And that's actually kind of exciting because the different brands of the cars, some cars are going to have a lot of cornering, some cars are going to have a lot more straightaways. So you really get to see great battles back and forth. They could be changing the lead three, four times. Well, and one of the things, too, Bart, about Road America that a lot of people, when you think about it, you think it's four miles long. Everybody talks about this long uphill Road America straight that goes on forever. And the Marine sweep from three to five, that's just that blast through the woods and that very fast run through the kink and the like. But the fact of the matter is, is you also have to get through corners here to be able to put together solid laps, fast laps, and some of these corners here, boy, they're gut check corners and you've got to be able to get through them. Oh, it's a great combination. High speed corners, uh, slow technical corners, compromised corners. This track really has it all. The, uh, the carousel is extremely exciting. Uh, some of these cars are pulling up over two Gs on it. It was kind of interesting to me. We were watching, uh, last year it was in the American Le Mans series race, and uh, the BMWs in that series were down on straight line speed, and everybody was kind of writing them off. And Joey Hand and Bill Alverland were going, yeah, we get through corners really well, and we stop really well, and you need to do that strongly here. They ended up 1-2 in the race. So if you, you know, I mean, obviously, it's always a compromise at Road America in terms of the setup on a car, especially when we get to the classes that have wings and the like on it about how much downforce you want versus how much drag it creates on this long track. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I Look, think the thing we'll see right now is that it's just great racing. If you get in the tight, twisty bits, basically I divide the track into half between five and Billy Mitchell bend is more of the technical part. And if you've got a well-handling car, you can really pull out and pull a gap. But then you get on both of these long straightaways, and uh, you know a lot of that can be eaten up by horsepower. So that's, I think, a lot of the battles we're seeing here. And it does make it intriguing, to be sure. And obviously, one thing where the horsepower at the end of things always pays big dividends is in traffic. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Just being able to get past someone, pull out. Um, you don't want to get stuck there. You want to clear them as quick as possible, especially if you're racing in a different class. Speaking of different classes, right now, Kevin Fendazzi is putting together a spectacular run right now in his Hoosier Carbotech Chevy Cobalt SS. As I said, he had qualified fourth in the T3 class. The entire field started behind 20 STU cars, and right now, Fendazzi is up to sixth overall, leading in the T3 category and uh, throwing down some amazing laps at this point. I mean, only Cullen and Weinberger, the two leaders in STU right now, are running faster laps, running in the 238s and 237 range for those two drivers. And uh, But Fendazzi is uh, running at 241. Some pretty amazing stuff right now. Some absolutely spectacular racing. Yeah, and it doesn't seem like that start. Weinberger, after that, started moving. And uh, really, I think that first opening lap, yeah, he had a shot of adrenaline and was really making some moves and getting past some people. Well, he just picked up the lead. Weinberger in front now has gone around Cullen and has picked that point up. So once, I mean, that Audi has been spectacularly quick every time it's taken to the track. I mean, it just sort of checked out at the June sprints. So whatever happened at the start has resolved itself. And apparently it, all that did was steal Weinberger's <laughs> determination because he has been absolutely flying right now and has picked up the lead, taken it away from Cullen. And uh, so a great comeback drive. As I said, I don't know that he was in, in the top ten by the time they got down into turn one. And they are in and working some serious traffic right now. The 0-1 of Istook and the 16 of Parlato are right in the mix at this point with some of that lap traffic and working back that section of the track. Ooh, and a bit of a moment here for the 65. Chris Sarian out of Wheat Ridge, Colorado has gotten it just a bit wrong down, uh, looked like he just lost it, maybe coming into eight. 
Yeah, a lot of the times, uh, eight's a threshold breaking corner and might have just got it a little too locked up or too much rear bias, probably just had a rotation. Looks like he kept it off the wall and can continue his fight. Had a shot there, the 44 of Rob Hines as he's working his way through that kink, that special section of track that is, I'll tell you what, it's a gut check section of track, boy, when you come out of that car Well, the carousel itself, if you're in something quick, uh, gets your attention, but, man, that kink approaches in a hurry and you don't see the exit of it. That's quite a corner. Oh, it's it's absolutely amazing. I don't know that they could build a modern day track with that kind of corner because of insurance reasons, but it really <laughs> really defines <Good> point. <laughs> defines Road America. I mean, it. I was down there doing a skip barber coaching and actually watched the kink from the outside of the car, and I was afraid I wouldn't be able to go through there again. Yeah, it's it, it is unbelievable. The commitment through there and the fast stuff is absolutely spectacular. Well, again, watching Istook and that 0-1 VW, he's got Parlato all over the back of him at this point. And, uh, oh, they're doing a great job, too, using all the track, using the rumbles. Boy, they, they just have a great battle going on. And then you've got the 84 Grohovic, and right behind him is Fandozi, who we were talking about, who has put together this amazing drive coming up through the pack. And uh, he really has joined that battle. Again, Grohovic, as I talked about, also having a very strong run after qualifying back in the 11th in the STU category in that classic BMW 325i. They are really putting the heat on right now, watching them now make that climb up into turn six. That's another thing here. You've got a fair number of corners that have that blind approach to it that you can't see, so there's a lot of commitment to it. And I don't know that there's a trickier corner technically than turn six. When you come up over that rise, the car gets light right when you need to be making your decisions on braking and everything. It's a challenge. It definitely takes some laps. And the challenging thing with Road America being a four-mile track is you don't get as many laps as you do on a Blackhawk or on some of the shorter tracks. So it takes even more time to get that corner down. And it's it's pretty exciting. If you look at the camera picture when they come up into six, you all you see is trees. So you really can't even tell where the track goes other than track experience and knowledge. Had a shot there of uh, the number 72 of Greg Ginsburg out of Arlington, Virginia. Fourth in the Northeastern Division with a couple of wins, but uh, not a lot of experience here and uh, didn't have a great qualifying session, so was down the order just a little bit. But that's one of the interesting things. You've got these great classes, uh, drivers from nine different divisions, as I talked about, that come here. You have to do well in your division to earn the invite. The only exception there is if you're a defending champion, if you're the defending gold medalist, You've got an automatic invite regardless. and uh, But otherwise, as they, as they say, you've got to get here the old-fashioned way. You've got to earn it. Oh, absolutely. And this this is a combination of a season that started. A lot of people did races in Florida in January already. So they've been working all season long to get to this point. Well, you can actually run races out of your division. There's a certain number you can count toward your points total. And uh, that's what determines your divisional status in terms of points. And that's how you get the invite and up and underneath the famous Sargento Bridge here out of turn three and that big rundown, what they call the Moraine Sweep. You see that battle between Weinberger and Cullen. And though Weinberger got by him, Cullen has not let him go. It's not like Weinberger has just been able to check out. No, absolutely not. He's uh, definitely in striking distance, and we'll see. He might be conserving tires. Uh, he's definitely driving the car, using all the track there. Going up into this turn six, you can see the sight picture is just amazing. Cullen, by the way, the last lap running three-tenths of a second faster than the leader, Weinberger. There is Don Istook as uh, he comes sweeping out. As you can see, he has had both that that cobalt of our T3 leader, Kevin Fandazzi, has gone by him. And he has also lost a spot again to, I believe, Parlato in that BMW. And that's one thing we really haven't talked about. You've got the two overall leaders right now, second place Cullen in that front drive Acura. But the guy up front, Weinberger, that's an all-wheel drive Audi. And obviously, in these cool conditions with damp spots, that's got to be a big help. Oh, absolutely. If I uh, if I had a choice, I'd probably <laughs> be going with the all-wheel drive right now, just for comfort and safety-wise. But uh, the SCCA has done a great job of equalizing these cars. If you look at all the different combinations of engines, transmissions, drive lines, uh, they've really, really done a commendable job of you can see very tight racing. Yeah, the uh, the job of the ST, uh, the SEC rules makers and the tech officials is not a job that I envy because uh, that is difficult stuff to take all of these different configurations, as you pointed out, and again generate racing like we are watching right now. And uh, Fendazi, T3 leader, the number 34 Carbotech Cobalt, all over Istook as they head down into the carousel. 
Watching this great run again up and underneath the Sargento Bridge. There now is Fendazzi with Parlato right behind him. And they have gone around Istook now, so they've got him. Istook maybe just a little bobble somewhere. So they are back around and have picked that spot up. There is Toby Grohovic just going out of your frame as they make that run down through well, what they really call it here, Kettle Bottoms, but it's uh, from the kink down into Canada Corner. For many cars, this, that's the fastest part of the track, ultimately, is the approach into Canada Corner, which is one of the tighter corners. Absolutely. If you look at the track itself, the uh, turn one, or front straightaway, is actually the longest. But you got to take into account that the carousel, you should be flat or almost flat. So really, from turn eight all the way down to turn 12, you're flat out on the gas. So if you straighten that out, even though it's not... You do get the longest straight, and that's where your highest speed will be achieved. And it is spectacular stuff back there as well. Parlato now taking another look, swinging out, trying to get back around Fandazzi. It's that close. You can see Parlato, that white BMW showing the nose, and then Fandazzi just a little bit deeper into turn one, and Parlato wisely kicking back again now. We're starting to see some raindrops on our camera lenses. So this is going to make things all the more interesting. And uh, they actually made some class adjustments uh, in the, uh, the T3 category, and certainly for Fandazi, that is helping him today. They took about 50 pounds off of the Cobalts, and they've allowed him to run a slightly larger tire. So you've got a little lighter weight, you've got a little bit more grip, and that certainly never hurts. But if we do get a little bit more of this moisture coming up, uh, that's going to certainly change things and going to really tilt the balance, as you pointed out, Bart, even more toward the front drive and certainly all-wheel drive uh, camp. Oh, absolutely. And uh... Welcome back to the 2023 Hoosier Racing Tire S SECA Super Tour. We are live from Road America. This is the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. I'm Brian Belansky. Greg Ginsburg is here with us. And uh, we've been on a slight weather delay because we had lightning in the area. And uh, we need to get our corner workers in for that. And that's why we stopped our race before lunch, because of lightning, not just because of the rain. And uh, now it's uh, gotten to the point where it's safe to get our workers back out. That means we're going racing, Greg. That is it, Brian. And we are going spec racer, Ford Racing. This is the Elite Autosport Challenge presented by Hoosier Tire, where our first place finisher, our winner today, will win $200 in cash to Hoosier Racing Tires. Uh, the Chicago Region SECA June Sprints checkered flag as well as a hat. Our second place finisher, all the same things except for that checkered flag. Also, $100 in cash, $50 in cash, and a Broico meter, $100 product gift certificate uh, for our third place finisher. And then some additional prizes, Brian. If you finish in fourth place, you come away with $600 in cash, $500 for fifth place, $400 for sixth. Uh, 300 for 7th, 8th, and ninth places are going to get $200 in cash. And if you finish either 10th, 20th, or 30th, you come away with $100. So lots of money on the line here in Spec Racer Ford. All right, so let's go and take a look at our starting grid. And this is by far our largest field of the weekend, Brian. We had 76 drivers set times. Over the last couple days, I'm going to run down the top 30. Starting 30th, driving the number 59, Spec Racer Ford from Glenville, Illinois, it's Jason Pribble. Starting 29th, driving the number 4 machine from Barnesville, Minnesota, John Jansen. James Goffrey starts 28th. He's from Jupiter, Florida, driving the 68 car. Andre Perez is going to start 27th in the 77 car. He's from Government Camp, Oregon. Cupertino, California's Bill Booth will start 26th. He's in the 157 car, starting 25th. Driving the number 70 machine from Austin, Texas, Brian Grigsby. And Breen starts 24th. He's in the 57 car. He's from Atlanta, Georgia. While Tom Burt from Woodway, Washington will start 23rd in the 45 car. Gian, uh, Giancarlo Bufamonte will start 22nd. He's in the number 95 car. He's out of Naperville, Illinois. While Matt Gray will start 21st in the 64 car. He's from Chaska, Minnesota. Justin Elder is driving the number 91 car. He's from Lakeville, Minnesota. He starts 20th with Mark Snyder in the 127. Spec Racer 4 Gen 3. He's from Joshua, Texas and will start 19th. Tyler Fox starts 18th today in the number 9 machine. He's from Kansas City, Missouri. And Umberto Maletti from San Francisco, California starts 17th in the number 34 car. Todd Harris will start 16th. He's in the 24. 
much like Taylor Harris from Portland, Oregon, who's in the 22 car, starting right next to him in 15th. Kelly Toombs will start 14th, driving the number 36 machine from Leewood, Kansas, with Liam Snyder from Joshua, Texas, starting 13th in the 128 car. Gary Glanger will start 12th, driving the number 18 machine from Dallas, Texas, with David Dickerson in the 38 machine from Wall, New Jersey, starting in 11th. Then your top 10 in the number 10 car from Bakersfield, California. It's Mike Miserandino with Brian Schofield starting 9th, driving the number 61 car from Lakeland, Florida. Jace Petty will start 8th. Jace is driving the 0-2 machine, and he's from Oakland, Illinois, while Calvin Harris, rounding out the uh, the trifecta of Harris's, will start 7th today, driving the number 44 machine. He's from Portland. Todd Vanacore starts 6th today. He's in the 119 car. He's from Ormond Beach, Florida. And then Caleb Schrader from Tiger to Oregon. He's going to start 5th in the 99 car. Grant Vogel will start 4th. Grant's driving the number 46 machine. He's from St. Louis, Missouri, with Denny Stripling starting 3rd. He's in the 141 car. He's out of McKinney, Texas. And your front row today. Starting 2nd in the number 07 machine out of Hillsborough Beach, Florida. It's Sandy Satulo and your pole sitter. Past national champion, two-time national champion, Bobby Sack out of Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, driving the number 19 car. And there you go, Brian. That is your starting grid, or a good portion of your starting grid for Spec Racer Ford Gen 3. The, the uh, pace car bringing the field now, led by Bobby Sack, through the, uh, through the kink. And uh, yesterday's winner in Spec Racer Ford, Bobby Sack, Caleb Schrader finishing second. Brian Schofield, third. Denny Stripling, fourth. Sandy Satulo finishing fifth in what was a, uh, a race shortened uh, yesterday. Fortunately, had an incident over by the kink, which uh, brought an early end to our race. Yeah. And uh, we did see some drying spots on the racetrack. But as you can see now, the rain is falling again fairly hard. And uh, any drying that we did achieve during lunch is going to probably go away pretty quickly here. Uh, the front row, I believe, is on rain tires. That and was the I word that I got. Yeah. That, uh, some of the cars further back in the field are, are rolling the dice a little bit. They're going to find very quickly that that was a bad, uh, a bad decision. Yeah. Uh, you may see some people duck on the pit road right now um, to try to get a quick tire change in case they get an early full course yellow here. Um, but uh, that's the ru the risk you run if you. Uh, uh, when you have these kind of mixed uh, mixed weather conditions here, it, so yeah, and you know, Brian, I'm looking out uh, across directly across me uh, onto the pit lane. There are a lot of teams with a lot of jacks and a lot of stacks of tires. Yep. So uh, we may indeed see some drivers come down the uh, the pit lane and take changes uh, here early on as the uh, the pace car now bringing the field. Uh, through turn 14 and onto the front straight. Again, very large field here. We'll, uh, we'll run down for you um, a little bit later who did not make the uh, make the start here. Again, we did have a little bit of attrition yesterday as the pace car now on the pit lane, turning things over to Bobby Sack in that silver and black number 19 machine. He is driver's right, Sandy Satulo, in the white 07 machine to his left. And again, Stripling and Vogel directly behind as the starter now looks over the field. And as they make their way down the Road America Strike, green flag is in the air and jumping to an early, early lead and coming right across the nose of Satulo is our pole sitter, Sack. And uh, that is going to leave Stripling and Vogel trying to uh, fight for a position as well as the field now. Starts to spread out too wide, coming down into turn number one and going defensive on the very first lap. It is Bobby Sack, but there you go. Caleb Schrader starting in fifth position. He moves up into second place, Brian, in that black and red number 99 machine. Good early start for him as uh, he now manages to get around to Sandy Satulo. We got Denny Stripling in fourth in the 141 machine. So that fifth place car making it all the way up in the second as they come out of turn three for the first time. And uh, it looks like uh, Satulo has managed to get around Schrader coming out of turn three and onto the Moraine sweep heading down into turn five. As I believe all of our drivers have made it successfully through turn three, Brian. That looks like maybe right in this area it had slowed down. But now in turn five, I see rain falling again. So uh, there's going to be different rain in different parts of the racetrack right now, which makes this a really difficult situation uh, for these drivers. Uh, it looked really wet coming through the kink. So uh, we'll keep a watch on all of this here.
as these conditions change. And I have a feeling this is going to be the kind of thing we're going to deal with for the rest of the afternoon. Yeah, likely, likely we are. I am seeing some pockets of blue sky off in the distance, Brian, but there are also a lot of pockets of very ominous looking clouds here. So it, uh, I think, again, it's something that our racers are probably going to have to worry about, uh, although as the uh, the humidity levels have gone up a bit, and it is, uh, it's, it's cooled off just a little bit, uh, about 75 to 77 degrees ambient air temperature here uh, in always humid, uh, always humid uh, Road America. <laughs> as our drivers making their way underneath the Speedville Bridge, going into the carousel here, working lap number one. And uh, now Caleb Schrader, Challenging for the lead, and actually not Caleb Schrader, but that is, uh, I believe, actually Denny Stripling challenging for the lead uh, there as they come out of the kink. And uh, it does look like that there's uh, there a lot of rain standing, but I don't know how much rain is falling here, so uh, that mode may put bode well and oh, man it's my birthday i haven't even started drinking yet so i'm not quite sure why i can't talk but uh, that that'll come later uh but anyway that might bode well for the later parts of this race if the rain has kind of slowed uh it looks like this track's gonna uh, dry really fast very quickly yeah a matter of fact during lunch brian uh, we had started to see uh, a dry line uh, appear on the front straight there was a report of standing water down at turn number five we see a driver that uh, got it a little wrong coming through 14. Uh, he's going to lose a lot of momentum going up the Road America straight as our leaders cross the start finish line to complete lap number one. And your leader is Bobby Sack. He had uh, gotten around Denny Stripling, who runs back and falls back in the second. The Caleb Schrader, Sandy Satulo, started off in the front row. He is now back and forth. Brian Schofield makes up a number of positions. Schofield started in ninth. He is now up in the fifth with Jace Petty, Todd Vanacourt, Grant Vogel, Liam Snyder, and Gary Glanger. Liam Snyder, having started in 13th position, he works his way up four positions in the ninth. And now we've got ourselves a nice line of cars here trying to decide how this track condition is going to evolve here over the next few laps. Uh, I don't imagine that that uh, straight line is going to last terribly long. Um, there are going to be some guys who like these damp conditions better than others, and uh, they're probably going to... Oh, big off there on driver's right. There's three cars involved. And if we could drop our pile on there, pile on there possibly for a second. Lots of cars there and uh, trying to get around this area. Uh, this is definitely going to cause a full course yellow here because uh, they're going to have a lot of cleanup here and um, um, and potentially even a red flag. But we'll watch to see what happens here. Uh, I see uh, a lot of cars just sitting there. Maybe they're just waiting for the pack to go by before they go. Uh, but there was debris and um, lots of stuff going on there. Yeah, and I'm trying to get some uh, some car numbers for you here, Brian. But in the meantime, we are still green around the rest of the course. And uh, it did appear as though uh, as they were coming down into turn five, Denny Stripling did manage to get back around Bobby Sack as those two drivers continue to swap positions on the straightaways. And as they come now out of the uh, out of the carousel, heading into uh, heading into the kink, Bobby Sack with a great move around Denny Stripling going into the kink. And as they come out, he is once again your leader. Moves Stripling back into second. And sitting in third is Caleb Schrader in that number 99 machine. And you can see there are a lot of, a lot of standing water offline coming through the kink that's uh, pretty critical that, uh, one, you stay off the curbing, and, two, you still stay drivers right there on exit. Still keeping an eye here. It looks like none of those cars have been able to get moving at turn five. So, uh, and now there is a rescue for our uh, truck getting onto the racetrack there as well. Um, and it's going to try to get back into that situation. Uh, so the rescue truck is blocking my view of the incident, uh, but he is moving into position to help the drivers that are down there uh, as our pack here starts coming up the hill. And uh, they've got about another 90 seconds or so uh, before the pack gets down to there. So um, we will see what the situation is here. 
All right, Brian, as they cross the stripe to complete lap number two, and again, still green flag racing around, except coming down into turn five. Sandy Satulo and Denny Stripling side by side as they cross the line, side by side as they went down into turn number one. Neither driver able to take the advantage. That has allowed our new leader, Brian Schofield, to start to slip away along with Caleb Trader. And the big surprise here, Bobby Sack, who was just a half a lap ago, was running in your lead. He is now your fifth place racer as he had some issues coming out of Canada Corner apparently and lost a bit of momentum. Sliding back in the fifth uh, just ahead of Todd Vanacore and Liam Snyder. Liam Snyder now uh, who was our 20, I believe our 2018 national champion in FE2 at, uh, uh, at Sonoma Raceway. He now moves up to seventh in spec race before Gen 3. Well, I'm happy this first pack got through there because I'm sure many of these drivers didn't see this incident because it happened behind them. Uh, the next group of drivers probably know it's there, um, and they'll have a better idea of how to negotiate this area. Um, but we got everyone going through their clean at the moment, and uh, we are continuing our racing here. And, uh, and Brian, uh, going by uh, the drivers that took the green flag and have not had, did not complete lap number two, I believe it's David Dickerson and Mark Snyder uh, who were involved in that incident. Uh, Snyder... Uh, having started in 19th position, and uh, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, sorry, and uh, David Dickerson, uh, who started off a little bit further up in the field, actually started in 11th, but uh, they are showing as only having completed one lap, currently one lap down from the rest of the field. Everybody else working lap number two looks like Kirk Collier, Calvin Harris, Kelly Toombs, Taylor and Todd Harris, Tom Burt, Brian Grigsby, and Andre Para. A lot of our West Coast contingent not taking the green flag today. Yeah, they may have seen the weather conditions and decided to start driving west um, and uh, realizing that there wasn't a whole lot that they were going to get accomplished uh, uh, for this type of situation here. Um, here comes our workers here up towards or our, our pack here up to Bill Mitchell Bend. And uh, they're showing a white flag. They're sending more emergency vehicles down to turn five. Um, and um, for that situation there. Yeah, Brian, and as they get past that emergency services vehicle, and actually, I think that, yeah, that emergency services vehicle, there is a cutoff so that they can go from turn 13 by Bill Mitchell Ben and it. cut back across to turn number five uh, as the, our leaders were coming up out of Bill Mitchell at the same time and so now completing lap number three, starting lap number four, Brian Schofield, former national champion out of Lakefield, Florida. Uh, we saw him pretty much run the table at Seabury to start off the Super Tour this year. He is your leader, Caleb Schrader, uh, locked right in behind him. Bobby Sack get, manages to get around Denny Stripling as well as Sandy Satulo. So Sack now moving back up into third position. Sack having taken his first national championship uh, here in 2020, won the following year at Indianapolis in 2021. And uh, then we've got uh, Stripling and Liam Snyder getting around Sandy Satulo. He now moves up into fifth position as James Goffrey back in 14th uh, currently has the fastest lap of the race. Yeah, and getting confirmation now from uh, the corner workers over at turn five. It is the 127 uh, machine uh, of Snyder, and it is the 38 machine of uh, Dickerson that are uh, down there at turn five. And apparently there was some contact uh, prior to those cars going off. All right, we've got 10 laps to go. Schofield, Schrader, Sack, and Stripling are your top four. Uh, those are names we talk about a lot, Greg. All right, Brian, and it looks as though, uh, as I'm watching what's uh, going on on the starter stand, I believe, and there you go, we're going to a full course caution here at Road America. And uh, it may be a question that our uh, our corner, our uh, safety workers over uh, at turn five may have, uh, may have uh, had some concerns about the speed of the drivers coming down into that zone there. And again, very difficult as the track drops away and with some damp conditions there. So uh, again, we are now going uh, with 10 laps remaining here to a full course caution. All right, tell you what, I think uh, we've got Brian uh, a replay lined up so we can uh, see exactly what happened there as, uh, as the 127 and the 38 machine came down uh, into the corner.
Here we go as our leaders come down on the braking. You can see quite a bit further back. Looks like both of those drivers have got together on the braking and uh, got into the, uh, the retaining wall there. Drivers right fairly early before they got into the corner, Brian. Yeah, th that all developed well before the corner. And I can't tell if that's a third car there or just debris from the first two a little further up track. Um, I thought for a while that might have been another car there, but now I'm thinking that might be just debris. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was a, a big hit. And then that first car closest to us um, uh, had a real strong, heavy impact into the retaining wall there. So um, uh, that was uh, – and at that point, that is maybe the fastest portion of this racetrack, Greg, uh, going down the hill into turn it, it five. It is, indeed. Uh, indeed it is, and that's where we've got our speed traps. For those of you that are uh, following along with our timing and scoring at scca.com front slash live, uh, we do have the speed trap there just before you get into the braking zone at turn five and a very quick portion of the track, uh, part of uh, uh, the end of sector one, starting sector two, uh, yeah. for again, those of you that are following along uh, with our timing and scoring system. All right, Greg, let's do a call to grid, and take our break. Perfect timing for that anyway. Uh, we'll Absolutely. get that out of the way, and hopefully when we get back, we'll be getting to green here pretty quick. All right, sounds good, Brian. Attention in the paddock, attention in the paddock. First call to the grid for race group number six, Formula F, Formula V, and Formula 600. Please start heading to the grid. Formula F, Formula V, and Formula 600. Please start heading to the grid. All right, so let's take a quick break, and uh, as Brian said, hopefully we'll be back to green flag racing when we come back. You're watching Spec Racer Ford and the 68th consecutive Chicago Region June Sprints, WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints here at the Road America. We'll be right back. Hoosier Racing Tire is proud to be the presenting sponsor of SECA's Super Tour. Hoosier's mission is to be the dominant customer-driven provider of tires to race teams domestically and internationally. Realizing Hoosier's existence and continued success is dependent upon how well we meet our customers' expectations by providing the safest, most reliable, high-quality race tires that put you in the winner's circle. For more information, see one of our trackside support personnel or the local Hoosier Tire racing dealer nearest you or contact us at HoosierTire.com. Hoosier Racing Tires, truly designed for champions. Mazza Vineyards is the exclusive sparkling wine for podium celebrations at the Hoosier Racing Tire SECA Super Tour, SECA Runoffs, and Tire Rack SECA Pro Solo. Celebrate your race weekend with Mazza Vineyards and learn more at enjoymazza.com. Tire Rack was established over 40 years ago by an SECA member with a passion to find the right tires, wheels, brakes, and suspension products for racers and enthusiasts both on the street and on the track. As official tire retailer of Sports Car Club of America since 1995 and sponsor of the Runoffs Pole Award, along with the National Solo Program, Time Trials Nationals and National Tour, and Track Night in America, Tyrac is proud to support the SCCA and its members as they go have fun with cars. For more than 100 years, Sunoco, SCCA's official fuel partner since 2001, has been fueling victories both on and off the track, which is why Sunoco has trusted to fuel over 50 series of racing, driving, and winning, including the SCCA National Championship runoffs, SCCA Pro Racing, Trans Am, NHRA, and NASCAR. To find race gas near you, visit SunocoRaceFuels.com or call Sunoco at 800-RACE-GAS. And welcome back to Road America and the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints, part of the 2023 Hoosier Racing Tire SCCA Super Tour. I'm Greg Ginsburg, along with Brian Bolanski. And Brian, as we come back to uh, as we come back now uh, to the uh, to the action, getting word that we are going to go back to green flag racing this next time by. Well, that's good news. Yeah, absolutely, and. Uh, 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 while we were at break, we had the 74 machine, Connor Sanda, uh, take to the pit lane. Uh, crew looked over the car. He's taking his car back to the paddock. It looks like things are all done there. And uh, I'm going to take a look here as uh, I believe we've got one of our, and uh, I want to thank Mike Collins uh, for sending me the information here. Uh, it looks as though we've had uh, one of our drivers make up a ton of, of positions here, and I believe uh, that that is one of the Vogels who uh, started off much further back in the pack, and I think it was John Vogel uh, in the 47 car. I'm trying to track where he is currently on track. 
but uh, he has uh, worked his way pretty quickly through the rest of the field. Uh, Grant Vogel currently sitting in 10th, but uh, and, uh, actually it's the 46 of uh, Grant Vogel sitting in 10th who started a little bit uh, further up in the field. And uh, Mike, we'll have, to, we'll have to double check and see if, uh, if the other Vogel has moved up there as well. Again, I, uh, I, I don't believe he has made up as that many positions. But uh, as the, uh, the safety car now brings the field, led by Brian Schofield with Caleb Schrader, Bobby Sack, Liam Snyder, Denny Stripling, Sandy Satulo, Todd Vanacourt, Jace Petty, Gary Glanger, and Grant Vogel, and a whole cast of characters after that. Uh, up the road, America Straight, the pace car, probably the safety car, now on the pit lane as Brian Schofield is going to be waiting for the green flag. And let's uh, jump over and take a look at that start finish line. There you go, green flag is in the air, and we are back to racing here at Road America as uh, we now have uh, turn five. It is uh, all nice and, and pretty and clear, Brian. <laughs> and that's what we like to see. Back to green flag action here. And you see some cars fanning out here uh, going into turn one. They're feeling a little bit racy. It appears uh, that we do have a, a rapidly drying racetrack at the moment. Uh, although now we have rain again in turn three, I'm seeing. Yeah, so it's timing. off and on uh, type situation. Oh, there's a car sliding, trying desperately to stay off the cement there. Good job. Now if it gets beached here, no, nope, momentum is our friend. Keep those wheels going and he will live to drive for a little while longer here. That could not have worked out better for that car. Yeah, other than great, maybe not great going timing. Yeah, in the, first, in, in the first place, but uh, that was pretty good. All and right, as they come nice now under braking, and and meanwhile, Brian down at turn five, you can see some of the blue skies yeah. there. I don't think the rain has made it down that far yet, and uh, we're not certainly not seeing the uh, the the trails of water uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and this is very typical of Wisconsin weather. If you don't yeah. like the weather right now, wait 10 minutes. That's um, right. Well, I, I, I've been telling everybody I've prepared for six different seasons this weekend. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we're, we're ready to go. That uh, that runoffs coverage that we were watching during the break from 2010, yeah. uh, we, had, we had 85 degrees one day. We had 45 uh, when that race started, and it was in the rain. It was actually like 38 or 39 degrees outside. So, I mean, we had it all that weekend. I'm, I'm definitely uh, prepared for it. As you can see, a lot more rain now through the hurry downs going into turn number eight. That, that turn five might be the only place that it isn't raining here. Yeah, I was just told that there's heavy rain on the front straight, Greg. You're looking at it. Is it coming down hard there? Uh, it is actually, yes, starting to come down fairly hard. It actually just started uh, here on the front straight. And uh, although I should say that our, our folks on the starter bridge, they are very, very well dressed for the situation currently. <laughs> well, we do know how to, how to dress for inclement weather in Wisconsin. That is one thing we are really good at. All right. Let's take a look here. Now, as uh, our field continuing to uh, go through and uh, looks as though, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it isn't raining in, uh, in the kink, but it certainly is coming up through Bill Mitchell Bend. Uh, now and uh, pretty darn clear that, and it's maybe not, not clear. clear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and you, and you can see a little, uh, starting to see some standing water there. And you know when we're starting to uh, wow, and a big wiggle coming out of 14 by Brian Schofield as uh, Schofield and Caleb Schrader starting to separate themselves out though now from the rest of the field as they come across uh, the start finish line about four car lengths up on Bobby Sack in the number 19 machine and. Uh, you know, Brian, earlier uh, earlier in the weekend, this was one of those classes where our drivers are running underneath the track record. We saw a track record set in, uh, in Spec Miata. Not all that likely that that's going to happen today in the new pavement. Going to have to wait yeah. for another year. Well, there's a puddle right there on the, off, on the driver's left here um, off of the track in turn one, and that's what I've been using to determine how bad it was raining. And I'm going to say right now, it's raining. That's, uh, we, may, we may see some ducks and uh, coming down the pit lane now, the number 11 machine. Uh, looks like either he's had enough or he's had enough of the tires that he's got on the car. Uh, and not the 111, that's Jisoo Kim, but the 11 has now dropped back. Now, we, you know, it's funny, Brian, we were talking about this at Button Willow when it was pouring down rain as the 68 machine now on the pit lane as well. Uh, the uh, uh, One of our drivers, driver of the number 8 machine, Ben Pigeon, uh, who, who yes. I believe owns a book, the one of the book companies that is a sponsor of the SCCA. He must be loving this weather. Yeah, very much so. 
Uh, we've seen a couple of ca cars coming down pit lane. Uh, it might be one or two considerations. One, they're in the back of an 80 car field and, and don't want to run the risk of wrecking a race car. Or two, oh, speaking of wrecking a race car, right in front of us, car heavy, heavy impact into the wall there. Um, shot across the racetrack. I don't know if they dropped the wheel on driver's left and just when they came back on, it spun them around. But wow, what an impact there on that cement. Yeah, and and that sounds like. Let me try. Yeah, let me see if I can get the number. It sounded like uh, it was the '91 machine that went off. The original call was the '11 of Johnny Moreggi, but it sounds like it was the '91 that m machine that went off. Uh, that is Justin Elder uh, out of Lakeville, Minnesota. Also, Brian should note. Uh, and I did not see when this happened, but running very far back in the field right now, showing as being 44th, is Denny Stripling, uh, who had started off in row number two. And uh, I am now showing him down towards the tail end of the field as Liam Snyder has now worked his way up in the fourth position uh, with just behind Bobby Sack, Hale Trader, and Brian Schofield. And it sounds like we've got a car off at of turn five also. Yeah, here that car has damage also. Yeah, quite a bit there uh, off the track. And, you know, it must be somewhat humiliating when you watch the emergency services vehicles go somewhere else. The car is going around now over at turn number 14. And I'll see if I can get the numbers of turn 5 and 14 from the race net. But as you can probably imagine, it's starting to get a little hectic. Yeah. And that car is just off the pavement, so they've got a, a local caution over at turn 14, and they're asking to get that car moved soon. I, I, Brian, given the number of incidents that we have around the track right now, right? It, I, again, I'm not, I'm not going to. Uh, well, the car in 14 looks like it's going to take care of itself. As he yeah, it looks like it backed up, and now. yeah, right, he's so just waiting will, for uh, time to. All right, All right and over at turn five, let's take a look, Brian. I think we've got a replay here yep. of that car that went around. Let's take a look. Two separate incidents. So there's the first spin. That was a nice little lazy spin and continue. And then here comes the second one right here, and he's going to, I think, hit the wall. Yep, hit the wall. Oh, that could have been worse. Um, it looks like the front right wheel is going to probably be bent on that car or a suspension problem. But uh, uh, And look, at right there, drove right up to the emergency services vehicles. And so. then, and then the emergency services vehicle drove right on by and left the scene, yeah. uh, because they were going to respond to this car yeah. here up by turn, uh, up out of uh, out of turn six, going into turn number seven. As we now have Brian, uh, just uh, about I believe six laps remaining, and uh, again Schofield Sack now gets around Caleb Schrader. Uh, as they're now coming underneath the Speedville Bridge. And there you go, Brian Schofield in the blue and uh, blue and white machine, then Bobby Sack in the black and silver, then Caleb Schrader in the red and black, the 99 machine running in third. And not all that far behind is, uh, is right now the 128 machine of Liam Snyder. Now, uh, Liam's brother, Mark, was involved in that, uh, that lap one incident, uh, probably lap two incident over at turn five. Uh, but Liam, who started off in 13th position, now finds himself just out of the podium paying positions. Yeah, and we still have six laps to go here, or five and a half laps to go, and uh, that is still a lot of racing here, especially with the conditions. Uh, a lot can happen with what's going on here. Again, in some areas it looks like the rain has eased up, uh, and in other areas it has not. So it's just really, really tricky conditions uh, for everybody involved, and even where it has stopped raining, uh, there's still a lot of uh, water, but you can see a clear dry line forming here, uh, which is fine until you go off that drive. Oh, a big wiggle there. Look at that. Yep. And that's the second time that the uh, Schofield has had the rear end of a uh, rear end of his machine walk around coming through 14. And, you know, this is one of those deals you never really know uh, what the, what kind of effect you're going to get going over those painted curbs as we've got another car now that has gone around. This is over at turn eight coming out of the hurry downs heading towards the carousel. Which, and it is, I believe, the three zero machine as we now have a battle for the lead going into turn one, Brian. Side by side, Schofield and our pole sitter, Bobby Sack, have now, uh, Sack has now worked his way back up 
towards the front of the pack. And as they come down into turn three, it is still Brian Schofield uh, who manages to hold off Bobby Sachs for at least two turns. And Caleb Schrader then is allowed to, uh, to close up. And he's now right behind those three cars sitting in fourth position is now, and here's the big surprise for me, Gary Glanger, who started off in 12th position. He works his way around Liam Snyder and Sadie Satulo. He has slowly but surely worked his way up into that lead pack. And uh, a big shout out to Jason Gribble. He's worked his way up into ninth position through all of this. And uh, he was uh, one 30th. of the folks. That, yeah, I mean, that is a big, big move for him. So now we've got incidents working here between six and seven and in turn five. And uh, they're still working on this car here. This was the car with the heavier impact here. Um, and uh, we're waiting on them to get that cleaned up here. And uh, and I'm seeing debris flag now coming out of hurry downs. I'm not sure if that's for a puddle or, or standing water on the racetrack or what the situation is there. Uh, it's also possible that somebody sucked up some mud by going off here and brought that on the right. racetrack. If so you yeah, had that's what I was thinking, Brian, is when we, yeah. when we had those cars go off to the inside over yeah. uh, over at that corner that maybe they dragged something back on as they, uh, they recovered. Now as uh, Schofield starting to open up a little bit of an advantage uh, going down into the king. So I'm getting questions in the, uh, in the uh, chat about the new racing surface and how it's handling the rain. Uh, we'll get some reports from the drivers. We just don't know because I believe this is the first SCCA race in the rain here. Uh, but I can tell you, it certainly looks like it's draining really well. Yeah. Uh, I don't see a ton of standing water or any issues with that. So um, from that standpoint, I think we can report that the paving has worked. Uh, but also with all new paves, um, you know, the first couple of times it rains, you get some weird stuff that comes out out of the pavement. Right. Uh, depending on how the, the compound that was used for the paving um, so how it handles in the rain today might be a different a year from now um, after they've had a couple of rainstorms on this thing. Yeah, and in talking to some of the local staff here, they have not had a, a significant rain here at Road America uh, since late April, early May. Uh, so, uh, you know, just about the time when Road America was having its first events here at the track. Of course, this is the very first SCCA event on the new track surface. As our leaders now coming down into one with Schofield sack and then Caleb Schrader locked nose to tail, Brian, as we have now four laps remaining. Uh, they have continued now to open up a bit of a gap back to Gary Glanger. Uh, Glanger in that, uh, that silver and blue striped machine uh, sitting in a nice little pocket right now with Liam Snyder and Sandy Satulo sitting fifth and sixth currently as they all come out of turn number three heading onto the front straight a little bit further back from that, uh, that orange and black machine of Snyder. And uh, Satulo, Mike Miserandino, has now worked himself up in the seventh. Uh, the number 10 car uh, found himself in the gravel trap at one at the end of yesterday's race. So he's looking for a little redemption. Again, uh, Miserandino, multi-time national champion and has the distinction of being the very last Gen 2 Spec Racer Ford national champion, having won that at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, a little bit further back, great battle going on uh, here. And uh, it is... Uh, uh, and this is the battle for 26. Jace Petty, Russell King, Scott Park, Jay Rosenthal uh, all came across the line uh, two by two, all within like a couple millimeters of one another. So uh, great battling all the way through the pack here in Spec Racer Ford. Yeah, this would be a good time for uh, do another quick call of the grid here before we get into the final minutes of this race. All right, let's do that, Brian. Attention in the paddock, second call to the grid for Formula F, Formula V, and Formula 600. Race Group 6 drivers, please head to the grid. Your race is next. Race Group 6 to the grid, please. And real quick, I also want to give an update from uh, Tabor Racing. Henry Tabor was hit uh, part of a uh, crash yesterday here uh, in the uh, in the kink, and uh, he was taken to the hospital um, with some injuries, and his family put out a post today on social media uh, he's got some surgeries tomorrow. Apparently, the coolant uh, came, hot coolant came into the cockpit, um, mm. and he suffered some burns from that. And he also has uh, a fracture in his neck near his skull. Uh, but uh, a little further down the post, it says uh, they expect a full recovery, and they suspect that he'll be uh, out there racing again at some point. And uh, he doesn't remember much, but as soon as he uh, regained consciousness, his first question was, were his teammates okay, and how's the car? So that's a good sign. 
All right, Brian, so the local caution at turn five has now been withdrawn as uh, that orange uh, spec racer Ford has been removed. And it uh, looks like we've got a car that's the 157 machine okay. there <laughs> right at turn number eight. Uh, has gone around and uh, he is sitting he's sitting just off the track surface. Yeah. There's that extended uh, extended apron there it, on the edge of the track. At first class, I glance, I thought he was right in the middle of the racetrack. Uh, but then when I saw those two cars get by without me, I'm like, okay, maybe he's just off the track. Yeah, uh, it gets it gets very wide over there. As a matter of fact, I, re I remember back to the, the 2010 uh, runoffs, uh, Formula V had a number of drivers go off track there uh, and plant themselves on the side of the surface, actually got high sighted on the back end of that uh, uh, of that area, and uh, the race was able to continue on. It was a very, very interesting. It's amazing how many Formula Vs you can fit in that small area. As yeah. a, a great fight now uh, here, Brian, and this appears to be uh, the battle, I think, for fourth position. As Sandy Satulo has gotten up to Gary Glanger, the 07 and the 18 machine uh, that uh, Satulo has separated himself out from Gabe Snyder as they come now down into turn five, and they were side-by-side -side coming out of three. They're side-by-side -side coming out of five, and I believe now that uh, perhaps Sandy Satulo has gotten back around Gary Glanger for fourth, but that's also allowed Liam Snyder to get back into this fight. And I will tell you, back to the rain in this racetrack, you know, it's, you know, as much of rain as we've had, it, is, is, it, it does not take long, apparently, uh, for a pretty significant dry line to form. So uh, that's certainly positive from what I can tell. Yeah, indeed, the, uh, the track surface and... Uh uh, again, I'm, I'm fairly certain, uh, you know, given given the pace that these drivers have taken with a lot of standing water, uh, are probably all on the uh, the Hoosier rain tires, the Hoosier HTOs, which right. are so many drivers just say that they're magic, um, but they and they can definitely evacuate some water. But you're right, it hasn't taken a long time uh, to at least create a, a somewhat dry line uh, here at the track, and I, I'm sure the the fairly warm with the warm-ish temperatures here at the track have certainly right. contributed to that. But you can even see now as they're coming down into the kink yeah. uh, here, uh, that dry line that's starting to appear. Well, and let's not also forget that there's probably 70 cars on the racetrack right yes. now, uh, which also helps get things dry as quick as possible. So, um, but with that said, with 70 cars on the racetrack, we should uh, do a little tiny round of applause uh, because these guys have all done, we've had a couple of incidents, um, but for the most part, they've all done a really nice job of handling these ever-changing conditions. All right, Brian, as our leaders now coming out of turn 14, Schofield now opening up probably the, la the biggest lead he's had uh, over the course of this race, about six car lengths uh, over, and actually as they cross the stripe, it is Schofield, then Bobby Sack, and Sack has Caleb Schrader for a moment. We are uh, we are actually showing Sack as our leader. Sandy Satulo and then Liam Snyder and both of those drivers have managed to get by Gary Glanger, who uh, last time we saw coming uh, in the sixth was uh, was our fourth place runner. He's now back in sixth position. Then Vanacore Mizzardino, Pribble in ninth, and uh, Grant Vogel. Uh, standing in 10th position currently as they roll down the hill and uh, there's a uh, there's some slower traffic that they're coming up on but uh, th from the pace that they're carrying Brian it looks at least for our leaders for Schofield Sack and Schrader they should probably get to him on the straight and there you go that uh, that slower car pulling all the way over drivers right getting out of the throttle uh, to allow our uh, our front running cars uh, to go by. Here comes our leaders now into turn five again, and uh, still is with two laps to go, or uh, a little two and a half laps to go. Uh, lots of time for that all, all of that to change here, and uh, you've got three pretty stout drivers up racing for the lead here uh, with Schofield and Sack and Schrader. And should mention a little bit, a little bit further back. Um, you know, we're also looking at this battle with uh, with Vanacore Miserandino, who's in the white, uh, with red number number ten, as well as Jason Pribble. Uh, battle for seventh, eighth, and ninth. Uh, they haven't given up that fight yet either. As we've got two laps to go, next time our leaders come by, Brian, uh, they will be getting the white flag here in this 13 lap Spec Racer Ford, the Elite Autosport Challenge by Hoosier Racing Tire Race. And a uh, great, great fight so far as they're coming now into the kink. And, uh, uh, you know, just when he needed to open up the gap, 
Uh, about a lap and a half ago, Brian Schofield uh, seemed to find uh, some speed that our second and third place racers have. You can see a lot of the drivers trying to stay off those curbs. That is one thing in the rain. Uh, anything that's painted can be really, really slippery. Uh, so you have to kind of try to re rework your lines in some cases and stay off anything painted. And especially brand new paint like is on those curbs. That even is more slippery than other things. So. Yeah, and, and uh, of course, uh, or not of course, but uh, producer Brendan was telling us the other day that most of the curbing here was replaced uh, as part of the repave as they went all the way down to the uh, to the bed. And uh, uh, yeah, I'd be very concerned about that paint, brand new paint on the curbing might be very slick as our leaders come up to the start finish stand. We are starting the last lap. White flag is in the air with Brian Schofield, your your leader. Bobby Sack has just run the fastest lap of the race. He was about a, about a tenth, a tenth and a half faster than Schofield. And you can see here, Brian, at the end of the front straight, Bobby Sack and Caleb Schrader, they've been able to draft right back up to Schofield. So the, uh, you know, the, the four, five, six car length advantage that Schofield had had, it is now gone. And Bobby Sack is if he was shot out of a cannon here on the last lap. He runs wide. He runs into the dirt. And that is going to move Caleb Schrader up in the second. So, you know, you get shot out of a cannon. Sometimes you, you don't land where you want to land, Brian. <laughs> and, uh, and Bobby Sack goes into the uh, the grass there on the exit of three. It could have been a lot worse for him. But uh, that is now going to give a little bit of clearance to Schofield. And it's going to allow Schrader to move up into second. And, you know, and we've been talking, Brian, here as we're on the last lap about how, the, you know, that dry line has appeared. The question is going to be is how well can you break on the wet line uh, here, because I think, you know, much like when we were talking to right. Johan uh, Schwartz during the Spec Miata race, uh, you know, it, it's probably all going to come down to the braking into Canada Corner. And uh, Caleb Schrader, if he's close enough, he, he might find that uh, it's a bit challenging to get that car woed down from right. a part on the track where nobody's raced yet today. Well, and the other option is to get a really, really good run coming out of 14 and be as close as you possibly can going up the hill and then pop out right before the start-finish line. Although at the moment, I do not think Caleb Schrader is close enough to make that happen, but a lot can happen here in the last few laps, or last few corners here. Uh, but still, right now, it looks like Schofield's opened up a six or seven car length lead here, and uh, that's going to be hard to make up here in the last three or four corners. Yeah, and we can see Sack uh, losing so much momentum. He falls back now into sixth position, uh, back behind Sandy Satulo and Gary Glanger. Uh, as our leaders are making their run down into Canada Corner over at turn number 12. And uh, we're going to catch them as they come up the hill through Bill Mitchell Bend. And here they come now. It is Sandy Satu oh, yeah. uh, Brian Schofield now with Look Caleb Schrader. Schrader's Tr closed things down. He's been within a half a car length now as they come up and make the run to turn 14. The final corner here at Road America. And Schrader's right up to the back of the car. He's going to pull out early, Brian, and he's going to try to drag race Schofield all the way up the hill. No, he pokes in behind. And as they come down the front straight, coming into our view now, and coming across the line, taking the win, Brian Schofield, Cale Trader, he's going to finish second. Liam Snyder finishes third. Gary Glanger will come home in fourth. He runs the fastest lap of the race on the very last lap. Sandy Satulo finished fifth. Bobby Sack finishes all the way back in sixth position. Mike Mizzardino will finish seventh. Jason Pribble will finish eighth. Todd Vanacorn ninth. Grant Vogel will round out the top ten. All right, well, that was a heck of a finish. <laughs> oh, my, oh, my. Yes, it was. And uh, I just got a text message from my good friend Brad Davis. He kind of liked the line about uh, being shot out of a cannon. Uh, <laughs> Real quick, uh, an update. Uh, car number 91, uh, Justin Elder, that was the car with the hard impact to turn six. Yeah. Uh, he is making a quick visit to medical. Hopefully it's just for a quick checkout and then release. Um, but uh, that was a pretty hard shot that he had there. Yeah, definitely, Brian. All right. So in the Elite Auto Sport Challenge presented by Hoosier Tire, uh, winning uh, today and uh, getting $200 cash and two tires from Hoosier Racing Tire as well as the checkered flag and a June Sprints hat is Brian Schofield finishing second, taking home $100 cash and a Hoosier Racing Tire 
is Caleb Schrader, along with that June Sprints hat. And then finishing in third, Liam Snyder uh, with $50 cash, a $100 product certificate from Breakometer, as well as the June Sprints hat. And then we've got finishing fourth, Gary Glanger going home with $600 cash. Finishing in fifth, Sandy Satulo with $500. Finishing sixth, Bobby Sack. Sure, it's not what he wanted, but uh, it's going to be $400 in cash to Bobby Sack. Finishing seventh with $300 to take home, Mike Miserandino. Eighth and ninth places, that's Jason Pribble and Todd Vanacore. They're going to take home $200 cash prize. Finishing tenth is Grant Vogel. He takes home $100. Finishing 20th, Dwight Ryder. Congratulations, Dwight, $100 in cash. And finishing in 30th position, Jisoo Kim. And again, these are unofficial. <laughs> Let me exactly. just say that, <laughs> and and I don't have what the do money mean? in my pocket. If you don't what? win, you're not going to collect for me. But uh, the what, what, what are you implying, Greg? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm just a poor announcer. <laughs> I'm just a poor announcer. But uh, that I that is going to wrap up the auto the Elite Auto Sport Challenge presented by Hoosier Tire. Brian, let's make a final call to the grid for our next race. Attention in the paddock, attention in the paddock, final call to the grid for race group number six, Formula F, Formula V, and Formula 600. Please head to the grid now. Your race is next. Final call for race group six, Formula F, Formula V, and Formula 600. Please head to the grid. All right, so let's take a quick break, Brian. And uh, when we come back, more racing here from the National Wet Park of Speed, Road America, for the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago region June sprints. Thank God for WeatherTech on a weekend like this. We'll be right back. Aaron's 
Welcome back, everybody, to, uh, what did we call this? The, uh, the the National Water Park of Speed, Road America. <laughs> <laughs> the National Park of Speed, Road America, uh, here for the 68th consecutive running of the WeatherTech Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints. I'm Greg Ginsburg, along with Brian Volansky, and, I, and I've got to thank uh, Brenda Kesmer, our producer, for that one. And uh, now all I can think of is uh, big, uh, big uh, water slides down by turn five. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> then he says the kink has a long blue. All right, so uh, we've got our racers from Formula F, Formula V, and Formula 600, Brian, heading onto the track for their pace lap, for the pace lap of the Breakometer Challenge, where our first place winners in each class uh, will win $200 in cash, two uh, certificates for two tires from Hoosier Racing Tire, the Chicago Region June Sprints checkered flag, and his 
well as that June Sprint's hat. Second place will take home $100 cash and a certificate for one tire from Hoosier Racing Tire, as well as a June Sprint's hat. And our third place finisher, $50 cash, a Breakometer $100 product certificate, as well as the highly coveted June Sprint's hat. Let's run down the starting grid. We had 23 drivers set time in Formula 600 and Formula F. They're gonna be behind the pace car, and then a little bit further back, we're gonna have our Formula Vs, in which there were 16 drivers that have set times. Starting 23rd, driving the number 61, Formula 600 Wildcat, it is David Brown. Starting 22nd in the number 67, Scorpion, Jack Walburn, Ethan Alexander will start start 21st. He's in the number 30, Red Devil. That's a number, another Formula 600 car. And then Dan Greening, starting 20th. He's in the 03 Formula 600, also a Red Devil. Then in Formula F, Keith Hall, he's starting 19th, driving the number 18, Piper. While Robert Gross will start 18th on the field, driving the number 62, Formula F, Piper as well. Then Cameron Reed, driving the 09, say it to everybody, Piper. Uh, she's from Youngsville, Louisiana. And then starting 16th today, driving the number 83, Formula F, Miguel, it is Ken Bukillian. Demetrius Kostandidis will start 15th. He's in the number 33 Van Diemen with George Bug in Formula 600. He is starting 14th, driving the number 86 Nova Car. Then we got David Adorno. He's starting 13th on the field in the number 84 Miguel. He's out of Woodhaven, New York. Cliff Johnson starts 12th. He's in the number 4 Piper, while Tazio Stafanelli will start 11th. He's in the number 23, uh, number 23 Formula F Piper. Then we've got another Formula 600 driver. It's Jeff Jorgensen. He starts 10th today. He's in the 06 Maverick, starting 9th. Calvin Cotts, he's in the, uh, the, the bright silver, number 88 Formula F Piper. Then we've got Calvin Cotts. He is starting 9th. Uh, pardon me, Calvin Cotts in the, uh, the number 88 machine. I just said that, didn't I? So, uh, Mateo Naranjo is going to start eighth today. He's in the number 80. Miguel is out of Edwards, Illinois. Then we've got Zach Rivard. He's starting seventh. He's in the 77 Van Diemen. And then Keith Jocelyn running in Formula 600. As all of our remaining drivers are, he is in a Rotax-powered Scorpion starting sixth today in the 55 car. Then we've got Stephen Jondahl starting fifth. He's driving the number 38 Red Devil. While Stephen Thompson will start fourth. He's driving the number 17 Nova car. Then we've got James Guida. James is driving the number 22 Scorpion with Aaron Ellis running the number 43 Ellis AE16. And I'm sure that AE stands for Aaron Ellis. And your pole sitter today with a qualifying time of 218.522 driving a Nova Car F600. It's Calvin Stewart. Now in Formula V, we had 16 drivers who set times over the weekend. One of them, I believe, is in the chat with us and not on track. That would be Jay Messenger. Uh, glad to have Jay uh, here with us today. Uh, he had a pretty pretty nasty wreck uh, during the test day, and uh, glad to see him A-OK. -okay. Uh, Jay was scheduled to start 16th in his Van Diemen. Uh, probably, no, that wouldn't be a Van Diemen, would it be? Uh, that would be a Formula F machine. I'm sorry. Scoop Havey will start 15th, driving the number 64 Formula V protoform. Uh, Michael Nitz in his Mysterian scheduled to start 14th. That's a 94 car. Connor Lofed in the number 48 machine of Vortex scheduled to start 13th. Starting 12th, driving the number 74 Caracol. It is Stuart Delaney with Joseph Bertolucci in a citation starting 11th in the 31 car. Rich Richardson will start 10th. He's driving the number 99 Laser with Chris Jenner. John driving a Vortex. That's the number 46 car, starting ninth, starting eighth. In the 08 Vortec, it's Jeff Lofed with William Stazinski starting in seventh position. William is driving the number 21 Vortec. Steve Whitston will start sixth in the 118 Protoform with Alexander Bertolucci starting fifth in the 181 Citation. Then we've got Ron Whitston also in a Protoform. He starts fourth in the number five machine with Graham Lofed starting third in the number 35 Vortec. And then your front row starting in second with the number 27 Protoform from Austin, Texas. It's Zach Whitston and your pole sitter driving the number 12 protoform from Neenaw, Wisconsin with a qualifying time of 241.594, Andrew Whitston. All right, here comes our first pack with the second pack very close behind. Uh, coming up the hill here, there goes our pace car on pit lane. And uh, they will now move up the hill towards a potential green flag. Very much kind of half throw it. Uh, <laughs> 
these splits start to make things kind of interesting here. Seeing our starters there, the green flag is in the air. Here they go, down towards the uh, first corner. Now already three wide. Orange car on the outside, not sure what number, already going from row three or four up to row two. Yeah, and I believe that was Stephen Thompson in the 17 machine. Brian coming in underneath, trying to uh, the slot pass. We'll take a look here in just a moment. Second place. Yeah, moving all the way up to the second place. Uh, we, I think, slotting into fourth then. Uh, Calvin Stewart and Aaron Ellis up towards the front of the field. As our Formula Bs, you mentioned, not much of a gap. Uh, that gap, I think, naturally is going to appear here in just sure. a moment as the, uh, the Vs start to roll down uh, the hill towards turn number three. And uh, your leaders, it is, uh, for the moment, Andrew Whitston in that red and, uh, red and white number 12 machine with uh, his brother, Zach Whitston, currently running in second in the yellow and blue. Another yellow and blue car, I believe that's Graham Lovett right behind with Ron Whitson and Alexander Bertolucci as they just come out of turn three. And uh, our leaders now in Formula 600 and Formula F starting to make their way up the hill now in Formula 600, Brian, we had a great race earlier on, uh, early on between Aaron Ellis and James Wieda uh, before I believe, I believe we had Wieda pretty much uh, jump to a, a pretty good uh, finish there uh, and uh, Aaron Ellis and Stephen Thompson, but the big, the, the missing link was Calvin Stewart yesterday in the 07 machine as he celebrated the Sabbath was not out on track as we've got a, a car that is uh, off pace now uh, spun over by turn six and uh, just getting back underway. Yeah, and um, what's interesting here, Greg, is we've got a lot of cars on different tire strategies here. Some guys went out on rains, some guys went out on wets, and I think that's going to really play into some interesting racing here, uh, especially if it stays dry. Obviously, the dry tire guys are going to be smart. But if we get that back and forth between the two weather conditions like we've had for the last couple of races, uh, that's all going to play into a very interesting dynamic here. All right, as our racers, and, you know, we were watching that Spec Racer Ford race a little while ago and said, hey, nobody's gone through that uh, that big puddle coming through the kink. Well, uh, well now they have as they went too wide. And we're going to see one of our Formula Vs, uh, very far driver's right, coming out of the kink. Might have had some issues going into the corner there and uh, now gets the car gathered up as they make the run down to uh, Canada Corner. But uh, uh, here are leaders in Formula 600 and Formula F coming up through the Bill Mitchell Bend. And uh, we will uh, see who our leaders are as they come out of turn 14 and up the front straight. And, uh, you know, Brian, just in the last couple of moments, we have had a very, and, you know, I, I always say that there's a dark cloud that follows me around everywhere, but the, a very dark cloud right over the front straight here at Road America as uh, our leaders now crossing the straight for the, uh, crossing the straight for the first time. It's James Wieda, your leader, with Stephen Jondal, uh, who has made a number of positions up. He started fifth. He has now worked his way up in the second position. And then we've got the battle for the lead in Formula F. We've got the two of our Pelfrey cars, David Adorno in the number 84 machine. I believe that's the black car, the 84. And then Sebastian Naranjo in the yellow number 80 machine. And uh, the next driver in line uh, in Formula F is Zach Rivard, who was our uh, Formula F pole sitter. He's got a couple of Formula 600 machines that he's got to work around to get up to that battle for the lead in class. Went back up to see what tire strategy um, the 22 car was on. Um, if that was one of the folks that I'd gotten a report on, and it is not one of the cars I was receiving a report on. So um, I'm going to guess that that car might be on dry tires. Oh, yep, yeah, there was some contact right there, and it looks like there's going to be a broken uh, suspension on that car, possibly. And uh, which means uh, something, someone's going to have to go and hook that to get it out of there. Yeah, and that is the 77 machine, Brian, of Zach Rivard, who is uh, off in the uh, off behind the uh, behind the, uh, the the lip there. And uh, the call is to uh, to get the emergency services teams to move that car. Thankfully, well, I was going to say thankfully it's not that far to move it, but given the uh, the broken suspension, it it may be a little bit more difficult. Uh, uh, situation there to get that car out. You can see now, uh, well, we'll see in, a, in just a moment. Uh, we're going to have some emergency services teams responding from that cutoff right at turn five, and there they are already on the scene. Yeah, there is, as you said, right there, there's a, uh, a track truck ready to come and give help. So that's if you're going to go and have an issue, that's a really good place to do it. 
Uh, oh, really wet here. Lots of standing, not standing water, but rain on the racetrack. You can see the spray coming up uh, from those tires. And uh, so, like I said, got different conditions in different parts of the racetrack, and uh, some folks are going to handle that better than others. All right. So uh, uh, now making the run and uh, checking, taking a look here, Brian, it appears uh, the following drivers did not take the green flag today. We talked about Calvin Stewart, and I said, oh, hey, well, you know, he celebrates Sabbath. He wasn't racing yesterday. He'd be here today. And, uh, well, no, Calvin Stewart did not take the start. Jeff Jorgensen, who had some issues with the number six machine, his Maverick yesterday did not take the green flag today, nor did uh, George Bug or Jack Walburn. Those all Formula 600 drivers uh, in uh, Formula F, Keith Hall, uh, did not take the green flag, nor did Jay Messenger, Jay uh, here in the chat with us here today. And in Formula V, uh, of the uh, the 15 drivers, Jeff Lawford, the only driver that did not take the green. Greg, these are just brutal conditions, not because there's a lot of rain, just because it's so off and on, and in one lap it's here, and one lap it's not. and It's really, really hard to make plans for what you want to do here. Yep, and, uh, oh, and Brian, it looks like we have another driver that may be off that uh, had impact with a wall, and I believe it was the 22 machine, and I'm trying to pick up uh, the corner that he is at. Well, the 22 machine that would be, be our race leader, Wida. Yeah, well, we're going we're gonna to see if that's the case. No, I actually, and I don't think that is the case, Brian. Okay. I, I, don't think, I don't think it's Wida, yeah. I'm looking at our cameras here, and I don't see... And the, what that was is they were looking for our leader to try and pick oh. him up, and because we're going to a full course caution, okay, and uh, they, that's that that was the call. So I, I'll okay. try and get the uh, the call on that other car. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, it it <laughs> certainly does. Yeah, uh, we're now under full course caution uh, here at Road America. When you have Brian, when you've got like three different calls coming in in, in pretty quick succession, a little a uh, little difficult to pick that up. So uh, hopefully we'll. Oh, and actually, the there is, the yeah, there's the car right there by the kink. Yeah. All right, let's take this opportunity with a full course yellow gray to do a call to grid and take our break. And uh, when we come back, hopefully the cleanups will be done and we can go back to racing. That sounds good, Brian. Let's do it. Attention in the paddock. First call to the grid for race group number seven, Formula Enterprises 2, Prototype 1 and Prototype 2. Please head to the grid, race group seven. FE2, P1, P2 drivers, please start heading to the grid. All right, so we'll be back in just a few moments. Going to thank some of our partners and sponsors that are bringing you all the action here this weekend from Road America, the National Park of Speed, for the 68th consecutive running of the WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. We'll be right back. Haggerty is the official and exclusive insurance partner for the Sports Car Club of America. Haggerty provides affordable off-track insurance protection for motorsports vehicles while in the paddock, in transit, in storage, and at the shop. They provide guaranteed value coverage and even have protection for your trailers. SCCA members can save 5% on insurance through Haggerty. Learn more at Haggerty.com. Haggerty, let's drive together. Tire Rack was established over 40 years ago by an SCCA member with a passion to find the right tires, wheels, brakes, and suspension products for racers and enthusiasts both on the street and on the track. As official tire retailer of Sports Car Club of America since 1995 and sponsor of the Runoff's Pole Award, along with the National Solo Program, Time Trials Nationals and National Tour, and Track Night in America, Tire Rack is proud to support the SCCA and its members as they go have fun with cars. For over 25 years, championship-winning drivers and teams have demanded Hawk Performance Motorsports brake pads. Now you can have their advanced technology on your daily car, truck, or SUV with Hawk Performance Street products. With the improved HP Plus pad for that hybrid street and track feel, or Super Duty pads for tow vehicles, their all-new ER1 brake pad designed to take on even the longest race, and their all-new high-performance brake fluid, Hawk has all of your braking needs covered. Visit hawkperformance.com and like them on Facebook or Instagram to learn more about the Hawk Performance Advantage. Hawk Performance, what's stopping you? Winning takes work. Getting parts is easy. SummitRacing.com. For more than 100 years, Sunoco, SCCA's official fuel partner since 2001, has been fueling victories both on and off the track, which is why Sunoco has trusted to fuel over 50 series of racing, driving, and winning, including the SCCA National Championship runoffs, SCCA Pro Racing, Trans Am, NHRA, and NASCAR. To find race gas near you, visit SunocoRaceFuels.com or call Sunoco at 800-RACE-GAS. 
Welcome back to the National Park Speed Road America in the 68th consecutive running of the WeatherTech Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints. And uh, how a lot has changed in the last <laughs> few moments yeah. here. You know, we when we left Brian, we had a single car there on the outside of the kink up against the wall. And uh, now you'll notice um, like a bunnies, they've multiplied. Yeah. I suspect that this might be some of the cars who chose to go out on, on slick tires. <laughs> that, it's um, quite possible. And, yeah. and I might also add here, Brian, as, uh, as they are there, you'll notice no other cars driving through the situation as right. we have gone to red flag conditions uh, here. Where And uh, for those of you that were not with us yesterday, red flag in SCCA road racing uh, is not the same as in FIA, where, which is somewhat the equivalent of our black flag asking drivers to come back into the pits. A uh, red flag in SCCA... Uh, is a uh, a command for all the drivers to come to a safe and complete stop over on the side of the racetrack, and it's basically so uh, the uh, race control and the emergency services workers can uh, can well get the track under control. Yeah, the good news is it 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 looks like everybody is obviously okay. It was nice and slow slides into that situation. Because uh, everyone had already been slowed down for the full course yellow. Um, uh, but it is a bit of a mess to clean up. And obviously you don't want anyone else coming into that situation hot. Uh, even in a slow speed. Because um, you've got workers out doing their thing. Not with the protection of their trucks. Uh, so that is, uh, that is why we've stopped things here. Uh, to get this all cleaned up. And um, no work on the cars once they do go back to pit lane. Um, and I will say, uh, with eight minutes left in this race, it wouldn't surprise me entirely so that we can stay on time here uh, if they do end up ending this race at this point in time. Uh, I'm just putting that out there as a potential possibility here. Uh, would not surprise me at all because uh, we ended up having to shorten races yesterday because of our two red flags. So um, uh, just kind of speculation out loud here um, as to what we... What our future, if I had a crystal ball, Greg, um, that's what my crystal ball is indicating as a possibility here. Yeah, that's, uh, it, that's certainly a possibility. We don't have, the, we don't have uh, any distinct information on uh, no. when we need to shut things down right, right. Uh, here. As, uh, you know, again, we've got uh, vehicles responding to, uh, you know, uh, it was a little bit easier, I think, when we had just one car off, but we've got multiple cars. But you can see as uh, Director Zach is uh, scanning around the racetrack here, uh, all of our other racers, again, having come to a complete stop because we do, although we don't have that track blockage, we want to ensure that uh, uh, not only are uh, the drivers uh, safe, but also, of course, the corner workers and the emergency services teams that are responding to these incidents. And, uh, you know, it's got to be very difficult for these racers. It, you know, it was already difficult for the racers under race conditions with all the spray and all the water. Um, but there are still some places around the racetrack where it is raining. And these guys are just, you know, they're sitting in pretty thick Nomex uh, suits and, uh, and gloves and what have you with the, the rain coming down on them and into their, uh, into their open wheel chassis. So what I would do in this situation... Um uh, is I would take off my gloves and, and stuff them underneath me in the car while I'm sitting there so that they stayed as dry as possible so that when I did get back into racing, um, I'd be able to pull my gloves back out, get them back on, and they might be relatively dry in dry, the situation. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the other thing you need to try to do is keep your feet dry uh, because, you know, a lot of times in these open-wheel cars, they're not completely sealed up as well as maybe an F1 or an Indy car, right. and you might get some rain down there in the footwell. And uh, that also can make it very difficult when you're trying to heel and tow or downshift, depending on the type of car you've got. Um, so right now, these drivers have all gone through whatever their personal, their personal um, uh, system is uh, for sitting through one of these things. And uh, that is the best, at least the best that I have found, uh, to be able to try to keep yourself in as good a spot as possible uh, to get back into this race. Now, if they do, uh, when they do uh, get us back going, great, they're going to probably take us to a black flag all and get these folks to uh, pit lane. And then if we do get to go racing again, they'll reorder them. Uh, still can't work on the cars, so those folks who are on, are on slick tires don't have the opportunity to switch to reins until right. they go to the double yellow, and Correct. they could choose to stay on pit lane, let all the other cars drive past them, pop on the rain tires, and head out. But with uh, eight minutes left, there's not a whole lot really of benefit to that at this point. We 
we still don't have any indication of which cars are off there in the kink. So I know there's some folks in the chat who are asking if we know who's in the wall. Um, it's four cars at my count. The first car that went in, and then after we got things slowed down, three more went in after them. I don't know if they even hit anything, uh, but it, I do see a, a, a tilt bed um, wrecker there. So somebody's got some suspension damage, or else they wouldn't have that out there. Right. Um, and uh, we'll uh, try to get some information on which cars were involved. Um, Jay Messenger, great point. Thank you. Big shout-out to all the safety workers uh, that took great care of me after his um, three flips in qualifying. And, um, yeah, definitely glad that you're feeling better or feeling okay anyway. And uh, we look forward to getting out there as, um, uh, as uh, you get yourself uh, back out there and, and racing with us. We look forward to seeing that, Jay. And I believe that might be a medical car heading out. I hope that's, or is that just a, maybe that could also be um, our stewards um, going out to go check the, the situation exactly. as far as the track condition or maybe even um, the wall there uh, or to keep tabs on, on whatever time it's going to take here uh, and make some determining factors. All right, and we can see here uh, some of our emergency services vehicles. I think that may have picked up a car or two uh, already off and heading out, heading out from the scene. Still have two machines left over there. And again, unfortunately, I don't have car numbers for you. And a uh, little difficult to get the numbers at this point because of uh, the red flag coming out. We don't have, uh, you know, we show most of our racers as having uh, completed two flying laps. There are three drivers uh, that uh, are still showing as having completed just a single lap. One of them we knew about, that was Zach Rivard uh, in the, uh, the Formula F Van Diemen. He was the, uh, the driver with the, uh, uh, the broken rear suspension that was off at turn five. I'm also showing Aaron Ellis uh, in the number 43 machine uh, out of Farmington, Minnesota as uh, not having completed lap number two, and Michael Nitz in the number 94 Mysterian as not having completed lap number two, but I, I will say that I had we had one driver uh, come down the pit lane, Brian, before the red flag, and uh, I believe, and it was a Formula V, it might have been Michael Nitt, so uh, I think that's, sure. you know, and, and it would make sense that uh, the two machines that came into the zone there by the kink, I believe they were on, uh, you know, they were working that next lap uh, when they went off, so, you know, it, it, it uh, show, goes to show that they would have been on the same lap um, right. as uh, the rest of the racers. Now, I, I will also tell you, I can see the, uh, the track workers there uh, looking very, very intently at a section of the jersey barrier there. Um, so, it, uh, or, or I guess there might be safer barrier there too because IndyCar races here. So, uh, if that's the case, it's possible that that car got into the safer barrier and uh, that will take a little bit of time to repair possibly. Um, which would also explain why the stewards would be going out to do an inspection and uh, determine whether or not we can go racing now or whether we have to take some time uh, to repair that wall before we can get moving. So uh, we got one car that they're just putting on the tilt bed uh, that way. I suspect they're putting it on the tilt bed that way, Greg, because they're going to take that blue car and do the exact same thing right next to it. Um, and by placing them on the tilt bed in that direction, oh, there's a red car still there too. Uh, they might be able to actually get all three of those cars on the same tilt bed uh, by doing what they're doing there. So again, just to remind everybody, we are under red flag conditions. That also means that the clock, well, I was going to say the clock has stopped. This is a, a race that was meant to be run under laps, 13 laps with no uh, specific time limit. Uh, and I'll have to, Brian, I'm going to go back through the subs because I believe that that there, there still technically was either a, a 35 or a 40 minute time limit, um, and I'm going to try and dig that information up just in case. Uh, I'm getting word from uh, producer Zach, who I believe checked with race control earlier today and verified that there was no time limit. So we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, you right. know, we had yesterday where some of these races were uh, curtailed early uh, due to. Uh, 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 earlier than the 25-minute time lapse uh, in order to uh, ensure that we got all of our races in for the day. We'll have to see how things play out here. But, again, all of our racers uh, currently stopped on track 
Uh, they have not been given the go-ahead to head back to the pit lane, but that will be uh, the next step that they'd issue a black flag. Uh, the racers would go back to the pits. They would uh, need to, uh, assuming they're not going to throw the checkered, or checkered flag early, uh, they would need to regrid according to the last full complete lap. Right. I'm sure they really would like to not throw the checkered flag yet because we've yeah. only got three laps in on this race. Um, but unfortunately, it, there are times when you just kind of have to have to call it a day on a particular race group. Not ideal by any stretch of the imagination, but um, you know we have to deal with with the options that are presented to us here, um, and that is often often the way it works. Uh, I I do know for a fact that race control and, and everyone involved works as hard as they can to get everyone into all their laps and as many as possible, uh, but sometimes that just does not work out work out well. So. All right, and so yesterday in this race, Brian, uh, for, uh, again, a 25-minute timed race, James Weida took the overall win and uh, won in Formula 600 over Aaron Ellis. Steve Thompson finished second. Stephen Jondahl finished in uh, uh, finished in fourth position back behind Stephen Thompson. Jondahl currently running uh, in currently running in second position. Let's take a l listen here real quick, Brian, as uh, the race control is trying to get a hold of start. And unfortunately, the starter stand not responding at the moment. So <laughs> hopefully, it'll, hopefully it'll be just a moment here. In Formula F, taking the win yesterday, uh, uh, Matteo Naranjo out of Edwards, Illinois, uh, with Zach Rivard in the 77 machine finishing in second. And that was a, that was a neat little race as uh, Rivard was a little bit back from the Rivard, uh, Rivard was a little bit back from Naranjo, but Adorno uh, finished in in uh, in third, and then in Formula V. Uh, was Andrew Whitson taking the win over Zach Whitson with Steve Whitson third and Brian? Here we go. It's checkered flag yep. being displayed on the starter stand. Yeah, my crystal ball was correct, sadly. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Unfortunately, that is the situation that we're in. I don't know that you could really blame anyone for this. Um, you know, it is a, a decision that you got to do. You got to keep the schedule going here. So. Um, I feel bad for these guys, but uh, they did get a full race in yesterday, which is good. Uh, so it wasn't a total loss for them for the weekend. All right, Brian. So, and again, we, we need to roll things back to the last lap. But uh, as it stood uh, uh, here, James Weida was your winner, uh, in, or probably he was your leader in Formula 600. Steve Jondahl second. Uh, and in Formula 600, Keith Jocelyn third. In Formula F, Matteo Naranjo was leading Formula F at the time we had the red flag. Tazio Stefanelli second. David Adorno third with Calvin Kotz and Cameron Reed. And then in Formula V, and I'm getting word that there is uh, some uh, oil cleanup that's going to need to be done uh, down in the kink. Brian, uh, in Formula V, Andrew Whitston was your leader with Chris Jennerjohn having gotten around Zach Whitston. Uh, Jennerjohn in second, Whitston third, Graham Lofhead, Steve Whitston, uh, your top five in Formula V. Uh, so it's starting as I'm hearing from race control that it might take a little while to uh, to get us back up and, up and running. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as we saw at the runoffs, uh, at VIR this past year, Brian, uh, rain and oil on a racetrack usually not the uh, uh, not the best of friends, and yeah. uh, makes for a very kind. And I'll bet you having the brand new surface here makes things a little bit more complicated as well. Sure, I think Greg, we should probably take a break, and uh, we'll get this all sorted out. And as soon as we're ready for our next race, we'll come back, and uh, we'll keep you posted as far as if we get a time to go back here. Um, on our little uh, on the graphics on our screen, so keep an eye on that. Uh, we'll also keep everyone updated in the yeah. chat as well. So, um, and and what I'm going to do, Brian, I'm going to make a call to the grid for the sure. next group because I know yesterday when we had that extended red flag, uh, got it caught one of our groups off uh, off guard a little bit. So we want to keep them uh, certainly keep them informed. Attention in the paddock. Second call to the grid for Formula Enterprises Two Prototype One. And prototype two racers, please head to the grid. Race group number, uh, pardon me, race group number seven. Let's try that again. Race group seven, Formula Enterprises two, prototype one, and prototype two. Please head to the grid. Your race is next. 
All right, so we are going to take a little break here. As I uh, mentioned, we've got some cleanup to do uh, down uh, towards the kink here at, uh, what did we call it, the National Water Park of Speed, Road America, <laughs> our home and our host for the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. Hopefully we're going to be back soon. No, that's a corner worker. We're turned off the stream, right?
your track. I know you just laid it, but then... It doesn't mix with water, though. Yeah.
minutes and ten seconds. Give it to the grid. Five minutes to the grid. Five minutes to the grid. Just a reminder to pad out shots that we're closing in ten minutes at 3 p.m. If you have not picked up your road barrier gear, please stop on pad out shots. You have ten minutes to complete your shot. Five minutes on the grid. I'll get you back to Brian and Greg here momentarily from America's National Park. Welcome back, everybody, to the National Park Speed Road America in the 68th consecutive running of the Chicago Region June, the WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. I'm Greg Ginsberg, along with Brian Bolanski. We're going to have special guest Jason Pribble here with us in the booth as well as we get ready for our next race. And uh, that is Formula Enterprises 2, Prototype 1, 
and Prototype 2. It's the Carl Haas Challenge where our, our first place winners are winners in each one of those th classes. It's going to come home with $200 in cash, a certificate from Hoosier Racing Tire for two tires, a Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints checkered flag, as well as the Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints hat. Second place finishers will come We'll take home $100 in cash with a certificate from Hoosier Racing Tire for a single tire, as well as a June Sprints hat third place, $50 in cash, a Braco Meter product certificate worth $100, and a Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints hat. And uh, as our field now starting to head out onto the track for their pace lap, this is once again going to be a split start. We're going to have our Prototype 1 and Prototype 2 drivers behind a pace car. They'll be in our first group. There were 25 of them that have set times over the course of the weekend, and then we will have our Formula Enterprises two drivers. Uh, they will be in our second group, and there were 20 drivers that set times in Formula Enterprises two. We're going to run down the first eight uh, eight rows for each group. 16 drivers. Let's start off with our prototype cars. Starting 16th, driving the number uh, the number 83 prototype two store. It's Greg Guyan. Starting 15th, driving the 19 store WF1 prototype P, uh, and actually this is in P1, it's Greg Case. Tim Day Jr. starts 14th. He's in the number 88 prototype two uh, store WF1. Then David Locke, he's going to start 13th. He's driving the number 18 prototype one store. Then starting in 12th, Brian French driving the number 15. Ralt Alt RT41 in Prototype 1 with Rod Rice starting 11th. He is in the 33 P1 Alon BPO2. Then Jeff Lederman, he starts 10th. He's in the 55 Store WF1 with Daryl Schaff starting 9th, driving the number 94 Prototype 1 Alon BPO2. James French will start 8th today. He is in the number 46 Swift 014 Prototype 1 machine with Jason Miller in that beautiful wind first bowler two-stroke machine. He is starting seventh today, driving the number eight machine. Jean-Luc Liverado will start sixth. He's in the number zero prototype one along DPO2 with John McAleer starting fifth, driving the number 68 prototype one along DPO2. Also in Alon DPO2, Todd Vanacore, he's gonna start fourth today uh, in prototype one with Jim Well scheduled to start third today, likely not going to make the field after yesterday's incident had some, uh, uh, car took on quite a bit of damage. Jim Devonport from Alamo, California, uh, with a, an Elan DPO2, that was the number 23 machine, and scheduled to start on the front row. Driving the prototype one Elan DPO2, the number 26 machine, Chip Romer, and Lee Alexander, driver of the number 48, Store WFZ, is your pole sitter with a qualifying time of 2 minutes, .559. In FE2, starting in 16th position, driving, well, they're all driving FE2s, uh, no, no big surprise there, <laughs> driving the 67 machine. It's Jonathan Weishite, and uh, we've got a black flag uh, condition that is now being displayed on all the corners, and I believe they are going to be bringing all of our racers down the pit lane. I'm waiting to hear, trying to hear exactly what the situation is. Let me, Brian, while we're... Ooh, monitoring what's happening here. Let me run down the rest of the FE2 field. As we've got, uh, starting 15th in the number 70 FE2 from Iowa City, Iowa, Mark Gregg. Starting 14th in the number 29 machine. And uh, thank you once again, Kelton, for coffee and donuts this morning. Kelton Jago, starting 13th, driving the number 92 from the Enterprise 2. It is Jason Newton with Paul Marino starting 12th in the 44 car. Then we've got John Yateman starting 11th in the 22 machine with Doug Campbell starting 10th, driving the number 53. Amy Hallowell starting 9th today. She's in the number 37 car with Dean Offerman starting 8th in the 27. Steve Whitston starting 7th today. He's in the 118 with Matt Romer starting 6th, driving the number 56 car. Andrew List scheduled to start 5th today in the 61 with Gabe Fairbach. Starting fourth, he's driving the number nine machine. Adam Jetterjohn scheduled to start third in the 71. And your front row, starting second, driving the number four Formula Enterprises two car from Great River, New York. It's Jason Conzo and your pole sitter today in FE2 from Tigard, Oregon. Caleb Schrader driving the number 99. All right, so uh, 
we've got uh, Jason Preble here with us. Good, good afternoon, Jason. Good afternoon. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, so uh, you uh, have some very recent experience with a very damp Road America, uh, having raced in our Spec Racer Ford race just a little while ago. What was it like out there? Oh, man. I mean, the, the conditions were changing like crazy. Um, you know, this is the first race, I believe, ever on this new surface in the rain. Uh, so, you know, everyone's in the pits trying to figure out what to do, what to think, you know. Is this track one that's hard on rain tires? Stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it's a wonderful surface um, at this point. I think in the wet, it turned out really well. You've also got some experience, Jason, in, uh, in FE2, which is why you jumped into the with us today. And uh, we talked, you're actually the first guest, guest number one on Inside the SCCA. And uh, I chatted with you coming off of your run at, uh, at the runoff in Indy. And um, um, what are the FE2 cars like in the rain? You know, I actually haven't gotten too much experience in the rain with these guys. Uh, I think the only legitimate rain run I did was at Indy the runoffs. Uh, but, you know, from working with the guys I worked with all year and, uh, you know, helping some people out in between, uh, you know, we got a lot of good good input. I think, you know, the, the Hoosier FE2 tires do a really, really good job. Um, you know, even the slicks are quite solid in the rain, actually. Um, you know, you probably see cars maybe toying with dries at this point and uh, I think I see a few cars out there with some stickers on so yeah I mean the the Hoosier tires do a great job in both wet and dry um, but they're, they're sketchy I mean these cars have a lot of horsepower to them and you know the weight's there but no they do a good job. All right, Brian, real quick, I've uh, gotten, uh, gotten a little bit of a, an understanding here on why the drivers are being brought down the pit lane, why there's a black flag. Uh, as, the, uh, as the group was, uh, was rolling off, uh, it was noticed that the order in which I believe the FE2 field was gridded in was incorrect. And uh, this is now being done in order uh, to get them back into the correct order. And uh, interestingly enough, I believe we had at least one driver pull over to the pit wall and have crew take a look at their car, which is going to mean now that they likely are going to end up at the back of the field, at least one prototype. And I just saw one prototype car start to move towards the pit wall and was his crew was giving him the signal to get away yeah. <laughs> and stay, stay in line. Yeah, sometimes you have to do that, though. If you feel like there's a problem with the car, it's better to have the crew look at it under the black flag and take that trip to the back of the field than to go out there, especially in these weird weather conditions uh, when you're just not confident because that everything's right with the car. So, um, you know, sometimes that's a calculated decision here, uh, and I get that. So uh, we'll, get the, uh, we'll get the cars bitted up properly, and, uh, and uh, then we will uh, get this thing going. Uh, thankfully, this should be something rather easy to fix. It and, should. Uh, and to fix rather quickly. So um, uh, that's, and so quickly that they're already uh, sending the cars back out for, uh, for this lap. Now, my question is, Greg, yeah. uh, has, the, has the race started now because no. we've already had our pace lap? I, 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 I well, well, okay. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go by what they say, and it may be because they, they crossed the, uh, the line there. So I don't know if the next lap is going to be lap 12 or not. Now, one thing that uh, we did just hear, and we're going to have to watch this, Brian, is uh, the call I heard from Race Control, the 46 machine. That's James French, uh, who we saw a little bit earlier today in Formula Atlantic. Uh, and uh, the call was that he did go over to his crew. Crew touched the car, and they're saying that the, that the, uh, the 46 machine may be being held till the very rear of the FE2 field and going to be starting not from the back of the, the prototype cars, but from the back of the entire field. Well, would that be the back of the entire field, the back of the FE2, because they're starting second? Yeah, but he's in a prototype car. Oh, 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 okay, I'm sorry. That's what I was confused about. Yes. Yeah, that would unfortunately, that would be an unfortunate situation there, um, if that is the case. So, uh, one car that we're not going to see here, Greg, is the Jim Devonport car. Um yes. We, uh, he was involved in, a, in, in what caused yesterday's red flag uh, in this race, and uh, I uh, traded some texts with him this morning. Uh, he's okay, bruised up, 
Um, the car, unfortunately, not okay. Um, and whether they're going to be able to fix that car or they're going to have to replace it, I, I don't know for sure. I was hesitant to ask too many questions um, because uh, when, you, when you lose a race car like that, it's a, it's a tough thing to think about too, for a day or two. Uh, but sure. the great news is he's good. Um, he'll be fine. And um, uh, But he will not be out with us today. All right, so when you have a weird start like this, Jason, when things go, you know, you, have, you, get, you get in the car, you get strapped in, uh, you plan to do one pace lap, and then all of a sudden something gets changed up like this. Uh, how do you deal with that kind of unusual stuff that happens? Yeah, you know, it, it's really frustrating. Uh, you know, you get into your rhythm, you kind of, you know, set yourself, you, you let your heartbeat get up, and then probably around turn five, you start thinking strategy, thinking about the track and whatnot. Um, and then, then you got to do it all over again. You're sitting here on the same cars, you know, just slowly waiting for it to finally happen, and then it, it's not. Um, but you know, I think once you, once you kind of forget that you already did a lap, uh, it starts to kind of even out again, and you, you know, you're, you're able to get back into the rhythm. But it's definitely not not easy. And then, of course, you work out the strategy. Now you have one less lap in the race as well, which is obviously not nice either. Right, right. Question in the chat, is Tom Bird out there? He was the other car involved, I believe, in that Jim Devonport incident. He is not out. Uh, as I understand, that car was pretty well uh, destroyed as well. So um, looking at who's crossed the start, uh, the start uh, timing loop here, um, he is also one of those cars that's not out. There, so. yeah. I do know, though, um, if anyone is wondering, he, no, his crew says he's okay. Good. Uh, so Very good. Yeah. All right, so we uh, had to wait a, a few more minutes to get back to racing action. I appreciate everybody hanging with us here as uh, we get this thing underway. And uh, should also remind folks that uh, still ahead after this race, there's two more, our Big Four GT, uh, A Sedan and T1 group, and then the STL STU group is our final race of the day. So still have three races on the board here as we're getting ready to start race number seven of nine today. And uh, we'll get this thing started here in just a second. As, as we can see here, uh, that drive line is already starting to, to come in here a little bit uh, through the kink, helped along by the sweeper truck that I know came through there a bunch of times uh, during our red flag situation. Still looks really damp though here, uh, Greg. I see some yes. spray coming up. Yeah, quite a, quite a bit of spray is there uh, coming up through that section of the truck, coming up through the Bill Mitchell bend. Uh, and, uh, and and you can see certainly also uh, a good portion of that track still very very damp as you're not going to see at that corner coming out of uh, coming out of Canada uh, many drivers uh, moving their cars all the way over drivers left here as the pace car now is going to the pace car from our first group going to be moving over onto the pit lane that's going to give Lee Alexander the field in his store WFZ. Chip Romer right alongside, uh, then Todd Vanacore and John McAleer. Those are your first two rows as the green flag is now underway, and we are racing here at at Road America. And a couple stragglers there coming across the line. We'll have to see. Has a lot of spray up in the air from these drivers. Got to be very hard to see once you're about three or four rows back there. As our drivers slot in, going through turn one for the first time. Chip Romer. Uh, slotting into the lead. Looks like Lee Alexander in the 48 machine a little bit farther back as they turned in for turn number one and they start to make the run down the hill over towards turn number three. Yeah, definitely got some tiptoeing going on there, which is smart for this first lap. Kind of figure out where things are going on, although a second pace lap kind of helps in that as well. Uh, you can learn some of where the water is, the heaviest water. Uh, now we're going to get our green flag for our FE2 cars. And they are now making the way down to turn number one. And in FE2, we had Kale Trader Jason Conzo uh, in very close proximity coming down into turn number one. And at one point, it was three wide with Jenner John and Fairbach. As uh, I believe we do have a car that may be off track. And uh, looks like on the, the over at turn five, we've got one that has gone around. And uh, we'll try and get the number on yeah. that car yeah, and I think there it's is. actually uh, well we still got a waving yell I'm trying to pick up where the actual car oh it's off of the wall right drivers there. left uh, drivers left about halfway up uh, the hill towards six there uh, and that's a position where it may have tapped that wall there or it could be high sided uh, where it can't get off the wet track the, the way it is there so um, 
Either of those are possibilities. And from this distance, I really can't see it. Now you have your entire FE2 field coming through. And uh, there's a car that goes way wide there and a car off. Uh, but it doesn't look like that car hit anything. It probably just came off line. And uh, it is now continuing on. So that's good news. Yeah, and they're saying it was a very slight impact. Still trying to pick up pick up the corner. Uh, let's see here. It is. Let's see here. It was. I chip her. Right. I was or just going to say that the, the call that came in is that it was 2-6. 2-6 red. And so that would be Chip Romer, who was a uh, uh, driver started off on the outside of the front row. And as yeah. that group now coming up the hill, you can see the, the hole where Chip Romer would have been as they are now going to come up the straight and complete the very first lap. And it is Todd Vanacore. After one lap, he is your new leader with Lee Alexander, Jason Miller in the win first, running in third with Jean-Luc Liberato and John McAleer. And yeah, indeed, it is, uh, uh, looks like it is uh, Chip Romer has gone off. And uh, we're checking to see if he has managed to uh, rem remove himself, and I don't think so. Looks like he's still there. Yep, looks like he got himself uh, with maybe a help from that truck or not. He's on his way, and um, he will now try to work his way back up through. Uh, he's hoping right now for someone to cause a full course caution, uh, because by himself, uh, he'll probably be able to stay out in front of this group, possibly, uh, but to make his way around for almost four miles to catch even uh, the back of the FE2 field uh, is going to be quite uh, quite a, a tall order there. All right, as that, as that prototype field now starting to make their way uh, down the hurry downs, and uh, we're going to start to see the uh, the prototype car, or probably the, uh, the FE2 uh, fight here. They just crossed the start finish line. They're going to be coming down in turn three here and just uh, just a few moments as our prototypes already starting to spread out here uh, in these damp conditions and uh, you can see there the gap uh, the gap there uh, as the black and red number 26 a chip roamer trying to uh, to keep himself from being lapped or to try and find his way to the back of the field as he's got just a, a touch less than four miles uh, to go before he can uh, he can catch up to the rear of that prototype field. And uh, you know, somewhat uh, Brian reminds me of uh, one of our prototype races at the runoffs this past year, <laughs> uh, where where we had the, the, the conditions that went from, from dry on the pace lap to wet at the start of the race. And uh, we had some, some folks uh, with some very depth tire changing, uh, we'll say, to, uh, to keep from getting, uh, keep from getting lapped. So, uh, We'll continue to watch that as our prototype, our probably our FE2 drivers now making their way down the hurry downs into turn number one. Your leader uh, in FE2 currently is Caleb Trader. He's got Jason Conzo behind with Adam Jennerjohn and Matt Romer. Amy Hollowell has made a good move here. Amy Hollowell, who started off in ninth position, uh, now sitting up fifth in uh, in FE2. Now we do have a number of drivers that did not take the green full. Luke Dupansia, James French. Uh, in the well, actually James French, who started off at the back, Jim Devonport, as you mentioned, Daryl Schaff, Jeff Laterman, Brian French, David Locke, Greg Guyan, Andrew List, Tom Burt, uh, who knew about Brian Yates in FE2, uh, as well as Jose uh, Paredes and Brian Lindstrom. Uh, so the majority of those uh, drivers, all of the prototype one and prototype two, and uh, on the pit lane now, Brian and uh, having the screw take a look, the number 26 machine of Romer. So, uh, you know, the, that, the thought of keeping from going a lap down, that's, uh, that's pretty much out the window. We're going to yeah. see if he goes and rejoins as he's left his crew and is uh, starting to run down the pit lane. We'll see if he comes down. There he is, and it looks like he's going to come back out on track, but a lap down. Nope, so he's going back behind the wall. Yeah. So, so Jason, if you were getting ready to go out in this race with these conditions, would you have gone out on, on dry tires or wet tires? Um, you know, I think at this point it's really hard to say because, you know, the start of the race, absolutely, the conditions were wet tires. But, I mean, you can see on the camera exit of turn three, there is a dry line forming. And, you know, you kind of have to play this game of there is a lot of grip on the inside or on the line 
but at the same time, this is a long race. You have to keep the tires alive for as long as possible. So it's a well balance of speed and you know keeping everything alive. So you, yeah, you should be a politician. That was the best non-answer to a question I've heard in a very, very long time. <laughs> uh, I was trying to keep from saying just let the team decide. <laughs> I Not love the it. driver's decision. <laughs> I love it. So, uh, well, it, it, if it doesn't rain again, dry tires, obviously the right choice. But you don't know that, you know, 15, 20 minutes ago when you had to make the decision on what to go out on. So um, that's the other thing is that these decisions need to be made somewhat before you roll to the grid. And uh, that can be 10 or 15 minutes before the race even starts. And a lot, as we've learned here today, a lot can change in 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, Brian, I'm getting a call from, uh, I think it was over by turn 14, but I don't see it does. I'm taking a look at our, our cameras about the driver off with a broken suspension. Oh, there he is, driver's right. Yeah. Uh, just out of turn 14 in the grass. Uh, one of our Formula Enterprises 2 machines, and that may be Amy Hollowell, possibly. Oh, no. In the 37 machine, uh, I know Jason's taking a look, and Jason may uh, may have a better idea just from the livery, although it's a little hard for us to, to tell there, but I'm uh, already showing uh, how well is having dropped down uh, at to, uh, to 17th position uh, last in FE2, and uh, likely that is her. And uh, the word is from the corner workers, broken suspension. Let's take a look at what happened. Let's see, yep, there's the car. Oh, it looks like uh, looks like she checked up because the car maybe had a little bit of a tank slapper coming out through 414, and she checked up to miss it, and that uh, caused a the problem there. And maybe that little bit of hit into the wall there was just enough to break the front right corner on that. Uh, I say, oh no, because I've I've had uh, I know Amy a little bit, and one of the coolest people out there uh, working on you know doing her racing thing. So. Uh, it's always unfortunate when I see something like that for any of our drivers, but um, that was that was where my oh no came from. Yeah, that's a real shame. I've been I've been racing with her since I was about eight in carts actually. Uh, so I was talking to her a little bit before this race, telling her about turn 14, and there is a river going across the track right now. I saw two cars in front of me spin, and uh, yeah. that's a very dangerous place to be. Also hearing that uh, people who are keeping an eye on the radar say that rain is on its way again. Um, I know, I know, but it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Come on now, don't, don't make me be the bearer of the bad news. Come well, on better now. You than me. Oh, well, and there we go. If you're better, looking at that you, better, radar, Better folks, Zach than you and me, actually. Yeah. You see that big old bubble of green, and uh, hopefully it's just the green and not that yellow and red at the bottom of that bubble there. Uh, the circle in the middle, that's where we are, of course. Uh, so um, if you On went the right out... side, I'm not boating in the Great Lake. That's true. Uh. That's true. <laughs> so the drivers who went out on rain tires are like, please, please rain. Uh, the drivers who went out on slicks are like, please, please don't rain. So uh, before the rain gets here, Greg, let's do our break here. Okay. And, uh, oh, there's a little tank slapper. That was a nice save. Uh, let's do a call to grid and do our break, and then we'll hopefully be green all the way to the finish here. Sounds good, Brian. Attention in the paddock. First call to the grid for race group number eight, GT1, 2, and 3, GTX, Touring 1, and American Stand. Please head to the grid. Race group eight, GT1, GT2, GT3, GTX, Touring 1, and American Sedan. This is your first call to the grid. All right, so let's take a little break, and thanks to our partners and sponsors here bringing you all this great coverage this weekend from the National Park of Speed Road America and the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago region. June Sprints will be right back. Ready for a new race trailer? Bravo Trailers is the exclusive trailer partner of the SECA. Owned by longtime SECA racers, Bravo Trailers work better, load easier, and tow better because we build them with racers in mind. Visit bravotrailers.com to see your new trailer in aluminum or steel. For over 25 years, championship-winning drivers and teams have demanded Hawk Performance Motorsports brake pads. Now you can have their advanced technology on your daily car, truck, or SUV with Hawk Performance Street products. With the improved HP Plus pad for that hybrid street and track feel, or Super Duty pads for tow vehicles, their all-new ER1 brake pad designed to take on even the longest race, and their all-new high-performance brake fluid, Hawk has all of your braking needs covered. 
Visit hawkperformance.com and like them on Facebook or Instagram to learn more about the Hawk Performance Advantage. Hawk Performance, what's stopping you? Hoosier Racing Tire is proud to be the presenting sponsor of SECA's Super Tour. Hoosier's mission is to be the dominant customer-driven provider of tires to race teams domestically and internationally. Realizing Hoosier's existence and continued success is dependent upon how well we meet our customers' expectations by providing the safest, most reliable, high-quality race tires that put you in the winner's circle. For more information, see one of our trackside support personnel or the local Hoosier Tire racing dealer nearest you. Or contact us at HoosierTire.com. Hoosier Racing Tires, truly designed for champions. Massa Vineyards is the exclusive sparkling wine for podium celebrations at the Hoosier Racing Tire SECA Super Tour, SECA Runoffs, and Tire Rack SECA Pro Solo. Celebrate your race weekend with Mazza Vineyards and learn more at enjoymazza.com. Summit Racing is proud to support SCCA racers through the Road Racing Contingency Program. Run the required decals to be eligible for contingency payouts. And welcome back to Road America in the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints. I'm Greg Ginsburg along with Brian Belansky and got a special guest with us here for this race, Jason Pribble, uh, here as we are working our Prototype 1, Prototype 2, and Formula Enterprises rate, Enterprises Ooh, 2 race, and we're just about halfway through the race here, Brian. Yeah, we got a car with a lot of smoke coming out here, going towards Hurry Downs there, one of our prototype cars. And, and, and I um, think that might be the Kohler car, actually, uh, Brian, and, and, and not uncommon for the wind first to put out some smoke, but, well, but not, not that, that much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and hopefully he's not dropping oil on his soon-to-be wet racing surface. We've already seen what that can do. Um, but uh, hopefully his crew is telling him to come on in and, and get that booked at, because uh, that is not a good sign. Uh, greatest uh, w winning uh, comment today in the chat from Carl T10, fire the weather steward. Uh, the problem with that, Carl, is that in days like this, oh, now we have a car slow there uh, also. I don't believe that's the car that was smoking. That looks like a different car. Um, and that's in a really bad spot, I'll be honest with you. Um, oh! Yeah, that, yeah, that is a spot, especially he's just past the apex there. That it's somewhat uh, somewhat blind. I'm gonna, tr and that is the 25 machine uh, there that has pulled off. Uh, we're almost pulled off. That is Vaughn Scott out of uh, Royal Oak, Michigan. He's, oh, now and he's well, he's got it back underway. And uh, I used to race uh, uh, in IT against Vaughn years ago. Well, actually, he's a, a winner of the American Road Race of Champions in ITV in a Porsche 924. He's been racing that prototype machine for a number of years, uh, but he is now back underway. And so, Jason, you, you noticed here uh, as we were watching these racers during the break, obviously that a, a lot of racers are looking for some damp sections of the track now in order to cool down those dry weather tires. And you were, you were saying that at least in the, in the FE2s, the, the, the dry weather tires actually do a pretty good job in the damp. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the compound there, it's it's grippy, but I think one of my races, I ran 10, 12 heat cycle tires, something like that, which is super rare in a formula car uh you, you just can't get that anywhere else but here in this class um and yeah as you see the, the p2 i believe going yeah the 25 on the pit lane yeah um but yeah no i think uh, and we've got and that looks i believe that's the the, uh, the jason miller car uh that has just pulled off yeah. uh no actually uh well let's take a look uh if it was, because I think it might have actually just been the been the 28 machine of Bart Wolf in the Liget uh, was the call that just came in from the corner. We'll uh, we'll double check that in a moment as we yeah. just had a driver pull off over at turn five. What one last note on the weather steward? Um, the, when it's 75 and sunny, you've got a hundred people who who claim they're the weather steward. The problem is we don't know who to fire today because no one's owning up to being the weather steward. So um, that is always always the situation here. All right, and uh, the corner down, down to turn five, they've just changed it from the 28 to the eight. So, yeah, indeed, that was, uh, it looks like it was Jason Miller, um, who had been our, when, when he started the smoke, uh, had been our leader uh, in prototype one, had been ahead of Todd Vanacore. So uh, we'll see here, but it looks like his, uh, his race now, maybe a little, maybe a lap and a half later than we expected, but it looks like it's now done. Yeah, definitely. Six laps to go here. 
Uh, which doesn't sound like much, except for the fact that we're Road America, so that's a good bit of driving still. All right, your leader's in FE2, Brian. Uh, right now it is, as it's been since the very start of the race, it is Caleb Schrader, and he's uh, uh, things are really starting to stretch out at the front of the field. Schrader's now opened up almost a six-and-a-half-second lead over Jason Conzo. Uh, another, tw uh, and, yeah, and, and uh, well, actually, maybe it wasn't. Uh, maybe it wasn't Jason Miller that went off at five because I have the eight car now on the pit lane. <laughs> so okay. it was another light blue prototype car. We'll have to get the number of that. Um, but uh, Schrader with uh, s almost uh, six and a half seconds over Conzo. Another uh, another 12 se or about 11 seconds back to Adam Jenner, John, and another five from there back to Matt Romer. So things have really opened up at the front of FE2. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was a bit of a late dive there by one of the prototypes into one. I saw him get on the uh, on the paint there and get a little wiggle, and the FE2 had to move a little bit out of the way. But it's it's still sketchy on offline stuff, especially on the paint. You get the wheel spin or the lock up, anything like that. The track still the track is still tough no matter the line. Well, and, and looking at the gaps between FE1 and FE or between FE2 first place and second place, uh, six seconds. Uh, a lot of times you don't get that in FE2 because the cars are so evenly matched and uh, the, the guys and gals at the front of the field are usually fairly evenly matched from driving talent as well. Uh, but this could be a little bit of how to deal with these weird weather conditions. Yeah, you know, it could be uh, Caleb's taking care of his tires a little bit better. I know he was out in the spec racer and, uh, you know, he's got a little bit more time on track. He knows it a little bit better maybe. Well, uh, and, knows, that's a good yeah. That's a great point, you know. Um, he has the advantage of actually running on this wet track earlier today, and I, I don't think Jason Conzo has run today until this race, right? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Right, so that, that certainly would make sense. Yeah, it looks like another uh, three-second chunk for the lead of uh, Caleb as well. He took another, another big gap there. So he's definitely finding someone to just put down his best lap, 25-6. Uh, fastest lap by two seconds. So right. he's pretty yeah. comfortable. Is it also possible that, that uh, he is on dry tires and uh, Jason Conzo went out on, a, on more of an intermediate tire? Or do you think most of the FP2 cars uh, went out on dry tires? You know, I think it's absolutely possible, yeah, because we're seeing as the track dries up, he's opening larger and larger gaps, so I would not be surprised if um, Caleb's, you know, took the risk, went out on, on slicks there, or scuffed, scuffed dry tires, and, right. uh, you know, now it's really showing the wet tires are overheating a little bit, and he just can't keep up. Yeah, absolutely, so... Looking at the front of our field, Todd Vanacore is in first place. John Luke Liverado is in second. John McAleer now third. Greg Case fourth. Uh, Jason Miller's dropped down to fifth. Uh, but we believe he's on pit lane. Well, um, and, did and, he go back uh, out? He, right? Yeah, he just he just went back out. But the timing scoring is a little odd because. Uh, uh, again, when he made that cut through turn five, I think he ended up missing a good portion of the course. Uh, so oh. uh, we're still, when he came up the pit lane, he, uh, he tripped the lights and uh, I think uh, suddenly jumped and jumped ahead of the rest of the field. But uh, it, looks, it looks more correct now, at least, as we're showing John Luke Liverado in second position, John McAleer right. in third, then Greg Case and Lee Alexander, uh, your top five in prototype one, as we've got uh, uh, coming down. Yeah, it looks like Miller having uh, still having some issues there, uh, at least speed-wise, coming down into turn eight. And it looks like he is about to come to a stop, and there you go. Jason Miller pulling as far off as he could to, to try and keep things green there over at turn eight. And we're being told by our producer that there's also a cutout there where he could actually get way, way off the track. Uh, so that's uh, that's pretty helpful there. Uh, appreciate that very much. So, yeah, I was gonna say either that, Brian. He, go, he, you know, he just goes around, goes over top of the Speedville Bridge, and back over to the pit lane. <laughs> <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> yeah, that's what we call a moment. <laughs> and, and at least he's our only driver with a rain light on from the BFRs to be able. We'll be able to pick him out the next time. 
Wow, that was that was really a moment. I mean, <laughs> I've dropped the tires a couple times in the dry, but I never thought about touching those curbs in the wet today. So yeah, that was a really really good save there. So so I guess if I ask you how wet, how slippery are the curbs in the wet, you can't answer the question because you stayed off them, right? Uh, well, I learned my lesson. That's how I know how to stay <laughs> off. <them. laughs> yeah. Well played. Well played. Yeah, typically though, we talked about it in the in the race before, is that uh, uh, wet painted stuff that's wet is often really slippery, especially if it's brand new paint and all these curbs have been brand new painted and put in. So uh, I would suggest they're probably ultra slippery. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's um, yeah, it was the inside curbs were quite surprising actually, because yeah, if you touched those, it would just push your car forward, and if you touched the exit curbs, then it would spin your car around. Uh, so definitely not a great combination. So, right. so t oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Brian. I would say one last question here for, for Jason before we get ready for the last couple laps here. You've got time here in the dry on the old track. You've got time here now in the dry on the new track. Uh, what are your impressions, uh, new track, new pavement, uh, what are your impressions of uh, the new racing surface? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's got some time to kind of bed in and whatnot. It's a it's a unique surface. Uh, not much I've seen. It. I believe it's reminiscent of the Formula One track in Miami, where the stones are quite close together, and uh, the grip comes from cars laying down rubber. Yeah, sure. We saw that a lot this weekend. Um, I know there were a bunch of people running a week before IndyCar, and then there's people running a week after IndyCar, and it is a completely different track. Really? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So I think the surface definitely benefits more track time. Uh, it's interesting to see how it will be after a really hard rain. Uh, this wasn't extreme, but it definitely changed the, the dry surface quite a bit. So, right. you know, as long as, you know, the rain keeps coming, oils get up, track starts to weather in i'm sure it'll be quite good yeah and the other thing i would say is you and i both know uh once it needs to go for a winter also because a lot can change uh with a couple of freezes and all that kind of stuff so um we really won't know what the surface is like until until you come back in may and do some racing then yeah yeah, and one of the unique parts about the old old surface was it was just driven on so much that every single corner had its own groove, almost like uh, you know you have berms in uh, motorcycle racing or the right. mot motocross. Uh, yeah, especially prominent in turn six, where there was a bit of a crest at one point, and then it kind of you know went inverted. Uh, so that kind of stuff, it just needs time to adjust and get back into it. Uh, um, and I'm sure people will start really, really liking this track. All right, Greg, we're coming up on one lap to go here, and uh, not a lot of issues for any of our cars. It's a 15-second lead for a P1 leader and uh, 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 almost a 10-second lead uh, for our FE2 leader. So um, some stuff going a little further back in these packs. Uh, but our leaders seem to have things pretty much in hand at the moment. Yeah, and might also add that uh, we haven't talked much about Mike Rupert uh, with a little bit over a seven-second advantage over Tim Day Jr., who in turn uh, has almost a 20, actually more than a 20-plus second advantage over Bart Wolf. And uh, we just saw now more rain starting to come down at turn number one. So uh, those uh, some of those drivers may not be hunting for, <laughs> hunting for dampness uh, on this last lap. So the question is, well, oh, yeah, well, I was just to say we have a car that has gone off, and I'm trying to get the word from race control now. Uh, just as our uh, as our leader uh, Todd Vanacore making his way uh, out of the kink and heading down towards Canada Corner, he'll be getting the white flag this next time by. And uh, there he is, that dark green machine coming up the Bill Mitchell bend. And uh, into 14 he comes. We should see him pass through. There he is, Todd Vanacore coming out of turn 14. The first car of two. I got to think if, uh, if Jason Conzo is on wet tires, he was hoping for this rain to come a couple of laps sooner. Uh, I don't think it's going to help him too much. Uh, if that's what's going on, I'm speculating as well. So, um, uh, very, uh, very interesting timing for all of this. And now, of course, uh, the GT drivers 
And uh, and the ace and the T1 drivers who are coming out next are like, gosh, darn it, what do I do now? Maybe they're saying something more uh, yeah. than gosh darn it, but that's uh, <laughs> trying to keep it PG-13 for the kids watching at home. Well, well, we'll see. I mean, the, 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 the GT1 drivers may have the option of a couple different compounds for dry weather tires. Uh, and certainly the, the Touring 1 and American Sedan driver, well, the Touring 1 drivers, they're not going to have that choice. They have to run on DOTs and uh, may find themselves having to make that decision again on whether or not to go with the, the dry weather or the wet weather tires. Uh, the American Sedan drivers also might have a few uh, choices uh, in compounds. Uh, coming down the pit lane uh, right now, uh, the number, I believe it's the number 9 machine uh, down, probably the 19 machine of Greg Case out of Peoria, Illinois. Uh, he was running fourth in Prototype 1. He is now on the pit lane uh, here with a uh, lap remaining. Yeah, it's getting really sketchy out there. It's it's hard to say. I don't think Tonzo will be able to catch him, even if he's got the rain tires. Uh, you know, at this point, the track's been dry for so long that you worry his tires are hot. Probably hot. very, yeah, yeah. yeah, a little bit beyond that they're oh. not going to cool down enough just on the last lap as uh, our leader, Todd Vanacore, comes through the kink now. And he's he's the lead car in that group of four. All right, Todd Vanacore coming into turn 14 all by himself. And he comes up right hugging the wall, driver's right, and as he comes down the front straight, taking the win in prototype one, it's going to be Todd Vanacore. All following drivers will take the checkered flag. And we're waiting for the number seven machine of Rupert uh, to pass by. And Rupert uh, was, I believe, running uh, fifth overall, our P2 leader. Uh, and as they cross the stripe, let's uh, see here. We're going to probably see him leapfrog uh, Greg Case when he comes across the line. Well, we're sitting on this camera. I'm looking to see if there's anybody on the grid changing tires. And I don't know that they'll would let you change tires once yeah. you've been to the grid. The, the, yes, as long as, as, Brian, you can do that until you hit the one-minute mark. Okay. Uh, you can make changes on the grid. All right, so John Luke Liverado, he crosses the line. He's going to finish second in prototype one in his Elan DPO2. John McAleer will come home in third in prototype one. Mike Rupert, our first driver to cross the stripe in prototype two with Tim Day, Tim Day Jr. coming home second. And Lee Alexander... Uh, well, Lee Alexander finishing just off the podium in P1, uh, finishing in fourth. And then in part of type two, Bart Wolf will come home in third. And now we're looking to uh, looking at the uh, the Formula Enterprises two field. That was close. Dean was not in front exiting turn 14, but he grabbed that place. That's right. So Dean Oppenheim, Oppenheim get, or Opperman, pardon me, gets around Paul Marino on the very last lap. That was the battle for ninth in FE2 uh, with Caleb Schrader taking the win. Jason Conzo finishing second. Adam Jennerjohn finishing third. Matt Romer just off the podium in fourth position. But yeah, that was a great fight coming up the hill. Uh, great run as uh, Opperman just uh, got, a, uh, got a great run, was able to get around Paul Marino at the line and uh, you know you've probably seen this you come out of 14 and there's a there's a heck of a pole that you can grab uh coming up uh, coming up the road america straight yeah i mean you see a lot of guys in the drafting classes like spec racer or miatas like you know that pole they wait until turn 14 and you know you only have half of the straightaway but sometimes that's all you need um you know i haven't been in the, I've, I've never been in the position of fighting for the lead like that, and I always think, well, why don't you just pass them into Canada, and then you're <laughs> you're good to go. You're good to go. They can just get you right back in 14. So, yeah. yeah, no, they. It's really, really impressive how strong that draft is up the hill. All right, so I was going to say, Brian, let's take a look here. Uh, that's going to wrap up the Carl Haas Challenge. 
with Todd Vanacore, uh, your winner in Prototype 1, Mike Rupert, your winner in Prototype 2, and Caleb Schrader, your winner in Prototype 3. They're all going to come home with $200 in cash. Uh, certificate for two tires, the Hoosier Racing Tire, uh, the Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints checkered flag, as well as a June Sprints hat, finishing second in each class. John Luke Liverado uh, in Prototype 1. Uh, Tim Day Jr. in Prototype 2, Jason Conzo in Formula Enterprises 2. They've got $100 of cash coming to them. A certificate for one Hoosier Racing Tire, as well as a Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints hat. And then finally, uh, in third in each one of our classes, John McAleer in the, dri the driver of the number 88 prototype, uh, probably the 68 uh, prototype one machine, finishing third in prototype two is Bart Wolf. And then Adam Jenner, John in Formula Enterprises 2. They're going to take home $50 in cash as well as a Breakometer $100 product certificate and a June Sprints hat. All right, before we say goodbye, Jason, um, what, I know you've had, been working on a lot of different racing programs. What's, on, what's in your near future here? Um, well, pretty near. Uh, we're running uh, F1600 with the SCCA Pro Series FRP um, in two weeks here. So that's, uh, you know, the newest news that we have as of, I think it was yesterday. Uh, we're running with Rice Race Prep. Uh, we'll be back here for the Cat Nationals, uh, but uh, besides that, you know, nothing on the schedule yet, but we'll definitely uh, keep everyone updated because, you know, things are coming. All right, good to hear. All right, Greg, let's do another call to grid, and we'll take our break. We'll be back with our next race in just a sec. Attention in the pad, attention to the pad, final call to the grid for race group number eight. GT1, GT2, GT3, GTX, Touring 1, and American Sedan. Race group number eight, GT1, 2, and 3, GTX, Touring 1, and American Sedan drivers. This is your final call to the grid. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, two more races here from Road America. You are watching the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints, part of the 2023 Hoosier Race Entire SCCA Super Tour. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Road America, the National Park Speed, and the 68th consecutive running of the WeatherTech Chicago Region SCCA June Sprints. I'm Greg Ginsburg along with Brian Bolanski and wanted to, uh, to thank Jason Primo for uh, joining us uh, on that last session. So, uh, Brian, as we uh, start to wind things down now, we've got now just just a couple of uh, uh, just a couple of races remaining. Two more, including this one. This is the TRO Manufacturing Challenge with a $200 cash prize going to the winner of each class of Hoosier Racing Tire Certificate for two tires, a Chicago Region June Sprints checkered flag and hat for, again, for our winners, second place finishers in each class, $100 cash with one tire certificate from Hoosier Racing Tire and June Sprints hat and for our third place finisher, $50 cash, a Breakometer $100 product certificate as well as a June Sprints hat. And then let's not forget fifth place, sorry, fourth place driver, fifth place finisher will get $100 cash and the last place finisher, as long as they're not fifth, will take home $100. And I believe that is per class. Let's run down the starting order here, Brian. We're gonna have another split start. We're gonna have our GT1, GT2, and GTX drivers in our first group behind the first pace car, and then we'll have our T1 drivers in the second group. I'm gonna give you the, the top eight rows in each. Starting 16th in GT2, driving a Porsche 911 Cup car from Lebanon, Pennsylvania, Jared Odrick. Michael Williams will start 15th in the 77 GT2 Porsche 911. Josh Carlson will start 14th in the 36 GT2 Ford Mustang with Jonathan Start starting 13th in the 51 GT2 Dodge Viper. Jo uh, Justin Elder will start 12th. He's in the number 19 GT2 Chevy Camaro with John Snyder. Starting 11th, he's driving the, the 117 GT1 Porsche 911. Danny Bender will start 10th. He's in the number 3 GT2 Chevy Camaro and he is your GT2 pole sitter. Starting 16th, your reigning champion in GT1, national champion in GT1. Thomas Herb in his Mercedes AMG GT3. Joe Frieda will start eighth, driving the number 122 GT1 Chevy Corvette. Then we've got Joe Koenig, and again, all these uh, remaining cars in this group are in GT1. Joe Koenig will start seventh, driving the number 70 Porsche 911 Cup car. Starting sixth, driving the number 97 Chevy Corvette is Brian Goodwin with Rick Dittman starting fifth. He's in the number 124 Chevy Corvette. Then there's Ryan McManus, also in a Chevy Corvette. It's the 07 machine starting fourth. Adam Romito scheduled to start third today in his Dodge Challenger in your front row in GT1. Cliff Eben driving the number 63 for, pardon me, the 66 Ford Mustang and your pole sitter with a qualifying time of 206.987. And your winner yesterday in GT1, Dave Rulo. All right, let's move over now to Touring 1 as well as GT3. And we've got 16 cars in the group starting 16th, driving the number 177 American Stan Camaro, Philip Waters. Sam Daniels will start 15th. He's driving the number one American Stan Chevy Camaro. Then we've got Kyle Jones starting uh, 14th. He's in the number five American Stan Pontiac Firebird with Matt Reagan starting 13th. In a Ford Mustang, that's the number 80 machine. Starting 12th, driving the number 15 American sedan Camaro, Kyle Gilbert. George Shishan scheduled to appear. He's in its GT3 Mazda RX-7. The number 39 car is scheduled to start uh, Start 11. Uh, had some mechanical issues yesterday. We'll see if that car makes it out. Dan Van Norwick will start 10th. He's in the number 8 Touring 1 Ford Mustang S550. With Andy McDermott scheduled to start ninth in this group, he's driving the number 24 American Stan Ford Mustang. He's your pole sitter in American Sedan. Paolo Salvatore scheduled to start eighth. He's in the number 42 Touring 1 Ford Mustang with David Marshall in the 04 Ford Mustang starting in seventh. Then we've got Tad Berger. And by the way, the rest of these cars all in Touring 1. Tad Berger scheduled to start sixth in the number 60. Porsche GT4 Club Sport with Ann Doherty, also in a Porsche GT4 Club, Club Sport, the number four machine, starting in fifth position. Then we've got Bill Batten starting in fourth. He's in the 139 Chevy Camaro with Jonathan Anderson scheduled to start third in his Chevy Corvette. And then are scheduled to start on the front row, starting second in the number 146 Mercedes-Benz AMG GT4, Mark Bowden, and then the number 134 
Chevy Corvette, your pole scheduled to sit and start on pole, but I don't think he is here for this race with a qualifying time of 221.944. We'll have to see if he appears. James Candelaria. All right, here they come up the line here, up the uh, up straight away. We're going to have our uh, Corvette pace car here pull off, and our first group will come up. This is our GT1 and, uh, and GT2 group. As they come up the hill, we should hear them get on the gas here pretty quick, and then we will see whether or not we get a green flag here from our start stand. Yeah, and Brian, we've got a car that's already off uh, on the outside of turn 13 of Bill Mitchell Bend, but I don't think that's going to uh, stop us from getting the green flag. Well, clearly it does not, because the green flag is in the air, and we are racing here. Second to last race of the day, 15 laps here at Road America. All right, Brian, as they come down into turn one now, Dave Ruo, as he did yesterday, jumping out to an early lead side by side, coming down into the corner. I believe that's Ryan McManus in the 01 Chevy Corvette along with Cliff Evan. As uh, we're waiting for our second group now, coming down the Road America straight, these are T1 drivers. And uh, indeed, not out today for our race is our winner from yesterday, James Candelaria, Mark Bowden, and his uh, Mercedes jumping out to an early lead over Jonathan Anderson and Bill Batten. Uh, and uh, as they work their way down, uh, looks like Ann Doherty and Ted Berger just a little bit behind Doherty in that uh, black and yellow uh, Porsche kind of standing out across the rest of the field. We'll get uh, give you a rundown on the drivers that did not take the green flag here in just a moment. And there is our first pack going through turn five. And you might have noticed it looks like it's probably Joe Koenig uh, who makes a move into the lead around Dave Brulo in that Corvette. And uh, he is obviously moving along here. Uh, if we do have uh, changing weather conditions, that mid-engine Corvette uh, will be the better steed here for those conditions, very likely. Uh, but we'll just see how that plays out here as we move forward. Uh, that was a really easy pass going into turn five. Uh, really not contested. He was able to get him through. And you can still see a little bit of, uh, uh, I think, moisture getting kicked up off the track here a little bit. Uh, and it's not quite as good of a dry line here through the cake as we've had uh, in the end of the previous race, Greg. No, certainly not, Brian. And, and I should mention that uh, we did get word uh, from the people on the grid that the, uh, the first couple rows all made up of drivers running on dry weather tires. Uh, Whoa, was the uh, the McLaren getting very loose? That's one of our two GTX cars. Uh, Ray Ramirez in the number 10 getting very loose, coming through the kink, getting all the way out onto that curbing uh, that I think we, we discussed with Jason and some of our other racers. You don't want to be on that painted stuff uh, here in the damp weather. But yeah, the, the, the Porsche, and we'll see as, if that, as that machine uh, comes by. You know, in the damp, the, the, the Porsche, you know, it's got that weight all the way on the rear, but it's able to hunker down. Uh, and those those machines are very well balanced in the wet. The one thing you have to be wary of is uh, is having the uh, the front tires start to uh, wear off on you. But uh, as they come down the front straight now, uh, and and by the way, that was the GT2 machine of Jared Odrick uh, that had jumped out to an early lead over the GT1 cars. Uh, but uh, Odrick in his Porsche just uh, uh, basically standing still like a bug as the GT1 machines like Rulo as well as Eben just flew by him on the front straight. And Odrick, uh, you know, a great start for him. He started, uh, was scheduled to start 16th on the field, started a little bit further up. Uh, we'll see how he does, but he, for the moment, is your leader in GT2. Everyone seems to be negotiating all of our tricky track conditions, and maybe they're just not quite as tricky right now uh, with things maybe drying out just a little bit. Um, and, and the decision maybe was a little easier to make for tire choices here uh, going into this race at the moment. All right, and uh, getting word here, Brian, uh, the number five machine, and that is Kyle Jones in the Pontiac Firebird, uh, they are looking to uh, to give that driver a uh, meatball and a uh, uh, mechanical black flag. I did not hear what the issue was with that car, but uh, not long for this race, uh, assuming he doesn't uh, uh, doesn't retire on his own. And uh, sounds like actually getting word now that uh, he is uh, dumping some fluids on the racetrack uh, as he's uh, just come through turn three. He's making his way down to turn five now. So uh, we'll track that uh, as this uh, race continues on as Jared Odrick, uh, Jared Odrick now 
giving up a position. We can see going down into the kink. And uh, I believe, I'm going to take a look here. I believe that that was, I, I thought that perhaps uh, that was, uh, it wasn't Josh Carlson. It might have been Patrick Gutt in the, uh, the Chevy Camaro. We'll track that in just a moment. But that uh, early start by Jared Odrick, very strong start. Looks like he now starting to uh, to fall back in the pack. Actually, it's one of our Porsche 911s uh, there. And then it is uh, one of the Camaros. I think Patrick got directly behind. We'll, uh, we'll track them again as they come down. But uh, now jumping out uh, to a pretty substantial lead, Brian, in GT1 uh, is Dave Ruo in his Corvette. Yeah, and that's Cliff Ebbett in second place now. It's Joe Koenig who made the move around Jared Odrick there about a little bit a little bit of a lap ago. Uh, Odrick now drops down to fourth, and uh, Daniel Bender in the Camaro is in fifth place. Yeah, and, and Bender was side-by-side side with Odrick. Uh, Bender to driver's right, Odrick to driver's left as they cross the start-finish line, Brian, as they head down. Uh, they should be clearing turn one about now, making their way down to turn number three. Uh, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll track them here, actually, as they come out of turn three. And, yes, it looks like, uh, it looks like Danny Bender has managed to clear the Porsche, and uh, we may be seeing a little more rain. I do see that. Yeah, coming uh, coming down the marine sweep, head down towards five. And it's interesting because you look out the distance there, and you've got blue skies and puffy clouds. So it's just such a hard, uh, hard uh, situation with this making decisions on what to use and what not to use tire-wise. Here we've got a car coming onto pit lane. And, uh, and Brian, real quick, uh, coming down the pit lane, the number five machine that had the mechanical black flag, he uh, looks like he's uh, come home uh, to rest for the rest of the session. But we just heard Andy McDermott, uh, who was our winner yesterday in American Sedan, uh, the number driver of, uh, yeah, the driver of the number 24 uh, Ford Mustang, and currently leading as well as open, had opened up a pretty substantial advantage over Kyle Gilbert. Really bad backfiring coming down the front straight when that car should be under load uh, here. And uh, we are now uh, with a local caution on the starter stand. And I believe, from uh, looking over, I think we've got Andy McDermott up yep. against the wall. Uh, driver's right there, just past the, uh, just past the pit out area there. You can kind of see him there on the left-hand side, kind of pointed crosswise. And uh, they're and they're considering him now as he's moved into the grass over by pit out, uh, kind of considering considering him behind the wall. They, uh, the starter stand has withdrawn its yellow flag. Yeah, I mean that's in a pretty safe place there. Yeah, um, and um, I, I, it might even be uh, protected by the wall, even though it looks like it's a little beyond the wall. So um, that's going to be good to keep these cars going here uh, as we continue moving in lap 12 now. So. Now we're at the length of what the original race scheduled was supposed to be. Uh, right. They've added a couple of laps to this race, um, which I'm told could be problematic for some of uh, the T1 cars if, if, as to whether or not they're going to have enough fuel on board to get to the finish of a 15-lap race here. So uh, we will keep an eye on that as we get closer to the end of the race. All right, Brian, real quick, got a couple of announcements to make. Attention in the paddock, attention in the paddock with Jason Miller, driver of the number eight prototype car from Race Group 7. Please see the race director in impound. Jason Miller, driver of the number eight prototype car from Race Group number seven. Please see the race director in impound. But you're not alone with Formula V driver, uh, Skip Havy, driver of the number 64 machine, and that is from race group number six. Also, please see the race director at impound. Scoop Heavey, driver of the number 64 Formula V from race group number six. Please report to the race director located in impound. In the chat, Andrew Aquilani confirms this idea that there might be some issues for the T1 cars with fuel. Also, weight could be an issue. Um, you know, these cars, oh, and it got a whole lot of rain. Uh, a lot of rain coming down in the kink. And this could e eliminate the issue with, that they might have with fuel problems. Um, yes. They have to slow these cars down a lot here. Uh, this becomes a, uh, a, a fuel savings rainstorm for them. Um, but changing the length of these races 
uh, can't be problematic. Uh, uh, this apparently is longer now than even the runoffs. Uh, miles yeah, si longer. All 60, if I'm doing my math correctly, 60, 60 miles. miles, which would be longer than the runoff race. And, and again, this is a, a this was a scheduled race length for these cars, so it's not uh, as if these drivers didn't know that it was coming. I might also add that the, uh, the number five uh, American sedan Pontiac is back out on track. Uh, we just saw it go through the kink uh, there. So uh, whatever uh, was causing that uh, the dropping of fluid has uh, apparently uh, been dealt with. As uh, Dave Rulo, uh, who's now working lap five, Brian, he did just run his fastest lap of the race. Whoa, as we see one of our Mustang drivers getting very loose coming through, uh, coming through the kink. Uh, but Ruo had just run a 2.11.544. I uh, greatly doubt he's going to get to that point again. Here we see Rain also in the Bill Mitchell bend. Not quite as hard as in the kink, but my guess is that what's in the kink is coming in this direction. Uh, that's how rainstorms typically come into Road America. Uh, they come in from the west, and that would be the kink heading towards uh, the front straight. That's how the, the track is uh, situated there geographically, anyway. All right, as uh, Ann Doherty and her GT4 Club Sport uh, concedes a, a position on track not in class, uh, to our GTX driver, that is Ray Ramirez. And uh, right now, and this is a neat battle to watch, Brian, right now. He's coming down into turn one. Uh, it is the uh, the McLaren of uh, Ramirez. And then there's an E92 BMW just a little bit behind. Right now, about two seconds, uh, about six car lengths. They're coming out of turn three now. You can see with the headlights on, uh, that is Eric Polipchuk currently running second. Actually, well, that's, yep. There is the Mustang of Polipchek currently running second in GT, uh, GTX. Now, that wasn't a very tight battle yesterday. I think the margin of victory for uh, Ramirez was over 30 seconds. So uh, Polipchek trying to, uh, to make it quite a bit closer here today. All right, with 10 laps to go, Rulo, Evan, and Koning, your top three in GT1. Uh, Bender, Odrick, and Carlson, your top three in GT2. Uh, Bowden, Bat and Salvatore, your top three in T1. Ramirez and, uh, uh, how do I say this? Eric Papilchik? <laughs> Help me out here, Greg. Save me. Polipchik. Polipchik, thank you very much. We're trying. Uh, your second place car in GTX. And uh, T1, we've got, um, uh, oh, we already said T1. A sedan, here we go. That's the one I was missing. Kyle Gilbert, Matt Reagan. And uh, Jonathan Anderson, your top three in a sedan. Everyone seems to be getting through the kink pretty easily at the moment, and it seems like the rain may have slowed down or stopped in the kink. It's just so hard. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so difficult. Uh, and Brian, uh, the zero one machine, Jared Oger, currently running second in GT2, just uh, shown the soundboard uh, at the starter stand. Uh, again, for cracking that 103 decibel limit, he'll have a couple of, uh, uh, if he does it a couple more times, he'll find himself black flag. But uh, even as we've seen a number of drivers running a foul bat and the, uh, the, the sound control station is on the outside of turn number three, it, haven't seen any drivers uh, that have been black flagged due to, uh, to breaking those sound limits. And uh, as long as you know where it is, <laughs> And as long as you know where to let out of the throttle, uh, you can definitely uh, definitely do it. The, the challenge there is since it's right on the exit of turn three, you know, you don't want to let out of the throttle because you want to carry as much speed as you can through that second sector uh, and down towards, or probably that first sector, uh, down towards turn five. I, are you suggesting that there's a methodology for not, not at all the rules? Nope, not at all. <laughs> All right, coming out of uh, coming now, Brian, uh, out of turn number three, we've got four cars in a row. Uh, but uh, the, we want to take a look at the uh, the second, the third, and fourth cars. This is the battle for third in T1 right now. Paolo Salvatore in his Ford Mustang, and then Ann Doherty in the GT4 Club Sport, where they have closed up together. 
and uh, starting to come down and actually side by side under braking into turn number five and start to head up the hill. And it uh, looks like both uh, with some slower traffic there as both Salvatore and Doherty have gotten around him. Uh, Salvatore for the moment has the measure of Doherty. And of course, there's still tons of racing left to go here with uh, nine laps left in this race. Um, it is eternity here at Road America. So. And. Uh, and All right. Then, oh, go ahead. Well, well no, I, I was going to say, I think uh, in talking to, uh, to producer Zach, that may actually now be the battle for second in Touring One uh, with Salvatore and Doherty getting around Bill Batten's uh, Chevy Camaro. Uh, as we'll, uh, we'll watch them here. Yeah, the Camaro, the, the black and silver machine directly behind. That was Bill Batten to drop him now back in the, into fourth position as uh, those two drivers are making their way uh, through the kink, heading down towards uh, Canada Corner now. So a great fight going on uh, at the front of the, uh, the team one field, though. Mark Bowden uh, with a considerable margin uh, as he just crossed the start-finish line to start his uh, start lap number seven for him. He's almost a half a half a track uh, ahead of the rest of the T1 field. Here comes your uh, GT1 leaders here through uh, turn one. Uh, that was that was uh, Dave Rulo and Cliff Evan. In a pack of a bunch of other cars getting around some slower traffic here. And, and Brian, uh, I'll tell you, just now passing the start finish line, heading into turn one, uh, some changes in GTX as uh, Eric Polipchek in his BMW, the uh, the BMW sedan there, you can see him going through turn one, has gotten around Ray Ramirez's uh, McLaren. That McLaren has looked awfully loose in these uh, damp-ish uh, conditions here and uh, has really looked like a handful to drive that BMW uh, with a fairly square setup, uh, has been able to get by and is now opening up a bit of an advantage as they come out of uh, turn three, make the run down to turn five in these, uh, in these damp conditions. Yeah, now we're seeing some rain falling here as well. Uh, that was the camera there coming out of turn three. Not quite sure if that rain has arrived in turn five. Actually, it does look like it's raining now here as well. And you can see those dark clouds overhead. Uh, so again, ever-changing conditions here as well. And then here, it doesn't look like it's raining at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so like hard. I said, to welcome to spa. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So. All right. And uh, uh, let's do this, Brian. As, uh, I'm getting word now over in the final corner. Uh, we've got turn 14 actually holding out a surface of brief lag for the rain down there. Uh, so it must be getting awfully bad. But uh, as we are now... Uh, uh, quite a bit through this race and uh, just about halfway through this 15 lap race. Let's do this. Let's take a quick break. Thank some of our partners and sponsors and we'll, uh, we'll come back and take you all the way to the checkered flag. But first, let's make a call to the grid for our next group. Oh, and actually, Brian, we're not going to take a break because we have no more ads through the rest of the day. So congratulations, uh, 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 people. Uh, as 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 uh, my good friend Mike Collins says, no more no more union breaks today. All right, so uh, Brian, we just had a driver speed down the pit lane, looked as though they were missing about half of their front hood, um, which would be problematic because it was split like right down the center. And there you go, you see that red car uh, <laughs> coming and rejoining now. I'll try and get the number on it in just a moment. Uh, one of our GT1 machines, and actually, no, it looks like the whole hood is there. Uh, let's uh, let's see if I can get the number on that. I think I think that's Joe Frieda in the 122 machine uh, that uh, that just came down the pit lane at a pretty high rate of speed. As uh, the, you know, we ought to take a look uh, for whatever was uh, uh, whatever was the problem 
with Ray Ramirez and his McLaren. Uh, he was now side by side with Eric Polipchek as they went down into turn at number one. And uh, we may see a, uh, a change. We may see a change, but it's a heck of a battle uh, here tightening up in GTX. And let's see here. And there they are coming down out of turn or going into turn number three. Uh, the car to your left with the headlights on. That is uh, Polipchek in his BMW and now the McLaren has just motored right on by. So uh, Ramirez, who uh, really appeared off the pace, Brian, uh, about a lap and a, uh, just well, two laps ago, uh, suddenly has refound some speed. Here they come now down towards turn five. You can hear the wind on our camera there. Um, it shouldn't be a big problem with these big heavy, uh, these big heavy cars, and probably not with the STU cars as well, but um, uh, that wind can be problematic. You can see a flag out there way off in the distance on the right-hand side. Uh, that flag is straight out right now with the wind coming out of the west going towards east. Yeah, and there's that battle with GTX, Brian. Uh, I think the closest battle, certainly the closest battle for the lead that we have, uh, whereas Dave Rulo now almost, uh, almost a full two minutes up on Joe Koenig at the moment. He's getting pretty close to putting Joe Koenig in the number 70 machine a lap down uh, in GT2. And so, something's happened to Cliff Eben in that GT2 yeah. car. He is dropping, plummeting through the field right now. Uh, last lap, he was in second place. He's now down to sixth already. Sixth. So I'm um, interested to see if he's still on the track now. It looks like uh, he is now down to seventh. So he may be pulled off or even on pit lane. Uh, I don't know if you can see him there or not. No, Brian, he has He has not come up the pits, and, and I haven't heard a call from one of the corners in uh, in a number of minutes. Unless, of course, my radio died. <laughs> yeah, still falling down through the field here. Uh, now he's down to 11th spot, uh, which is still third overall in GT1. And um, I think, oh, Brian, I think I might have the answer. Give me just one moment. Okay. Because we've down at, uh, at well, Canada Corner just called in that they had a stationary yellow and now no flag. And I'm trying to get the number. All right. So, uh, well, and uh, so I'm getting a call uh, down by Canada and also coming out of turn 11 that they've got a car sounds like uh, might be off on the side of the track. That may indeed be the 66 machine of Cliff Evan. But I uh, haven't heard any def anything yeah. definitive as of yet. I don't have a car number. So with six laps to go, let's do a reset here. Um, GT1, your later you know, leader is Dave Rulo and Joe Koenig. Joseph Frieda is now in third. In uh, GT2, we've got Daniel Bender, Jared Odrick, and Joshua Carlson. That's your top three there. Uh, GT3, uh, uh, we have nobody running GT3 today. Uh, a Sedan, Kyle Gilbert, Matt Reagan, and Kyle Jones. And uh, T1, we've got Mark Oak, Paul Salvatore, and Ann Doherty, your top three there. And then taking a peek at GTX, Ray Ramirez is your leader um, with Eric Kilchuk in second place. All right, so I just did get word that down by Canada Corner, that was the 66 machine of Cliff Eben. He has gotten the car back underway, however. Uh, we'll see if uh, see if it just means he's going to bring that car back to the pit lane or if he thinks he can continue uh, here. And, Brian, and, and there we go. We were trying to track this, the uh, our, our leader, Dave Rulo, in the 31 machine. He has just crossed the start-finish line. And, yeah, here comes Eben uh, down the pit lane or up the hill to the pit lane. <laughs> and it looks like the 66 machine's day is now done. So that is going to move. And uh, if we look, in, look uh, at the overall scheme of things here, of course, Rulo, uh, your leader, Danny Bender, who's our GT2 leader, uh, he is currently running in second position overall. Uh, then it is Joe Koenig uh, running in third. He's uh, second in GT1. Uh, Mark Bowden now has made his way, if this is correct, he's made his way all the way up to fourth position overall uh, in his uh, in his GT4 Mercedes AMG GT4, which is a torn one car. And uh, 
We'll see here, yep, and just uh, the 66 machine of Eben heading back to the paddock now. Looks like his day is done. Still have one more race to go here. STL and STU might be a good time to make another call to the grid, Greg. All right, let's do that, Brian. Attention in the paddock, attention in the paddock. First call to the grid for race group number nine. STL and STU, please start heading to the grid. Race group nine, Super Touring Light and Super Touring Under Drivers, please head to the grid. Your race is next. Pretty impressive performance being put on by Rulo in that Corvette, Greg. Uh, one minute, 20 second lead over second place, and that's not even the same class. Uh, he's got a, a minute, 31 second lead over the second place car in GT1. So uh, he has figured out both the car, the conditions, the new track surface. Um, he is absolutely the class of the field on this one. And Mark Boat, look at him, all the way up to fourth place in that Mercedes-Benz uh, AMG GT4 car. Uh, even though it's a GT4 FIA, it runs a T1 here uh, in the SECA. So uh, he is uh, he is really making his way up to the front of the field here. Um, obviously, he has also figured out the race conditions as well as, uh, as he tries to make it up to there. Um, and he is, um, gosh, almost probably 40 seconds ahead of the second place car in T1. In T1, yeah. All so, right, so Brian, real yeah. quick real quick here as uh, things are starting to wind down in our GT race, we're to bring in uh, our uh, producer and uh, uh, owner of Drivers I Live, Brendan Kazmarek. Uh, as, uh, you know, things are, we've got the, the last event of the season here on the Super Tour. And uh, I know uh, Brendan, uh, Brendan had some, uh, some, some hearty thanks to give. Yeah, it's uh, kind of hard to believe we're, we're here already, right? I mean, we're something like 200 hours of coverage into this year's Hoosier Racing Tire CCA Super Tour, the first ever uh, live video stream for the Super Tour, and uh, first chance for a Driver's Eye Live to be a part of the SCCA again. Um, those who, uh, who know me, and there are a handful around the, the club, uh, know I started back as a quarter marshal when I was in college and, um, you know, spent some time volunteering in the club. And uh, one of the things I learned was just how accessible racing can be if you really want to be a part of it. Right. Right. And uh, that kicked off what Drivers I Live became many, many years ago. Was, you know, if you want to give back to the sport, there are plenty of ways to do that. Right. And uh, I think that's how I look at Drivers I Live and what we've uh, what we've created as a chance to to be a part of racing and to give back to our little corner of the sport here. Um, and uh, yeah, I've had a blast, you know, traveling around 10, 10 events this year. Um, some of the most iconic racing venues and some less iconic that have never had video streaming. That's before, right. right. Never mind your Road Americas, your Codas, and your Sebrings, but your Hallets, your Button Willows, and your Thunder Hills. Um, it's just been a remarkable season. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just wanted to throw a couple of thanks out there while we've still got everybody listening before we wrap up the tour. Uh, first to you, Greg, and, and Brian uh, Belansky. Uh, working with you two as, as commentators has been fantastic Thank all you. season long. You guys have done such a great job. You know, 400 cars in a weekend, having even a sliver of knowledge is a challenge, but you guys cover it all. Uh, and you do it so well and so professionally. I know Larry and Cloud um, and Brian Donati, who have been a part of the uh, commentary team this year as well. Um, oh, we owe them uh, a, a, a variety of thank yous uh, within uh, what you guys have all done on the commentary side. Uh, Zach Johnson, our producer, uh, with one exception this year, uh, Joseph Mudrak, who covered uh, for us at Sebring. Sebring. But Zach has just been an absolute star all season long. The replay functionality that was brought in back at Watkins Glen was unprompted. Uh, he wasn't pushed to do it. It was uh, he just showed up and said, "Hey, I think we got replays," and so now we uh, we look like a real broadcast outfit. We've got replays. We've got all kinds of uh, really cool stuff. Joseph Mudrock, uh, the timing tower you see on the left hand side, fully automated. Joseph's been building that from the ground up for the last ten years. It's seen a couple of different iterations, but it meant we didn't have to go out and buy software. It was that is entirely built by people who love following and watching racing. Uh, who do it in a multi-class environment and all the challenges and varieties that that throws at us. Joseph has put his heart and soul into that software for the last 10 years and just done an amazing job. And uh, yeah, we've pieced this all together to now have 
a platform for amateur racing coverage. Yeah. Right? This is uh, pretty unique, pretty special within the world of motorsports, I think. I think Certainly so. within the world of amateur motorsports. And, uh, you know, as a, as a wrap up to the 2023 Hoosier Racing Tire SCCA Super Tour, everybody from Drivers Eye Live who's had a hand in it, everybody who uh, from your side and the commentary side has had a hand in it, uh, Deanna Flanagan and Eric Prill, who, you know, uh, were gracious enough to put their trust in us to bring the Super Tour yes. um, out to the, to the masses, as it were. I think we've had close to 600 people at our peak today, which is just amazing. amazing. Um, have, have found the same enjoyment in what we're doing. Uh, the Scots, of course, we see every weekend take care of us. Uh, they've brought us donuts, carry our equipment around, <laughs> deliver what we need delivered. It's just been a, an amazing year and uh, couldn't be more grateful to everybody who's had a hand in it. And lastly, to the fans, uh, whether you're trackside here and you've been listening to Brian and Greg or you're watching online, you've watched some of our 200 hours of coverage uh, over the 2023 Hoosier, uh, Hoosier Race Entire SCCA Super Tour. Thank you to all of you for your positive words, your words of encouragement, and your input, your feedback. Um, it's nice to know ways we can improve, and I hope that you've seen that over the balance of the season. So with a couple of laps to go here, my thank you to, to all of you again, and uh, I'll let Brian and uh, Greg bring you home for Group 8, and uh, again for the last race of the uh, for the uh, Super Tour for 2020. Well, 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 thank you. Thank you, Brennan, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't want to speak for Brian, but uh, I think I can in this case. You know, as you said, working with you has been a, a completely professional relationship, and, and you've been absolutely wonderful and done <laughs> anything and everything you could to make our job easier, and I know I'm incredibly appreciative. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's a labor of love. Go ahead, Brian. I just say I'd like to echo that, and, and I'd also like to thank Brendan and Zach for reminding me that I am uh, the, the old guy on the team, <laughs> uh, despite my efforts to sound young and hip on yeah. and, and even though it's your birthday and you're still younger yeah. than me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. And of course. Exactly. And a happy birthday to you, Brian, as well. It would be <laughs> nice to have you here in person and uh, to be able to give you a hard time. Uh, and, it, I mean, you're not that far ahead of me. You're 35, 36 this year. So. Well, uh, <laughs> well and, and the last thing I'd like to point I'd like to make is, yes, we've had 200 hours of coverage here, um, but it's 200 hours of coverage that have actually been watched. Um, Excuse me, uh, that's trail mix. Um, um, we've had over 150,000 streams uh, from the start in Sebring through today, and that number is still growing as we're watching here. I don't have a final tally. Um, that means that all of you at home and at the track who are pressing the buttons, who are sending this out to the social medias, to your family and friends, um, obviously we're, we're, we're out here doing something that we love to do, uh, but we're also happy that you're all enjoying it as much as you are. Uh, to keep tuning in week after week. Um, and there's a bunch of people in the chats who've been there over and over again. So uh, a big thanks to them. Let's get back to uh, our action here with two to go here. Uh, we've been talking along and nothing's really changed, which is why I haven't broken in to get back to racing action. Uh, hey, and Brian, real quick, uh, before we do get back to that, let me make a quick uh, call. We've got uh, uh, one of our stewards uh, needed to get the attention of one of our drivers. Just one moment. Attention in the paddock, attention in the paddock, Demetrius Constantinidis, would you please return to impound, driver of the number 33, Formula F, please return to impound, uh, our, tech, our tech stewards would like to speak with you, Demetrius Constantinidis, please head to impound, that is the driver of the number 33, Formula F. And our white flag is out, I'm glad you had to make that announcement because I would have screwed up that, uh, that name as well, so... Uh, that's been a running theme this year, me screwing up people's names, and I appreciate everyone's been very, very... I just screw up names um, of cars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, everyone's been very kind in correcting me, uh, so I appreciate all of that as well. Uh, also, want to let people know, this is uh, the last Super Tour of the year, so the Super Tour Championships will be wrapping up today. Uh, we don't have real-time points available to us, uh, but uh, we'll have... Uh, I'll run down a lot of the uh, winners of the Super Tour in each class here. Uh, on the inside of the SCCA podcast over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so you can check that out. We're also in the middle of our conference majors championships. Uh, many of those are also being um, um, uh, raced upon here as well. And uh, if anybody driver wins your conference championship, the Super Tour championship and the runoffs, uh, we call that the Super Sweep here. That's been around since I think 2009. And uh, the most that there's ever been in a Super Sweep have been eight winners in a year. That's how hard it is to win that. Uh, so we're keeping an eye on all of that as well. Last lap, Greg. I've lost Greg. That's okay. I'll keep talking. No, I, I'm, I'm here, Brian. <laughs> I'm here just uh, having another conversation with producer Zach. We're, we're having a hug. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> hugging it out. Hugging it yes. out. Uh, 
looking at the <laughs> looking at the great uh, dark clouds out there. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to get through the next race without any kind of precipitation, uh, but we will have some fun. All right, Brian. So uh, as you mentioned, white flag is in the air, and uh, our leader Dave Rulo. We should see him, and he is coming out of Canada Corner right now. So we're going to start to see that Corvette come up out of, out of uh, Bill Mitchell. And there he is running around the outside of the uh, the number five Pontiac American sedan. He's, he's offline, so he's taking it awfully carefully there. Doesn't want to loop the car on the very last lap uh, as he comes into turn 14 for the last time and uh, makes his way up the Road America straight. And for the second day in a row, barring anything that goes wrong in the last two seconds or so, there you go, taking the win in GT1, Dave Rulo out of Heartland, Wisconsin in his Chevy Corvette, finishing second in GT1. We'll have to see, he's a, he's a bit of a distance back. We're gonna have to wait about, I don't know, about half a minute. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Joe Koenig was running second at the, uh, at the beginning of our last lap uh, in GT1, Danny Bender, uh, your leader in GT2, uh, crossing the line, taking the win in GTX is going to be Ray Ramirez uh, in his McLaren GT4 margin of victory, less than a tenth of, or probably less than two seconds over Eric Polipchek taking the win in Touring 1 uh, was Mark Bowden uh, in his Mercedes, uh, finished fourth overall, and given that... Uh, given that uh, the T1 field started behind that second pace car. That's a heck of a run from a moment. And let's take a look here. And uh, Ann Doherty, who had been trailing Paolo Salvatore for uh, the last six laps or so, gets around the Ford Mustang to come home second in Touring 1 uh, with Salvatore finishing in third. It's a great run there. Uh, finishing second in GT2, Jared Odrick in the Porsche 911. It was an amazing start by Odrick. Uh, just uh, could not keep the pace, though. And once the track started drying out, uh, Josh Carlson will finish third in GT2. Is uh, actually Danny Bender just now crossing the line to take the win uh, in GT2. Uh, and uh, that is, I think... That is, uh, that's it. Let's, uh, let me do this. Let's break things down here by class because a lot of our drivers now just finishing, uh, just finishing up their races and crossing the line because we also didn't get to American Sedan. Taking the win in American Sedan was Kyle Gilbert, driver of the number 15 Chevy Camaro to Janesville, Wisconsin. Matt Reagan's second. Kyle Jones, who, uh, who followed Dave Rulo across the line, comes home in third, a lap down. Uh, and Andy McDermott, unfortunately, retires after only two laps, finishing in fourth. In GT1, it's Rulo Koenig. Joe Frieda uh, gets uh, pumped home in third. Cliff Eben, who had that uh, that early off and retirement, rounds out the four-car field. He finishes seven laps down. In GT2, Danny Bender uh, over Jared Odrick with Josh Carlson uh, in third. Patrick Gutt fourth. Brian Garcia fifth. And uh, then, as we mentioned, Bowden, Doherty, Salvatore, Anderson, Ted Berger, Bill Batten, uh, your uh, six cars that ran today in T1, and then uh, Ray Ramirez with the win in GTX, Eric Polipchik finishing in second in GTX. And one last correction before we head out here for a short little break before our last race. Uh, and of course, Brendan once again making me look better than I am. Uh, the last race of the year in the Super Tour, uh, at least for points reasons, is the runoff. So uh, points at the runoffs count towards the Super Tour standings, uh, even though the runoffs are obviously their own their own monster, uh, but runoffs uh, points do count uh, for our final Super Tour point standings going towards that Super Sweep, uh, as I was alluding to a little bit earlier. All right, Brian, so let's make a final call to the grid for our last race group of the day. Attention in the paddock, attention the paddock, final call to the grid for Super Touring Light and Super Touring Under Drivers, STL and STU, race group nine, Please head to the grid. Your race is next. Race group nine. This is your final call to the grid. And uh, as things are looking off 
equally ominous, Brian. Uh, uh, going, uh, shooting back from turn eight over back towards turn seven in the hurry downs there. Let's take a quick break. Uh, and uh, when we come back, one more championship race to go. And actually, let us uh, let me do this before before we take that break. Let me uh, let me run down and, and take care of some, some housekeeping because the TRO Manufacturing Challenge has just completed. And again, our first place finisher is $200 cash, uh, a certificate for two Hoosier tires, uh, the checkered flag for the Chicago Region June Sprints, as well as a June Sprints hat. Second place finisher is $100 in cash, a certificate from Hoosier for a single tire, a June Sprints hat, third place, $50 cash, and a Braco Meter $100 product certificate as well as a June Sprints hat and then let's not forget our fifth place finishers $100 and if you finished in last but not fifth place $100. Alright so now let's take a quick break and when we come back one more race to go here from the National Park to Speed it's Super Touring Light and Super Touring Under at the 68th consecutive running of the WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints part of the 2023 Hoosier Racing Tire SCCA Super Tour. We'll be back in a few moments.
Can I take the driver with him? Welcome back, everybody, to the 2023 WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. And it is time, Brian, for the very last race of the day. It is the Chicago Region SCCA Challenge for Super Touring Light and Super Touring Under. And uh, we've got drivers heading out onto the track now, four miles 
of the National Park Speed for this very last 13 lap race uh, for the Chicago Region SCCA Challenge. Our first place finishers in our two classes, they will come home with $200 in cash, a tire, a certificate from Hoosier Racing Tire for two tires, a Chicago Region SCCA June Sprint checkered flag, and a June Sprint's hat. Second place will take home $100 in cash, a certificate for one Hoosier Racing Tire, as well as a June Sprint's hat. And our third place finishers in STL and STU, they'll take home $50 in cash, as well as a $100 product certificate from Breakometer and a June Sprints hat. Let's run down the starting order. We had 23 drivers across these two classes, set times over the course of the weekend, and here they are, starting 22nd on the field. Uh, and pardon me, tw we had 23 drivers, but uh, two of them were sharing the same car, and well, they're not both driving today, so we'll, we'll tell you who to the pole sitter is for today. Starting 22nd on the field, driving the number 190, STU Ford Mustang from Coppell, Texas, it's David Fiorelli. Thomas Wigner will start 21st. He's in the 113 STU Subaru WRX STI with Stephen Hawk starting Starting 20th, he is driving the STL Mazda Miata. That's the number seven car. Will Robinson will start 19th. He's in the number 160 STL Mazda Miata with Max Kittleson scheduled to start 18th in his number nine Ford Focus SVT. Keith Harris will start 17th in the number 95 STL Mazda Miata while Michael Reese starts 16th driving the number 69 STU Honda S2000. Jim Sigler will start 15th. He's in a Subaru BRZ. That's the number 21 car with Jim Schlechter out of Moab, Utah driving a Nissan 300ZX and STU the number 75. Starting 13th today, driving the 05 Dodge Neon SRT. In STU, it's Alan Orban with Joe Ebbin, scheduled to start 12th today, driving the number 74 Mazda MX-5. Michael Borden will start 11th in the field today. He's driving the number 4 STL Mazda Miata. He was your 2020 Touring 4 National Champion. Sean Duncan will start 10th today. He's in the number 42 STL Honda Civic. Then we've got Nick Pikarski. He'll start 9th. He's uh, driving an STU Mazda MX-5. That's the number 27 car. Scheduled to start 8th, but I just got a text message from him uh, that he's not going to be running. He's got some ignition issues. Mike Taylor, driver of the number 39 STL Acura Integra. Scheduled to start 8th, uh, driving the number 7, uh, pardon, me, pardon me, starting 7th, driving the number 35 Acura RSX Type S. Also, uh, after a bit of an incident yesterday, likely not making the field, Caleb Patrick. Greg Blosser will start 6th. He's driving the number 58 STL Mazda Miata. Ryan Harrison scheduled to start fifth in the number 47 Mazda Miata out of Washington, D.C. with Jake Anton starting fourth, driving the number 59. STL Mazda Miata. Then we've got Steven Johnson driving the number 14 STL Mazda Miata. He's from Stillwell, Kansas. And your outside pole sitter starting second in the field today. Yesterday's winner in STL driving a Mazda MX-5 with a qualifying time of 232.467. Danny Stain and your pole sitter taking over the same car that uh, Thomas Noble took to the win yesterday in STU. It's going to be Johan Schwartz from Huntersville, North Carolina, driving the number 172 BMW with a qualifying time well under the track record at 224.706. I see sunshine, right? <laughs> sunshine on my shoulder never lets and, me down. What? <laughs> and, and more sunshine. That's right. Yeah, we are. And then are. we're going to look at another camera, and it's going to be dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we are. And there you go. There's the dark clouds. Uh, they're still, uh, as you make the, the, you look up the hurry downs, we are starting to see the sun poke through the clouds here uh, on the front straight as well. And uh, I don't know if it's going to be track record weather here, track record track conditions, especially after uh, all that rubber had been uh, washed away, Brian. But uh, certainly a much drier track than most of our racers have seen this afternoon. All right, here comes our leaders, or our leaders, our pace car onto the front straight. Uh, it will enter pit lane hopefully for the last time this weekend uh, as our cars get packed up two by two, heading up the hill towards the start stand. And uh, we will hope to get our last race of the day. I already have one car heading off into pit lane here. I believe that is the seven car, maybe? No, I, I don't believe so. I think that's a little bit further back in the field. That's the uh, the 21 STU 
Uh, well, no, that's not the STU of Sigler. We'll, we'll get the number of that car in just a moment. And there is our green flag. All the cars heading down towards turn one for the first time. And now they will start to fan out, as is normally the case. Uh, not much fanning, though, this time. Pretty much two by two, side by side, going through. And, Brian, that was the number seven. My apologies for... Uh... Uh, for doubting you, Stephen oh, no. Hawk. Uh, Don't Whitefish apologize Bay, for Wisconsin. doubting me. I'm I'm very well to be doubted. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's got the crew. The the crew's got the hood up, and they're taking a look at that car. We'll see if uh, if it goes back out on track. But he's just sitting there for the moment. Yeah. All right. Everybody has now uh, decided to get into a single file line as they take their first lap here at speed. Uh, they'll take a lap here, my guess, is to kind of figure out where's wet and where is still dry, and then it'll be game on. But look at the quick lead jumped out here by Thomas Noble. Uh, or uh, it's not Thomas Noble. This time it is uh, Johan Schwartz. Schwartz. And uh, depending on the timing system, I don't know if maybe all of that information was caught up uh, with all the different timing systems here, uh, but he has already pulled on a huge lead here, and he is one person who I know doesn't mind racing on wet, slick conditions. No, and Brian, we've got a car off that's gone uh, on the outside of turn number six, and just now rejoining one of our many STL Mazda Miatas. We'll get the number there in just a moment. You know, now uh, Schwartz, uh, you know, was our not only our pole sitter, but is running in an STU machine, uh, and uh, he was quite a bit under the STU track record. Uh, yesterday during qualifying, our next STU machine was Nick Bukarski, who started 10th overall, everybody directly behind him, down quite a bit on horsepower, as you would imagine, um, with these two liter or less motors. Danny Stain currently running in second and uh, starting to uh, to open up an advantage over that yellow and black number 14 of Steven Johnson. And uh, yesterday uh, on track, Thomas Noble, who drove the uh, the the that same red BMW that Schwartz is behind the wheel. Uh, Johnson finished second to Danny Stain with Jake Anton finishing in third, Ryan Harrison finishing fourth, and an STU. Uh, again, Noble took the win with Nick Bukarski working his way up to seventh overall. Uh, and he was, you know, your second STU driver on track. Alan Orban will, uh, came home in third in STU uh, in his Dodge Neon. As we complete our first race lap here, Johan Schwartz crosses the line uh, with a lap of 229.966. Uh, Danny Stain comes across second, his lap at 234.9. Then followed by Steven Johnson with a lap of 237.9. Jake Anton, Greg Blasser, uh, Michael Borden, Sean Duncan, Ryan Harrison, Joe Evan, and Michael Reese round out your top 10. All right, and so a number of drivers that did not make the uh, the grid today. We talked about Caleb Patry and Mike Taylor in STL. Nick Bukarski, actually, in STU, uh, did not make the field in his uh, Mazda MX-5, nor did Jim Schlechta in his Nissan 300ZX. Uh, Jim Sigler in his STU Super BRZ did not make the field, nor did Keith Harris, Will Robinson, Thomas Wigner, nor, uh, nor David Fiorelli. So uh, 12, uh, pardon me, uh, 13 cars uh, went on the pace lap. Only 12 of them took the green flag. Stephen Hawk still on the pit lane with his crew taking a look at the engine. Uh, and I think, Brian, as long as they've been looking at it, there's still a chance that he may get out and be able to turn some laps here in this championship race. As Danny Stain opening up a considerable margin uh, on our second and third place racers in STL, Stephen Johnson and Jake Anton is uh, only about three car lengths separating those two drivers. And then look at this fight uh, now as you've got Harrison and Blasser. Uh, and uh, Blasser and it uh, looks like uh, making a good move up through the field there uh, is... And did I say Harrison and yeah, uh, Michael Borden in his Mazda MX-5. Also the Honda Civic is Sean Duncan, the number 42 machine, uh, sitting right in that second pack there just out of the podium. Yeah, these guys here trying to get through and, and uh, figure out how to get themselves caught back up to the back of Denny Stain in that top three, Stain, uh, Johnson, and Ant uh, Jack Anton. Uh, but a pretty big gap there and already early on, uh, moving away. Here comes a move for uh, position here, uh, possibly here, trying to get through uh, the Bill Mitchell bend. 
Uh, we'll see if they make another move here going into 14, or they just try to do a drag race with a, uh, with a draft and a slipstream up the hill. Here they come. And there you go as, uh, uh, as they come up the hill uh, with uh, the 14 and the 59 side by side, the 14, Brian, there as they cross the stripe uh, to driver's right, uh, about a half a car width up, and uh, you know they're not, they're not giving it up. And at this point, I think they've opened up such an advantage to the group in back that uh, they they really shouldn't have any worry, at least for a couple laps, of fighting it out for position. As the 59 machine of Anton uh, takes over second position in STL from Steven Johnson. There's Danny Stain running through our view again, uh, with Johnson and Anton coming up next here. Those two guys having a nice scrap out here, uh, getting into the early laps of this race. There is your race leader, that's Johan Schwartz. I know, actually I think that was Danny Stain. That was Stain running up the hill. Uh, and again, oops, <laughs> there we go, the 14, trying to sweep right around the outside of the 59 machine. So uh, uh, Stephen Johnson, great speed carrying around the outside of the corner. Let's see, as they come out of turn six, and it uh, looks like the 59 of Anton able to hold off the 14 of, of uh, Johnson there, at least as they make the run down towards the hurry downs. Uh, and then a little bit further back uh, from there, we see Blasser in his uh, Mazda Miata all by himself. But look at that fight. Now between Duncan Harrison and Borden, all nose to tail as uh, they're making the run down into turn number eight, all locked in a line. With that, that, Honda, that Honda Civic hatchback, that EG hatchback, uh, 92 to 95 uh, hatchback, uh, kind of locked in a little Mazda Miata sandwich. Yeah, definitely. John Schwartz driving away, obviously. He has got an 11 second lead over Danny Stain, uh, but he has a 56 second lead over the next car, 44 second lead uh, over the second place car in STU. That's Michael Reese. Um, he's in the Honda S2000. So uh, a big, big lead for Johan Schwartz here uh, early in this race uh, with uh, still 10 to go. Lots, lots can happen. Uh, but what a huge, uh, what a huge lead already! Yeah, and and Brian, not only that, but uh, Johan Schwartz and and I, th when we when we started this race, I said oh, I don't think uh, Schwartz could be able to break a track record in STU, uh, given the track conditions. Johan Schwartz with that 225.260, uh, he has eclipsed Rob Huff Huffmaster's old runoffs record set uh, back in 2012 when uh, at the national championship runoffs of a 226 294 uh huffmaster set it in a pontiac solstice and uh johan schwartz your new track record holder in stu and that was schwartz just coming into our view and out of our view here and uh, you can see the gap all the way back to danny stain here who should now be coming into our view now uh there he is uh, it was 19 seconds at the line. I feel like that's even a little bit more now uh, as Denny tracks out onto the curbs there at the exit of five. And then he has got another big lead, 13 seconds over the second duo here of Anton and Johnson. And uh, they're not, have probably decided that they're not going to catch Danny Stain because uh, they're having too much fun racing each other. Yeah, indeed, and uh, Stephen Johnson in the uh, the black and yellow number 14 gets back around Jake Anton's white number 59, and uh, they have uh, swapped positions now, Brian, I think, like, I don't know, like 16 or 17 times in the <laughs> in the last three laps. Uh, great little uh, great little scrap that they're having right now is Anton uh, now looking to defend against the 59 going into turn eight. You can still see the winds blowing pretty strong out there. You can see the flag right out there underneath the Speedville Bridge. Uh, here comes the group of Anton uh, Johnson, and, and I think that's Glasser and Harrison right behind them uh, as they cycle through here under the Speedville Bridge, uh, heading now through to, uh, down towards turn 10, and, uh, and that would be the entrance to the carousel here.
And it uh, looks like we've got a change here, Brian, uh, in the uh, in the battle for fourth, uh, in, uh, or probably the uh, probably the battle for. Uh, uh, for fourth in STL is uh, Greg Blazer continues uh, to have uh, a hold on it, but Ryan Harrison and uh, Sean Duncan had uh, swapped positions for a few moments. Ryan Harrison in the number 47 is uh, back around the Honda Civic and uh, heard a call come in from turn three, and this is uh, very similar to one that we heard yesterday on that uh, number 47 machine. Uh, that uh, the, the under tray under the front bumper seems to be very loosely attached, seems to be flapping around. Uh, the, uh, the fact that it lasted through yesterday's 25-minute race leads me to believe that it probably isn't that much of a problem, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue to track it from up here as our, uh, our uh, flag marshals will as well. As it uh, looks like now the, uh, the 14 machinist Johnson starting to open up a bit of an advantage over, uh, over Jake Anton. But let's uh, watch this other battle. Well, it's starting to open up. Maybe not much of a battle uh, between Harrison and Duncan, but Harrison is starting to close things down on Greg Blasser. Uh, they're in the battle for third as they're coming down into uh, coming down into turn number three now. Yeah, these four cars still having fun and trying to keep themselves together here uh, as they come through the middle portion of this race now. Uh, trying to push themselves through, looking at the clouds. It might hold off, Greg. I think it might be dry here uh, through the end of the uh, through the end of the day. I'm sure everyone involved is hoping for that. Almost well, everyone. There might be someone up there who loves the rain. One of these 23 drivers. All right, Brian. Real quick, I uh, want to make a, a quick announcement here in the paddock. Attention in the paddock. Attention in the paddock. Podium winning drivers, drivers who have uh, placed first, second, or third, please don't forget to pick up your trophies. You can find them at the table by the gas pumps. Again, reminder to all of our drivers who have podium today, or, or yesterday for that matter, please remember to head over towards the gas pumps and pick up your trophies. Because, you know, Brian's already said they're pretty darn nice looking. You know, yeah. I, I might have to go over there and, uh, and swipe a few if you don't pick them up and take them home yourself. <laughs> That's a good plan. That's right. Absolutely, it is. I might I sell them off, make a couple extra dollars. You know, can't win deal. one, steal one. That's right. <laughs> Hold them for ransom. Eight <laughs> laps to go. Sure, I'll, I'll I'll send them to the winners. Really, I will. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, we already went through this after the runoffs, Brian. Remember that? Yeah, I know. Actually, we had to send out some trophies to our. Uh, the folks we gave our, our uh, inside the SEC uh, awards to, and it's expensive to send those things yes. off. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Greg knows because he sent them. <laughs> that, that's right. All right, look at this, Brian. Uh, the, for a few moments there, it looked as though the the battle between the 14 and the 59 had uh, had ended, but now as they cross the start finish line and complete lap number five, Stephen Johnson and Jake Anton once again are at it. We've got the 59 to your left, driver's right, the 14, the yellow flat 14 to driver's left and uh, the 59 machine taking that position over. Now let's take a look a little bit further back. Now is uh, we just had side by side uh, then Harrison and Blazer as Ryan Harrison in that white number uh, white number 47, he's gotten around Greg Blasser uh, to take over fourth in STL. Good action going on, even though it's not as many cars here in this race as there have been in our earlier races. Um, the ones that are out here are st certainly still trying to get it done. Uh, podium, uh, a podium uh, finish here. Doesn't matter how many cars are in the race; you still get the still get the trophy here. So, and some money. Uh, and some money. So everyone's working hard to get that done here. Your STL, Danny Stain and Stephen Johnson, Jake Anton are your top three right now, but look out, don't look now. Um, the, uh, the fourth place car, Ryan Harrison, maybe now that he's broken away, he can make some uh, He can make some time and try to catch up to that third place car. Although it is about a 13 second lead, there's eight seconds to go, or eight, eight laps to go here. Uh, so there's still some time, still some chances. And you also don't know that whether or not those two cars up the front are gonna have some sort of an issue in these, in these closing laps. 
Well, and they were running very close. They had some really nice scraps yesterday, Brian. Right. Uh, and uh, and ran a very respectful race. And uh, once again, the 59 and the 14 uh, getting in line, coming in through the kink. Let's see if we can, uh, I was going to say, if we can check on this next shot. And there is Ryan Harrison. As Harrison uh, is starting to get, uh, work away from Greg Blasser. Now, that on the last lap, Blasser had run his fastest lap of the race at a 238.450, uh, did the number 58. Uh, uh, the number 58 Mazda Miata. The problem is Ryan Harrison, well, he didn't run his fastest lap, but he was almost a full second faster right. uh, than Blasser. So uh, we'll see here as uh, these drivers, as the track is definitely drying out, and I think Johan Schwartz has proved that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they're starting to, uh, to perhaps pick up a little more confidence through some of these uh, higher speed corners. Johan Schwartz continuing to put on a clinic out there, uh, now with a 49-second lead over the second-place car overall, Danny Stain. And uh, I can't do the math back to the second-place car at STU. Here, I'll tell you what, I, I can, Brian. <laughs> um, well, but I'm going to have to wait until Michael Reese in his Honda S2000 crosses the start-finish line before I can do it. And when, when he does, I will be happy to tell you that. Um, you know, the, the, the fight in STL, though, here, the, between now Blasser and Sean Duncan is starting to tighten up. Uh, Duncan in the, uh, the Honda Civic now coming up right back behind uh, the Mazda Miata of Blaster, the 59. We'll, uh, we'll see them coming down into the view uh, here in a few moments. There you go. There's Harrison in the white car. And then we've got the Civic uh, trailing behind the 58 of Blaster. The second and third cars coming into your view now onto the front straight. And uh, that Honda Civic uh, looks awfully huge compared, <laughs> compared to the Miata just ahead of it. <laughs> And I think Jake Anton just made a move around Steven Johnson for second place in STL. Uh, I, I knew coming down towards turn five, they were coming up side by side. Uh, I think Anton executed the pass here. I'll know more uh, next time I see them. Uh, all right, real quick, Brian, because I wanted to answer your question before before <laughs> we lose a chance. The, the, the gap between Johan Schwartz and Michael Reese, two minutes, 19 seconds. Uh, and that is um, about seven-eighths of a lap uh, as uh, Johan Schwartz is uh, getting pretty darn close uh, to lapping the second-place STU car. He's already put Alan Orban and Thomas Noble a full lap down. And these two guys still pushing each other lap after lap after lap here, and um, absolutely nothing has been decided here with six to go. Uh, it'll be five to go next time by once uh, Johan Schwartz crosses the line here. And look at this, Brian. Uh, we now have Blasser and Duncan. They've come up right to the back of the white 47 machine of Ryan Harrison. And, uh, you know, that is uh, for the battle for fourth in STL, but uh, definitely starting to tighten up here. Um, as, uh, you know, we thought that, uh, that Harrison had uh, really separated himself out. Here they come. Rolling up. Well, we just saw them coming out of uh, out of Canada, and uh, let's take a look as they come in the 14. There they are. Yep, still getting, still fairly closer. The best thing they can do is work together uh, to try to bridge the gap to fourth place. Although with six laps to go here, uh, that's time for that is starting to run out here. And they fan out just a little bit coming into uh, into one as uh, we just had the uh, the red number 58 of Blasser. He took a look to the inside on Harrison, but he was still about, I don't know, probably about three quarters of a car length back. Nowhere near enough, close enough to try and make the pass. As it uh, looks like our camera there, uh, you know, we, we got to talk to the cameraman. He's got a shaky hand. Well, look <laughs> at the trees out in the Yeah, it's, in the it's distance, getting windy the down there. The way they're blowing. Uh... Yeah, or, or the cameraman might have already started dipping into the sauce there. All right, uh, <laughs> and well, here here we go, Brian. I think we've got a, a, a big change here, and uh, you'll notice only the 59 machine 
coming through turn six and seven, and that is because the number 14 car of Steven Johnson took the access road on the outside of turn five. So what we're looking at right now, three wide, coming through turn six, is the battle for the last step on the podium wow. in STL. That is not what, uh, what I'm sure Steven Johnson was hoping for, but what a gift to Jake Anton. Was it? Yeah, it was what a gift to Ryan Harrison, Greg Blaster, and Sean Duncan. Uh, they are now in an opportunity to take home a trophy here from the June Sprints uh, with five to go. While fi while racing for fourth or fifth is fun, racing for third is a lot more pressure all of a sudden. Yeah, it'll and be actually, interesting. I was just going to say, it'll be interesting to know if these guys have crew that are able to tell them that that's happened. Uh, I would almost rather you not tell them uh, because this let them think they're still racing for fifth because once you put the pressure of racing for third on top of them, uh, that could change the whole dynamic. That's right. And Brian, it may not have been turn five. You'll notice we had a car in that little cutoff area coming underneath the bridge. Oh, and uh, producer Zach's tell me he's been there for ages. So, uh, nope, I guess it was turn five uh, where, that, uh, where that driver, uh, where the 14 machine went off. As they're coming up out of Canada now in that new, newly found battle for a podium in STL. While all of that is happening, Johan Schwartz has uh, continues to pull away, and he now has a minute and a half lead uh, over second place. Danny Stain uh, is maintaining a uh, five-second lead over Jake Ant. Um, it might even be slow, slowing down here a little bit. Yes. Uh, unsure why that might be the case. Um, so if he's having problems, all of a sudden now Brian Harrison, Greg Blaster, and Sean Duncan are battling for second and third on the podium. Yeah, quite possibly. And we just saw there where Blasser came underneath uh, Ryan Harrison going into turn one. Uh, we'll see them start to come down towards turn five here in just a moment. But uh, uh, we might have a shakeup there for what at the moment is still the battle for third. And uh, let's see what happens as they come towards us. Here they come. And there's Ryan Harrison, I think, to driver's right. There's Blasser again, and both Blasser and the Honda Civic of Duncan have gotten around Ryan Harrison. So move Harrison back, although it looks like Harrison got a good run up the hill. Yeah, they're at a point now where this may just switch positions back and forth between these three drivers here uh, over the rest of this race because uh, they're all very, very evenly matched. We've seen that for the first three quarters of the race. Um, and we'll just now see who's got the best tires and the best strategy here on the final laps. And maybe the best brakes as Blasser outbreaks the, uh, outbreaks the 47 of Harrison coming down into turn eight. He's going to lead the trio now through the carousel. And Michael Borden there in that light blue Mazda MX-5, he just can't seem to make up any ground on these three drivers. Yeah, Greg, if that's the car you're referring to by the bridge, that was from the last race. They're actually leaving it here oh. again. Uh, to let us get back to racing as quick as possible here. So, oh, look at that. Hanging it out, coming through the kink there. Uh, you know that those guys know that there's something on the line here, even though they not, might not be sure what that is. Uh, my suspicion is that they've all been told now uh, that at the very least they're racing for a podium spot. And it looks like uh, Danny Stain, uh, Brian, he just crossed the stripe, completed his ninth lap, and uh, well, he's not off the pace any longer. Just ran his fastest lap uh -huh. of the race, a 231.354, and that is a new track record, besting Joe Moser's previous best of a 232.115 set at the runoffs here back in 2020. So uh, uh, Stain may have just trying to get, been trying to get the equipment back underneath of his Harrison and Blasser now side by side coming through the uh, underneath the starter stand. So this is the really oh, the only battle on the racetrack that uh, is going on at the moment. That's why we keep following this. This is the battle for third place in STU. Uh, STL. STL, I'm sorry, one of these three drivers uh, is probably going to go home with a trophy here. So uh, that's why we're keeping an eye on this battle as we get into the closing uh, laps of this race.
And uh, Matt is asking if anyone knows how the the GT1 number 66 white Mustang did. That was uh, uh, the Ebon machine. I believe it uh, it had pitted in early. I, I don't have the, uh, the the finishing position right now for you, um, but uh, he had some issues. Had the car shut down on him and uh, and retired the race. Retired early. Uh, sorry about that. Matt is uh, we're watching again this battle for third and STL as uh, Blasser leads those three up and out of turn five underneath the Corvette bridge. And now, uh, Brian, uh, I'm going to look at the times here. Uh, Michael Borden, you know, as I said, not really making up any ground. Uh, that last time by uh, ran almost identical lap times to, uh, to Harrison Blasser and Duncan ahead. And even with the uh, the continued battle, he just cannot seem to uh, to match uh, match their pace. Yeah, well, and the three cars ahead, even though they are uh, moving around a lot and vying for position, uh, they do have the the benefit of of having a little bit of draft, draft. there uh, to pull away from that car behind them. Uh, obviously, you punch a bigger hole through the air, and that helps those three cars uh, gain a little bit of speed every lap. So. Uh, to catch a group like that by yourself is is really, really hard to do uh, when all of the things are equal. <laughs> ben Blasser in the uh, in, in the chat says 58 Blasser rhymes with Lasser, Fasser, and Taser. I think it's Blazer is what he's trying to tell us. So <laughs> it should be um, it should be Greg Blazer, not Blasser, um, as uh, as they come. No, Blazer, not Blaster, right. So thank you for the correction, Ben. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> that that was Ben Blaster in the chat. I'm just kidding. Ben Blazer in the chat. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> it was probably me that was screwing it up. So. No, it, it, no, it's been me for the last few days. I uh, just got word from uh, Race Control uh, that uh, Michael Reese has uh, uh, been... Uh, uh, he's been driving out of his bumper. Uh, he's got the, the rear bumper on his Honda S2000 uh, <laughs> flapping around a little bit. The, uh, the, the, the uh, quarter marshal's uh, checking to see uh, if it is okay to continue. doesn't look like they're in any position to uh, don't, don't feel the need uh, to meatball him as our leader, Johan Schwartz, who just reset the fast lap. And, of course, the track record at a 224.651 as uh, he's definitely getting comfortable with that BMW and as the fuel uh, uh, fuel load goes down, and next time by, he's going to get the white flag. Well, we should just be happy there's no Toyota Yaris's in this group, so we're, 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 we're good in that respect. <laughs> Yaris. <laughs> you see, I'm, I'm so used to that my that old Atari video game, Yaris Revenge. That's where, that's uh -oh. where I get it from. There you All go. right. <laughs> That's my second video game reference of the day. It is. It is. <laughs> you can tell I'm a child of the 80s. All right. <laughs> Here we'll continue to watch this battle uh, for the last up on the podium in STL. And it is, and it is uh, George Blazer, not Blosser, uh, Ryan Harrison, and then the Honda Civic. Uh, the, the Honda Civic of Sean Duncan and uh, all along Johan Schwartz, our overall leader, he's coming up on this battle to put them a lap down. As that bright red 172 BMW uh, looms in the, uh, the not so far distance. So Tony Kart Racer says that he often hears two or three announcers pronouncing names differently and that we should come together. If we all pronounce them differently, one of us has a chance of being right. That's correct. And uh, and honestly, over the over the course of all of the super tours, uh, we've had to pronounce the names of of literally hundreds of drivers, and occasionally we don't we don't get them right. And as much as we try, we don't do it on purpose. We're we're doing our best we can, um, and uh, but we're having fun with it. And we really appreciate everyone. Uh, being kind to us in the way they've corrected us, in, in, in particular, like Ben Blazer, uh, Blazer, <laughs> Blazer, yeah, uh, giving it to us uh, in a very kind and gentle manner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, coming up the hill now, coming up the road, America Straight, right behind that battle for third in STL, is our overall leader, Johan Schwartz, and as he crosses the stripe. He gets the white flag, one more lap to go. And so the question is here, Brian, does he stay back behind this race and give these STL drivers one more chance 
at the uh, at, uh, battling it out because he could he could hang back a little bit now. The Civic driver has now uh, 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 Sean Duncan has uh, fallen behind the 172. You know, but uh, you know at this point, you know Johan Schwartz, uh, you know could could lay back a little bit, give these racers a full additional lap if he chose to do so. And you know I know. And uh, we can see now as Schwartz is coming down the inside. Yeah, Schwartz that, wants that, to be done with this. That's not going to happen. Yeah, Schwartz is <laughs> maybe Schwartz is looking like the T1 car, as though he has enough fuel to finish this race. Uh, but uh, well, it's you know, still also we could still get rain on this racetrack. Uh, so. well, that that is true. But you know, the the other piece of it is, you know, you get behind the wheel, Brian, and you know the the aggression ramps up, and you are competitive, and uh, you know some some things like that. You know, us announcers, we announcers, we think of, but, uh, right. you know, sometimes the racers behind the wheel, <laughs> that's the least of their concerns. Well, uh, and, and, and as fast as he was, he was able to pass those three cars on the longest straightaway here at Road America right. and not have any bearing on their fight, too. I exactly. Think if, they, if there was no place to pass them all cleanly on a shorter, tighter track, uh, I have no doubt that Johan would have probably stuck behind them and let them race to the finish line without interrupting what they were doing. So. And, um, exactly. And, and and by the way, I want to thank Johan uh, once again for sitting in with us today during the Spec Miata absolutely. race. Very engaging. And I, and I guarantee you next season, uh, if he's here or, or at any one of these races, and, and if we're still here, <laughs> you know, who knows, after mispronouncing oh, everybody's, oh, Ryan Harrison dropping there, a wheel coming out of the kink on the last. Right there. Wow. Yeah. On the very last lap. And he managed to, uh, to save it, kept his foot in it, straightened up the wheel. But, uh, you know, if Johan wants to join us and we're still around uh the the, <laughs> the 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 mic is always here for him he was a he was a very engaging guest all right is they're coming out of out of uh, bill mitchell for the last time and uh george blazer now or did i say george yeah, no, greg right. blazer well you got the last name right this yeah, time yeah <laughs> now now i'm getting the first now i'm getting the first name wrong uh, craig blazer in that red number 58 machine it looks like he is going to hold off Ryan harrison and uh We'll know our uh, we'll know our third place finisher before we know first and second. Taking the win is taking the win in STU is Johan Schwartz finishing third in STL. Greg Blazer, Ryan Harrison fourth, Sean Duncan fifth, and uh, although I just saw Danny Stain Spec Miata go out on on the trailer, the OPM Autosports uh, rig, hauling it away. I'm thinking, well, wait, D Danny's still out here racing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, hopefully the, ST, the STL car is still on track. If he crosses the start-finish line next, uh, he will uh, take the win in STL. We've got drivers coming up the Road America straight uh, now. And the uh, uh, the 74 of Joe Ebony runs his fastest lap of the race on the last lap. He's going to finish uh, seventh behind Michael Borden in STL, and I think the only ST the only STL driver to not cross the finish line at this point is Danny Stain. I think. Yeah, and there's Danny Stain now. He's just going through the kink for the very last time. Going to have to get Johan on the inside of the SCA podcast. He yes. is a master storyteller. Um, and uh, if I can get him revved up a little bit, we'd probably go for three or four hours <laughs> on the podcast. But um, as we're wrapping up here, Greg, I want to make one final thank you, and, and I put it in the chat. Um, but I want to thank our associate producers in the chat. Yes. Um, I have had so much fun over these 20 races engaging with everyone in the chat. We've had a couple of people who I believe have been here every single race and, and definitely every weekend. Brian Straczynski is one of them. Uh, um, except when we had him in the booth yesterday. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, Edwin, who's been here from the Netherlands almost every weekend, if not every weekend, um, and so many other people who have been here repeatedly over and over again, feeding us good information, trolling us when we deserve to be trolled, helping us with our pronunciations. Um, that has really been one of the best parts for me of the whole 20 rounds is getting to engage with the people at home, uh, many of which are racers, many of which are SCCA members. And uh, what's also cool is a whole bunch of people, Greg, who aren't SCCA members yes. who might have just found us for the first time and hopefully will maybe come out to the racetrack and spend some time with us. It has been so much fun. 20 races, 10 weekends. Um, it has been so much fun, and I can't thank everybody else enough. And also, Greg, I want to thank you. Um, well, you and I have been together here uh, for all, uh, almost all 20 races, all yes. all the weekends. 
and it has been an absolute pleasure work thank you so much here. And, and I will return the favor. Before, but before I return the favor, let me congratulate not Denny, but Danny Stain, who yes. takes the win in STL. He crossed the stripe as you were uh, as you were giving your thanks there, and Jake Anton as well. Uh, so they round out the top of the field uh, here. So Stain takes the win in STL. Jake Anton, Greg Blazer, rounding out the podium in STL. Johan Schwartz, Michael Reese in his Honda S2000, and Alan Orban in STU. Uh, and those are your podium finishers uh, here in our final race of the day, the Chicago Region SCCA Challenge. Uh, winners getting $200 cash, two Hoosier racing tires via certificate, as well as a checkered flag and June Sprint's hat. Second place, $100 cash, a single uh, Hoosier racing tire via certificate and hat, and our third place finishers, $50 of cash, as well as a $100 product certificate from Breakometer and a June Sprints hat. And now that I've gotten that out of the way, Brian, I want to thank you as well. Uh, you know, we, we, our paths first crossed many years ago, and uh, I've enjoyed every moment of working with you here this season on the Super Tour and for some other, uh, other endeavors in which we have uh, both uh, taken upon and uh, of course want to thank uh, some of our great uh, great friends and partners that have uh, worked with us for example Larry Lefty McLeod uh, who did a number of events with us this season Brian Donati as well and uh, we've had a hand of uh, more than a handful two or two or three handfuls and maybe a couple feet fulls of guests <laughs> as well uh, here joining us in the booth not only this weekend but all season long and uh, want to thank all of them and uh, as you said, I want to thank all the, uh, the wonderful people that have watched our coverage from the middle of January when we started out at Sebring International Raceway uh, all the way through this event here. And uh, I know we're going to have a lot of people with a lot of interest uh, that uh, want to see all the coverage at the National Championship runoffs at the end of September. I know uh, Brian will be covering uh, qualifying for the runoffs before we turn things over to the pros. Uh, not that we're not pros, but I figured <laughs> I'd say that because it just, it, you know, I'm, I'm very modest. And, uh, but I want to thank everybody. And uh, if you haven't done so already, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, we haven't said it at all today, jump up and down, do handsprings, punch, smash, uh, <laughs> give the, the flying elbow uh, a, a triple back suplex, I don't care, the, uh, the like button. And if you haven't already subscribed to the Sports Car Club of America's YouTube channel, please do so today. It helps us. It helps the SCCA. It allows more people to find out about all of the great programs that the SCCA puts on. And uh, uh, it helps spread the word about some great road racing like that we've seen this week here at Road America and the 68th consecutive WeatherTech Chicago Region June Sprints. Yeah, who would have thought, Greg, if uh, 15 years ago or however long it was ago that I signed up to help out at a Washington, D.C. region um, event at the Washington, D.C. auto show uh, that we would meet on that day and then go on to be good friends and do this here uh, 20, 15 to 20 years later. It's been just a great opportunity, and uh, I think this probably is where we should say goodbye. I think so. Uh, and, and thank you to everyone uh, who was here. I'm going to stop saying thank you. Take care, everybody. Have yourself a great weekend. Drive home safely if you're driving. See you at the runoffs. Have a good time, and go play with cars.